Okay, looks like we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and we are here for another episode or chapter in our 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge series. This has been a ton of fun, and if you're new to the channel, please check the playlist or go to our website, standingfortruthministries.com, and search under uh, Evolution Debate Challenge, and you can find all of the epic debates that we've hosted in this series. Now, tonight, we have two experienced debaters. Dr. Kent Hoven, who has had nearly 280 debates, and from my understanding, I believe there's only one who has ever had more debates than that, which is Dr. Dwayne Gish himself. So, uh, Dr. Hoven, we're, we're going to get you to surpass that uh, soon, probably, with this challenge. And then we've got uh, Taylor Gray from the Snake Was Right YouTube channel, who's had over 75 formal debates. And so this is definitely going to be a debate to remember. And the question is, what are we debating? Is there reasonable evidence for evolution? Gentlemen, uh, Dr. Hoven and Snake Was Right, thank you so much for being here for this important debate. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Well, as we like to do, let's kind of break the ice before we get into the opening statements and get into the fun. Uh, Snake, it's been a little while since you've been here. So why don't we start with you? How you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about your channel. Not bad. Not bad. Other than gas prices. Uh, yeah. Uh, channel Snake was right. It's basically, uh, you know, it comes from the Genesis tale, but it basically the meaning is... Uh, Knowledge of good and evil is a good thing. Knowledge is worth the price of knowing it. And, uh, you know, I never shy away from inconvenient truths. So that's kind of the focus of the channel. All right. Well, I appreciate that intro there. Uh, Snake, I've got your link to your YouTube channel in the description box of this video for people to check out. Okay, over to Dr. Dino. How you been, brother? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about Dal. Well, yes, sir. It's good to be here. I've been good. Uh, God's been good. Some of his kids drive me crazy, but God's good. Uh, we have a lot of fun here at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. It's a Christian camp, science center, museum, theme park, all based on dinosaurs and the Bible. Uh, we've had visitors from all over. Got a bunch here tonight. I love giving tours of this place. Taylor, come on down. I'll give you a tour and you'll love it. Our Dinosaur Adventure. We have a science center that's incredible. We take the position the Bible's true. Evolution is not only stupid, it's dangerous. Dangerous cult to believe in evolution. So we'll... Uh, We'll see if we can work on that tonight. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hoven, for that introduction. And uh, to the audience, we are going to be having, as usual, an audience Q&A. So that's kind of where we get you guys involved. So just please, uh, as we know, the, the chats get pretty lively uh, for these debates. And so please just make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth. That'll be the best way uh, for me not to miss your question. And as always, we're going to keep this uh, formal, professional. We're going to keep it equally timed. And we are going to discuss one topic at a time. Of course, uh, Taylor being in the affirmative, he is going to start us off with his roughly 10 to 12 minute opening statement. We'll give uh, Kent equal time. Then we'll have six minute uh, uninterrupted rebuttals, followed by an open discussion where we will discuss the points brought up during the opening statements and a quick uh, five minute or so uh, closing statement. So that being said, let's hand it uh, over to Snake Was Right. We're going to get right into it. And Taylor, uh, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Yeah. And is, is that up? Yeah. All right. And let me know if you can hear. Is there reasonable scientific evidence for evolution? Well, not only is there reasonable evidence, but it passes both the levels of preponderance of evidence and reasonable doubt. The preponderance of evidence is defined by a greater than 50% chance that the claim is true, aka the standard OJ was successfully sued on. Yes, maybe pause it real quick, Taylor. Mm -hmm. Are you able to turn up the volume just a little bit? And do you have That's... it on normal speed? It seemed like it was kind of fast to me, but maybe that was just on my end. Yeah, it's a little fast in the beginning. Uh, that's as high as it goes, is it? Okay. That's fine. I'll, I'll mute everybody and I'll try and... Um, let me see here. Well, turning up your mic probably won't help. Um, no, it should be fine if, if I mute us all and uh, if, if you want to go. Um, we'll just make sure, obviously, Kent uh, can hear since he'll be the one that has to rebut it. So 
Okay. Yeah. I should, whenever yeah. I could turn it up a little bit, but that would take a few minutes from the source. Nope. file. <laughs> Okay. I, th I think this should be fine. I'll, I'll mute us all. And then if, if uh, Kent, if you're having any issues hearing, just, just let us know. Go ahead, Taylor. Okay. The standard OJ was successfully sued on. Whereas the standard of reasonable doubt is met when only unreasonable doubts are raised in objection to the claim, the highest standard. Now, if you accept the same evidence, different interpretations mantra, that would bring us to 50-50% chance. But when you consider that evolution has passed every scientific test we can perform, and can make amazingly accurate repeated predictions and creationism, none. Evidence for evolution is above 50% probability just based on expert consensus alone. Throw in predictions, and we are way past the proponents of evidence, so I went already. The debate is over, but, you know, I'll play ball. I can demonstrate evolution beyond all reasonable doubts. Are there any reasonable doubts that Mr. Hoven can cast here? Well, let's look at some pieces of evidence without relying on trusting the experts, even though that's what we do when something is wrong with our car or we get a toothache. We trust the experts. Expertise is reasonable evidence, since they likely know more than non-experts. So I'll try to keep it to three main points of evidence to support the main claim, which is that accepted microevolution explains all macroevolution. Every single change necessary for macroevolutionary changes has been observed in real time and observed in the fossil record. I argue that we literally have a video record of life history. What is a video? It's a series of still images. What are fossils? A series of still images literally recorded in stone. So this video of life history may be at a low frame rate and may have some gaps, ever shrinking gaps, but we also know the order and the time scale of each frame. Every single difference between the population and life's history is already accounted for by observable microevolution that creationists accept. We know that the size, shape, orientation, location, number, and chemical composition of bones, organs, and tissues can change within accepted biblical kinds, and creationists do accept this. As my friend Call Me Emo beautifully just demonstrated, the amount of accepted variation within kinds is larger than the gaps between kinds, variation covered by transitional forms. But if the creationists insist that transitional forms are their own kind, they shoot themselves in the foot, since now the range of accepted possible variation overlaps, meaning there's absolutely no reasonable barriers between any of the kinds. If the transitional forms are explained as being part of either kinds, it, this just shrinks the gap between the original two to non-existence, still resulting in a unified kind. Let me explain. The amount of creationist accepted variation within kind, such as in the coelacanth, is so large that it's the same as the difference between fishes that creationists consider not related. A great example of this is that horses and tapirs. Uh, since creationist orgs admit Mesohippus is an ancestral horse, they should be able to admit that tapirs are also in the horse kind, since tapir skeletons are virtually identical to Mesohippus, and comparing anatomy is how they identify the horse kind, but no, they arbitrarily separate them, even though modern tapir and horse skulls are more similar than they are to our ancestor skulls, even though the difference between basal tapir and basal horses is smaller than the difference between basal horses and modern horses, their entire skeleton is identical. Meanwhile, the toe structure of creationist accepted horse kind varies wildly from four to one. This is major anatomical adaptation, requiring lots of complex coordinated changes. Again, the roots of the supposed bushes of life are separated by fewer possible microevolutionary changes than are already accepted to have happened within the kinds, and in a very short time period as well. This separation is completely arbitrary, as the horse lineage is grouped by morphology, even though this same method would dictate that tapers are also part of the same kind. They connect the branches of the horse kind with morphology and comparative anatomy, but ignore that the roots of the horse and taper kind are more similar using the same method than anything in the horse kind. This is an inconsistent standard, and thus the doubts as to their relationships are unreasonable and irrational by definition. Creationists accept that comparative anatomy and genetics prove relation with some kinds of animals, but arbitrarily decide that these same methods do not work on others. They have to contradict themselves and make arbitrary separations because they know they have to jam a ton of variation and diversity into some kinds to have enough room on Noah's Ark. But they also don't want humans to be apes or horses to share ancestry with non-horses, motivated reasoning and avoidance rather than reasonable doubt. Could this be the same kind of animal which can both walk and swim? Could these be the same kind? All that separates them is some slight proportion differences of the same bones. Could the upper animal have elongated its tail and shrunk its legs to microevolve into the lower? Of course, by creationist accepted standards, this is definitely possible. And so is this kind of variation. Every difference here is covered by observed and creationist accepted diversity within kind, and yet this observable process connects two very different looking organisms. So there exists no reasonable doubts as to whether macroevolution, kinds evolving into other kinds, is possible. The slight variation of existing structures is observable, like the flexing of fins for walking limbs, or the folding of teeth to make fangs, of which there are half-evolved transitional forms. Creationist organizations, by the way, admit that snake kinds 
can evolve from lizard kinds because they are separated only by microevolution. This is true of all kinds. And the theory that all life is connected in this way gives us predictions about the fossil record, predictions that the inconsistent, vague creationist hypotheses cannot, thus making evolution scientific by definition. This is reasonable evidence enough. I could stop there, but we can go beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what are Kent's objections to the fossil record? Well, of course, we can't prove any animal had children except, you know, those that we can. Um, but it is unreasonable to posit that all the fossil animals did not have parents as well. It is also unreasonable to question the order that those fossils are known to be deposited in. You'd have to posit that radiometric dating doesn't work and that accelerated radioactive decay occurred instead, which would necessarily entail the insurmountable heat problem of the young Earth, which Kent gave no solution to in our last debate. So the objections from the creationist side just keep getting more and more unreasonable and absurd and cause even more problems for themselves. There are zero reasonable objections to the fact that evolution is possible, and then it predicts the record of animal populations, which is highly unreasonable to believe is a mere coincidence. So that was a very general definition of evolution. Here are the main three points of evidence that it actually occurred. Point one, we have observed in real time the macroevolution of a new kind of organism. Single cellular algaes and yeast of different species and different methods have been observed to independently evolve multicellular bodies, not random clumpings of individuals making up colonies. This new kind of organism has tissue differentiation and a limited set amount of cells per body. This new kind of organism has tissue differentiation and a limited set amount of cells per body, genetics that did not previously exist in the population, not hidden in the genes somewhere, proving definitively that new functional information can evolve without any intelligent design simply by modifying existing genes. Organisms do not suddenly sprout wings, they modify them from existing structures. You're looking at transitional forms evolving within a creationist accepted kind right now. Plants are amazing examples of macroevolution. We have plants with drastically different body plans such as almonds and cherries, or mustard flowers that evolved into broccoli, which can be grafted together or crossbred, meaning they are the same kind, yet they are macroevolutionary steps away from each other in terms of different physical body plans, showing that microevolution and macroevolution are the same thing in different amounts. We know the life history of breeding of these organisms. Also, the fractal patternicity in Romanesco broccoli is yet another beautiful and incontrovertible example of new functional information evolving without intelligent design. What would Ken's objections be to the evolution of multicellular bodies? Well, he usually says they're just a mass of single-celled individuals stuck together, but this is patently false. Their eight-celled bodies are indivisible individuals with cells of different types. What objections exist to refute the macroevolution seen in plants? Probably that plants didn't evolve into elephants. This is another unreasonable doubt for way too many reasons to get into in the intro. Yes, they are still plants. Sort of like how seals and whales are still carnivores descended from wolf-like mammals, some of the existing features have been flattened, stretched, or shrunk. That's it. Point two, ERVs. Prove that it's a mathematical genetic certainty that humans and chimps are related. These viral elements are inserted randomly into host DNA and act as records of infections in your ancestors since they are inherited. We share 205 out of 213 for just one virus group, some of which belong to species that in their wild form do not infect humans, so they had to have been acquired by non-human ancestors. There are more than 10 million possible insertion sites, and humans and chimps share the majority of identical insertion sites with identical ERVs. There is a 1 in 5.88 times 10 to the 1418 that this happened by chance. That's more than 83 Googles, which is a 1 followed by 100 zeros. There isn't even a word for a number this large that I could find. There's more than 20 times the number of particles in the universe. What doubts exist for ERV's evidence? Well, one can't usually says they're just mistakes. No, they have very specific virus exclusive sequences. They are not short nucleotide substitutions or insertions due to errors in DNA copying or scrambling in existing sequences. They are the entire viral genome inserted as the virus intends, for lack of a better word. Uh, two, Kent will then contradict himself and say that they were put there by the creator and are thus beneficial. True, they can be beneficial, but the way in which they're beneficial is always related to regulating viruses or cell growth, as evolution would predict. But most of them are either neutral or slightly harmful, so this excuse does not hold. Also, there are lab experiments showing that mutation of these ERVs can restore them to active viruses, showing that they are viral in origin, not divine. Three, that they could have been inserted randomly at the same locations, by chance. Again, this is the number of the probability of that happening, aka couldn't be more unreasonable and unlikely. Would we expect the author of these genetic sequences, an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect author who wants us to reject evolution to insert ERVs where they are? Should we expect this perfect creator to choose to retroactively add DNA later in human life via virus infections rather than just code it in us to begin with? Is this a reasonable doubt? No. A truly intelligent design from a god 
would preclude any similarity in ERV locations while maintaining their function. This is not what we see. Creationism cannot predict the data, only accommodate them. But here, there is absolutely no accommodation of this data by creationism whatsoever. Point three, endosymbiosis. The fact that mitochondria have not only their other separate DNA, but a bacterial plasma type DNA is great evidence for the life history of the symbiotic relationship between two types of cells, which consequently is a new kind, one living within the other. This has been observed to happen in amoeba species where closely related cousins of the same kind cannot survive infected by the very same species of bacteria that their amoeba cousins cannot survive without. Evolution of complex chemical dependencies resulting in new organelles is an observable fact. It's even been repeated in the lab with ciliate protozoans, aka single-celled ancestors of animals. What objections exist to endosymbiosis? Well, there's no reason for God to design mitochondria with separate DNA. Giardia, for example, has mitochondrial DNA integrated directly into its nuclear DNA, showing there's no reason for God to design mitochondria with their own separated DNA to spare us from the confusion. No, this is an artifact of evolution. Now, if I'm wrong and this feature is the result of genomic decay, that would absurdly mean that almost every eukaryotic organism would have independently evolved separate mitochondrial DNA and only mitochondrial DNA separated from the nucleus and not some other organelle. Another unreasonable doubt. The fact is that evolution makes novel and area, time, anatomy specific predictions such as Archaeopteryx and Tiktaalik. No, dogs give birth to dogs is not a novel prediction, nor a prediction at all. We all already know this. What are the reasonable doubts to predictive ability? There are none. Predictive ability, not explanation, is a definitive property of science. The only move that remains is to assert that reading an ancient religious tome is a better method of truth than science, so an unreasonable doubt by any other metric. A myth about magical global flood and a magical man created from a powderized rock, a woman created from male flesh and male DNA, this is not a reasonable rebuttal to the scientific gold standard. If you use this method of assuming absolute certainty of some book, you'll categorically never be able to know if it is wrong. That's why science is superior. It can be shown to be wrong. I have met my burden of proof by the strictest possible reasonable standard, both legally and scientifically. Are there reasonable doubts? Not even close. All right. Okay. Taylor, thank you for the um, video opening presentation. And obviously there's a few points there that we'll have to go back and forth on, I think one at a time during the discussion. So yes. uh, thank you. And uh, okay, we've got Dr. Hoven back on screen. So uh, Kent, we are gonna hand it over to you. And that looks like it was about 12 minutes. Is, is that what you got as well, Taylor? What was that? Was that about 12 minutes? It was exactly 11 minutes, eight seconds. Okay. Well, we'll give uh, Kent equal time, let's say between 11 and 12 minutes, and we'll go from there. So Kent, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Obviously, uh, well rehearsed and reading a script there, Taylor. Uh, I'd like you to see some real evidence. We can talk about each one of these one at a time. We covered each of these the other night, actually, ERVs, Tiktaalik. Uh, they're not evidence for evolution. You got to define what you mean by the word evolution. And where, where's the, the purpose is for him to provide evidence that it happened. This textbook says evolution is change over time. Well, of course things change, but are the changes limited? Then they add to it and say, in other words, living things have changed over time. Now, wait a minute. You want to start with something that's already alive? You evolutionists, in order to have a, a coherent theory, need to start on how life got started from non-living material. Yeah. So the first four, I, many times in my seminar I've shared, there are six different meanings of the word evolution. Atheists don't like this. They don't agree with it. I don't care. They're wrong. I'm right. Okay. You have to start with cosmic evolution, the Big Bang. Where did time, space, matter come from? You have to have something to evolve. Where did it come from? You say, oh, no, we're going to start with living things. Well, then you don't have a coherent theory. Secondly, you got to have chemical evolution because the Big Bang supposedly made hydrogen and helium, maybe a little lithium. How do you get uranium, gold, and platinum out of hydrogen gas? I'd like to know how to do that. Then you have to have stellar evolution. The stars have to evolve and the planets. Nobody's ever seen that happen. Then organic evolution, the origin of life. And then what's called macro evolution, where an animal changes from one kind into another. That's never been observed. Tiktaalik, as you mentioned tonight, is not evidence for evolution. It's a creature that existed just like it was. You can't use any fossils <clears throat> as evidence for evolution. All you could prove is it died. You could not prove Tiktaalik had any children. You certainly could not prove it had children that were different than itself. No animal today does that. Why is it always some bone in the dirt you found that's supposed to be the evidence? Where's the animal today producing something other than its kind? Lastly, we have what's called microevolution. <clears throat> that's a lousy term, but they use it so I don't like it. It's really just a variation within the kind. This has been observed. Lots of variations have been observed, but they're limited. The first five meanings of the word evolution are purely religious. 
<clears throat> Evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Well, now hold it. That's not micro, that's micro variation, but that doesn't equal macro. Most of evolution is tell you that macro is just micro over longer periods of time. This is dreaming. Uh, Roger Liu, an evolutionist, said in Science Magazine, the central question of the Chicago conference <clears throat> was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomena of macro. The answer is no. Uh, education or evolution at Berserkley uh, University. What is macroevolution? Macro generally refers to evolution above the species level. Hmm. We can talk about this for hours. I want to get to something else here, though. Watch my video number four for more on this. Okay. Life has been accumulating mutations and passing them through the filter of natural selection. This is dreaming. Natural selection works just great, but it only selects. It doesn't create anything. And all mutations observed have been harmful, fatal, or neutral. You can't point to a mutation that added new information that was helpful and that was able to take over the whole population. <clears throat> Is macro just micro and more time? No. No one's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. You have to imagine that it happened long ago and far away and point to some bone in the dirt as evidence, which is not evident. This is a religion, it's not science. There are genetic barriers <clears throat> to keep one animal from changing into another kind. And if you had a partly evolved dog, who would it marry? You gotta get two of the opposite sex in the same place at the same time. It's dreaming. Variations happen, but they have limits. Ask the farmers, they've been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time. Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? Or is there a limit in there somewhere? I don't know if they reach the limit or not. They got some pretty big pigs, but I, I don't think they'll get one as big as Texas. Roaches become resistant to pesticides, no question. Still a roach, and it'll never become resistant to a sledgehammer. 20 times in the first seven chapters, God said he, all the animals would bring forth after their kind. Roaches make baby roaches. Lions make baby lions. You might get a white one or a yellow one or a different color one, but you get the same kind. No, the information had to already be present in the gene pool. No new information is ever added. The dogs don't become pink or learn to fly. They're still a dog, 339 recognized breeds of dog. And the gene pool of the new variety is more limited, like the poor dog you guys had today on the tour. Completely useless in the real world, right? Wouldn't survive, the squirrels would kill the thing, okay? <laughs> it's friendly, it has to be. If you're only four inches tall, you gotta be friendly, right? Okay. How long would you always last in the real world? I like that, go ahead, make my day. Sure, uh, Taylor, there are lots of varieties of corn. I grew up in Illinois, corn country. They're corn by all kinds, of, they have to number them. There's so many varieties of corn, <clears throat> but they're still corn. You're never gonna get a whale or a tomato or a hamster to grow on your corn stalk. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Corn has always brought forth corn. No exceptions, none. You can dream if you want, but it's not science. Science is what we can observe. There are a lot of varieties in the human ear shape and the human nose shape. They're still ear, they're still human. Lots of varieties of eye shapes and eye colors, still eye. It doesn't change to a wing or anything else. Lots of varieties of foot shapes, hand shapes, lip shapes, dogs. 339 recognized breeds of dogs. Let's see, uh, BBC News. It looks like 95% of current dogs came from just three original founding females. Oh, what do you think? Dogs come in all shapes and sizes, but scientists believe they evolved from a handful of wolves tamed by humans living in China 15,000 years ago. Well, they're still dog. Divergent evolution in an Irish textbook. You give it a fancy name, it doesn't change the facts. It's still a dog just barely in the case of the Chihuahua, but it's still a dog, okay? They say the Abert squirrel and the Kaibab squirrel might have had a common ancestor opposite sides of Grand Canyon. Yeah, there are eight different varieties of squirrels, I believe. We've got stuffed ones here in our museum. You come see them. They might have had a common ancestor called a squirrel. But you guys want to make these stupid family trees claiming the squirrel and the whale and the human and the amoeba are related and came from a common ancestor. This is propaganda. This is dreaming, this is a lie, this is not science. You can draw all the lines on paper you want between, let's see, the corn plant and the squid. Yep, the corn and the squid and the shark all had a common ancestor. God said they bring forth after their kind. You mentioned the horses and I'm glad you did. There's a lot of varieties of horses, itty bitty horses. They got the world's smallest horse. We used to be lived down in Mobile, Alabama. Came and visited our dinosaur adventure land. Pretty small, they got some pretty big horses too but they're still a horse. 
and horses, zebras, and asses can all be crossbred. They get zorses, zonkeys, zeonies, zedonks, zebras. They're still a horse. There's a stripeless zebra. I forgot to put his PJs on. They're still four-wheel drive, leather upholstery. They got hooves. They don't have wings. There's a variety of horses. I agree. But they're still recognizable to a four-year-old as a horse. I bet there's a limit on how far you can get with the speed of a horse, too. In the last 100 years, the Kentucky Derby has gone from an average winning speed of 127 seconds down to 123. How much money have they spent on selective breeding trying to get faster horses? Millions and millions of dollars. They babysit the thing and give them vitamins and everything else. They're still a horse. And even in the old days, they had some real, real good times turned in. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, breed wings on the horse and fly around the track. See, they don't do that. There's a limit to horse speed. There's a limit to horse size. There's a limit to the cat kind. You might get a Liger or a Tigon by crossing. They're still in the cat family. There's varieties of cows. If they've been able to cross a beefalo, get a buffalo and a bison and cross them and get a beefalo. Okay, it's still in the cow kind. It's not a hamster. It's not a roach. It's not a, a mosquito. They get they crossbreed sheep and goats sometimes. Maybe they had a common ancestor. The whale and the dolphin might have had a common ancestor. They crossed them and got a walpin. Okay, they still swim in the water. That doesn't prove they're related to birds. Camel and llama crossbred a llama to a camel, and they got a camel. Okay. It's still the same kind of animal. It's not a lion. It's not a, it's not a mosquito. It's not a broccoli plant. Okay. So, yes, the Bible said they bring forth after their kind. There are now, I think, 500 registered varieties of chickens in the world. They might have had a common ancestor called a chicken. God said they bring forth after their kind. There are different types of owls that might have had a common ancestor, but they're limited. It's always owl. Eight varieties of bears. Polar bear, black bear, grizzly bear, a panda bear might have had a common ancestor called a bear. You guys want to confuse the students by showing them these variations and say, see, this proves everything's related. No, it does not. They crossbred, they put an English walnut tree on a black walnut stump. They got a whole forest of them. They grow great. They're still a tree, tree, okay? The sugar beets, they selected for better sugar to get more sugar out of the sugar beet to feed the soldiers during World War I. And <clears throat> in World War II, I think, they increased it from 6% to 17%, but they hit a brick wall. Taylor, you're going to hit a brick wall with every variety you try to create. Whether you're trying to get bigger mosquitoes, you might get a bigger one, but you're going to reach a limit. You'll never get one as big as a Boeing 747, okay? They bring forth after their kind. Moose, elk, reindeer, caribou have a common ancestor? I don't know. That'd be a good field of research. Maybe they did, but they're still the same kind. They got horns on the front, not wings on their back. They can crossbreed hickory nuts and pecans and get hickon nuts. We got some here in our science center. Damien, where are you at? Uh, he's gone. Okay. They crossbreed. I was at the dentist today that does this over here in Evergreen. He crosses hickory and pecan and gets all kinds of different kinds of nuts. Shell bark hickory and one mocker nut hickory. Dentist Carter, in Cartwright in Evergreen. I was there today. Give him a call. That's what he does. There are 50 varieties of watermelons. Yeah, there's still a watermelon. Exact number of mangoes is uncertain. Many as 500, perhaps 1,000, 350 grown commercially worldwide. Lots of mangoes. Might have had a common ancestor, a mango. 1,100, 7,500 varieties of apples now. They're going to reach a limit. You can crossbreed apples from now till the cows come home, and you're always going to get an apple. So 17,000 species of wasps. 3,000 varieties of tomatoes. Wow. God said they bring forth after their kind. 1,000 types of bananas. They bring forth after their kind. Tell you what, Taylor, show me the evidence, not a drawing on paper, not putting lines together to connect them. Show me an animal today or a plant today that's able to produce something other than its kind. Tiktaalik, finding a fossil in the dirt, you don't know it had any children. And you certainly don't know it had children that were different. And you don't know, uh, no, no, it wasn't just a type of plant or fish that we've discovered still alive <clears throat> or it's it gone extinct. It's just a fossil. None of those count as evidence for evolution. Variations within the kind, this is science, this is religion. Big bats, little bats, still a bat. I, I yield the floor. Okay, thank you for that opening statement there, uh, Kent. That concludes the roughly 12-minute opening statements from Taylor. 
and Kent. I appreciate it. And I see a ton of questions flying in from the audience. So thank you for tagging me. As always, we're going to have a solid audience Q&A. Okay, let's hand it over to uh, Taylor. Taylor, you have a six-minute rebuttal. And I'll give you gentlemen a one-minute warning uh, in order uh, so you guys know to kind of start wrapping it up. Snake, floor is yours. All right. So, um, so yeah, we're only talking about macro evolution. Um, and for the purposes of the debate, I'll give you that God created the universe and the first life. Um, it's those are all completely irrelevant to the debate, as you've been corrected on hundreds of times. Um, this is why there are different fields of study. Biologists do not study astrophysics, um, and evolutionary biologists do not uh, typically do research into abiogenesis. They are separate fields, and there's a reason for that. And we all know what we're talking about, macroevolution, change in kinds. I've made that abundantly clear, um, and that is the definition I'm going with today. I don't have to take any of the other definitions, and in fact, I've completely given up on them and given you every single one of them that God did it. I'm only interested in macroevolution. Um, so you said that you can't use fossils to demonstrate evolution, but you do this. Um, you do this to claim which kinds are uh, on the Noah's Ark uh, because you can't have fit all of them. So somehow the kinds that you want to be grouped together, you can tell, oh, this is a fossil horse. So it, it came from a relative of a horse kind. Um, but when it comes to uh, transitional fossils, you have a different standard um, than you use for the kinds that you want to be related. That is the main problem here, and that's what we're going to explore today. Um, the reason we use fossils are because, well, most of them are dead. Your god apparently uh, murdered 99% of all living things, even though they didn't do anything wrong. Um, the reason we use fossils is because it has these large gaps, and we have timestamps on them, and they're in a specific order. So we know the the uh, populations of animals and plants were different at different times in Earth's history. And we also have an explanation observable today as to how you can bridge those gaps. That explanation is able to predict what's in the record, and thus that is per, that is the definition of science. If your uh, theory can predict something, that is science by definition. There's no arguing with that. That's just what it is. Um, so, yeah, if you can predict something, the structure and the parts of something, you know how it works using that theory. So that is how science works. Um, so, I mean, we, we had the, the usual suspects. Uh, Partly evolved dog, who would it marry? Um, the fact that you even asked this question shows that you have no idea what you're talking about or you're being intentionally dishonest. Uh, you know very well that one parent can pass on a gene to its child that the other parent does not have. So a partly evolved dog, even though they're all partly evolved, but going with your uh, hypothetical, a partly evolved dog could mate with any other dog. And the child has about a roughly 50-50% chance to inherit that gene, given, uh, given uh, the fact that the one parent has that gene and the other does not. Um, you mentioned, so you uh, have the burden of proof to tell me what the limit is. You claim that there's a limit on evolution. I agree with you on the size limits. Um, like a pig as big as Texas or a mosquito the size of a 747. But is that um, a red herring or is that a steel man of the evolutionary position? Because no evolutionary biologists, no school children, no teachers on the entire planet propose that pigs evolved into pigs as big as Texas or evolved from pigs as big as Texas. Nobody claims that mosquitoes evolved into 747 sized bugs. They do claim that mosquitoes came from a different kind of insect that were not quite mosquito, and that is by variation of parts, elongation of mouth parts, different digestive enzymes. Um, so where is the limit? That's actually what I want the central premise of this debate to be, um, because 
that's the major uh, misunderstanding that most creationists hold and that creationist uh, preachers like to take advantage of when they're being dishonest. Um, so where is that limit? You bring up the speed of horses, wings on horses. I'm nobody has ever proposed that 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 uh, you can make a horse that goes the, um, the speed of a bullet train or that you can make a horse that has wings on it. They only propose that you can modify traits that the horse already has. So um, I'm interested in things like if you can get a seal from a wolf by having it get shorter hair and having its pads get flatter and the, the webbing between its fingers get larger and its tail get flatter and stronger. That So the reason Kent brings up uh, ridiculous limits like a pig the size of Texas is because he's trying to avoid realistic limitations like, can we change the shape of something's foot or its tail? Um, so the limit is the traits that are inherited from its parents. Um, yeah, uh, I guess Kent, Kent uses fossils when convenient and rejects them when inconvenient. Okay, that is six minutes on the dot. Thank you so much there, Taylor. And uh, we're now going to hand it over to Dr. Dino, who also has six minutes for a rebuttal. Well, thank you, sir. Now, the burden of proof is not on me. The Bible says clearly the animals bring forth after their kind. Nobody's ever observed anything other than that. The burden of proof is on you guys because you're the ones drawing the lines on paper claiming the mosquito and the whale have a common ancestor. You believe you're related to a strawberry, don't you, Taylor? Where's the evidence for that? We can see variations, of course. There's hundreds of varieties of strawberries. And you mentioned that there, you find fossils, and God murdered 99% of them, and there's a timestamp, and they're found in order. You are completely mistaken or brainwashed by your education. This geologic column they teach in the textbooks, and I taught her science for 15 years, this geologic column does not exist anywhere in the world except in the textbook. It's a lie, number 14 on my videotape. Uh, number four lies in the textbooks. You can get the whole series, 50 bucks creation seminar series. Now, they say the top layer is younger. Really? Where is it coming from? Outer space? Moving a layer from here to here is not changing the age of it. You guys are insane. Every layer of the earth is the same age. They don't have a timestamp on them. If the animals are sorted in any kind of order, it's because of hydrologic sorting. I would be willing to bet after a flood, if you dug down through, what, and it would form layers, one flood would form dozens of layers, I bet you'd find the heavier animals at the bottom, the more dense ones. I bet you'd find clams at the bottom. They already live at the bottom. Duh. That's their first ones buried. I bet you'd find birds at the top. Birds are the last ones to drown in a flood, and they got hollow feathers and hollow bones. Of course, they're going to be on top. The, the, any sorting, if there is any, is totally unrelated to age. It's related to body density, maybe the speed. They can't escape the disaster and get away. Maybe their intelligence. As far as anybody can tell, clams aren't very bright. Body density, intelligence, uh, speed, or their habitat. They're already living there. So this geologic column is one of the greatest tragedies that they teach the kids. It's baloney. It doesn't exist anywhere. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, running through these layers that you guys claim are different ages. This is pure baloney. Dead trees only stand up for a couple of years and they fall over. But petrified trees in the vertical position are found all over the place. Here's me standing by a famous one up in Yellowstone National Park. Petrified vertical tree. Standing petrified trees in Yellowstone, huh? Sometimes the trees are found petrified upside down, root end up, running through multiple layers. Would the tree grow the wrong way for millions of years trying to find the sunlight? No, it was in a flood. And trees can generally float in a flood, root end down. That's generally heavier, but it could easily be trapped with the root end up. Trees in the pet petrified in the vertical. Alabama's got a bunch of them in a coal mine up there, right there. I uh, called this guy at Troy State University. Oh, yeah, we find them all the time. Petrified trees running through several seams of coal. You guys claim the coal seams are different ages. Taylor, you are mistaken. There's a, about the layers proving anything. I got plenty of stuff on the polystrata fossils. He said we dug through the Mary Lee Foundation, found petrified trees standing up. We got down to the Blue Creek and found more trees standing up. And we found tree H and tree A and B go through both layers. Ah. Oh, any freshman law student would say, wow, that's evidence both of those layers of coal were formed within a short time before the tree could rot. 
27 layers of forest at Specimen Ridge, Yellowstone. They have the roots broken off. They were ripped out by the flood, I believe. 30-foot petrified tree, kettle mine in Cookville, Tennessee. The bottom's in a layer of coal, the top's in a different layer of coal. One tree. You guys are lying when you say that layers are different ages, and you can tell the age of a fossil by which layer it came from. Joggins, Nova Scotia is famous for all the petrified trees standing up. Hundreds of them all up and down the beach. Petrified trees in the vertical position. You are mistaken or deliberately lying when you say those layers are different ages. I take the position the flood would have formed all these layers very rapidly. So here's a, a, a creature a petrified with a nose in a layer of rock that is a million years older than the rest of the head. How did that happen? So you're simply mistaken. Polystrata trees upside down, running through many layers, clearly show your geologic column is baloney. So to date fossils by which layer they come from is idiotic. But then they turn around and date the layers. They date the layers by the fossils and date the fossils by the layers. Clear, circular reasoning. Uh, can we change uh, the shape of the foot? Can you change the shape of your foot, Taylor? Let me see you change the shape of your foot. Let me see you change the shape of your child's foot, if you have any. Okay? No, you can't do that. It might change, but it's always going to be a foot. Nobody's ever observed this. You guys dream. Imagine. SpongeBob style. Where'd you go? You dream, SpongeBob style, that everything is related. That's not science. It's imagination. Let's see. Uh, I got too much, I run out of time here. So <clears throat> I think the burden of proof is on you. Where is the evidence for evolution? I pointed out, and I think an honest court of law would say, you're right, no fossils count. You can't prove it had any children. No farmer today observes plants, or animals or plants producing different than the same kind. Variations, yes, but the variations are limited. There's a limit on the size of pigs. I don't know what it is, but I bet they're close. Okay, let's get to Texas. Let's pick a, take a pig the size of New Hampshire. Would that be better for you, Tyler? Can you get a pig as big as a horse? Can you get a pig as big as a, as a car? There are limits. There are limits in horse speed without breeding the wings on. Just speed the horse up. Can you get a horse to go 80 miles an hour? 20 there seconds. Limit. You will not admit, yes, there's limits to everything. Variations happen, but they're limited. My Bible says they're always going to bring forth after their kind. That's all we've ever seen. I rest my case. Okay, gentlemen, that concludes the opening statements and the rebuttals. Thank you to the both of you. We are now moving into the discussion portion. And as always, let's do our best to stick to one topic at a time. And since Kent just ended, Taylor, let's hand it over to you and allow you to pick the first point or topic. And as moderator, I'll do my best to make sure we're not spending any more than, let's say, 10 minutes on each line of evidence. That way we can uh, discuss most of the points brought up in the opening statement. So gentlemen, the floor is yours and uh, Taylor, you can lead the way. Yeah, so I specifically said that I agree with you that there's a limitation on size and speed of animals. And then I discussed which limitations I'm actually interested in. And so it seems like you're not even paying attention at all. So um, I guess I'll have to reiterate. So. Uh, and this is where your burden of proof lies. My burden of proof has already been met in the intro. Your burden of proof, because you claim there's a limit. What is the limitation on physical traits? We agree on the size. We agree on speed. What about shape? Are you done? Are you asking me a question? Yes. Well, science, the word science means it comes from the Latin word seer, which means no. What do we know? We know cows produce cows. We know there are some pretty strange looking cows, long horns, short horns, horns going this way, uh, horn, cows that give a lot of milk. We know what is, what is the limit on the shape of a cow? Uh, I don't know that farmers have exhausted that or not. They're always trying to breed cows for more or take something more e easy to understand like an apple. 7,500 varieties of apples. Some farmer might say, wow, my soil is, is acidic. I want to breed apples that will grow in acidic soil or base, uh, soil that's a, a base or soil that's sandy or soil that gets too much rain. They've crossbred apples. They get apples that are sweet, apples that are tart, apples that last longer, apples that are bigger, apples that are smaller. But they're always apples. What is the limit? I don't think it's my burden to prove that at all. I think any four-year-old can tell you that's an apple. 
it's still an apple. So there is a limit in size. I probably, I don't think they're going to get an apple as big as uh, a Volkswagen. I think they're going to get, and maybe they've exhausted it. Farmers been breeding stuff for a long time, for thousands of years. Farmers, whether it's animals or plants, they've discovered they run into some kind of limit and you can't, like the sugar beets. They kept getting more and more sugar until they got to 17% and couldn't go further. And the further so, they got away from the normal sugar beet, the more problems they had. Now you got to babysit the plants because mm -hmm. it's kind of susceptible to every disease. Most farmers will tell you specialty breeds of anything, whether it be corn or cows, have to, you got to babysit them and protect them. They're, let, they're more prone to disease. If you turn them all loose in the woods, they would all go back to some kind of generic cow. So I don't think it's my burden to prove that what exactly where the limit is. Is there a limit for human speed? What's the 100 yard dash record now? Nine seconds? I okay. bet a cheetah could run it in half why, that time. Why, why do you get a human to run it in four seconds? Go ahead. Why do you keep talking about speed and size when I've specifically said that we agree there's a limitation on speed and size? Okay. And there's I'm, I'm trying to prove, I'm trying to demonstrate the limitation of shape, orientation, and number to name a couple things of bones, which you would acknowledge populations of animals can uh, change the frequency of what their bones are shaped like or how many bones or w like what orientation they are. One can be slightly more upwards, right? Can you give us more specific example? A human can change the shape of his bones. Is that what you're saying? Or a cow can? Does the cow care about the shape of his bones? What, what, what animal are you talking about? Dogs, for example, they Dog? have a wide change of the shape of their skulls and bones. So Correct? do you think the, do the dog is changing his own bones? Is that what you're saying? You know that's not what I'm saying. Okay, well, explain to me. how does You know the dog exactly change? what I'm saying. You know that I'm children show, are I'm born differently. I'm trying to show you the audience. You know that I'm not talking about me taking my nose and physically getting a uh, rhinoplasty by myself, by my own biology. You know that I'm talking about my children having a slightly different nose shape than me. Same with dogs. So I agree. the point is, if you have a dog population, that's say their only food source is in a lake. Are those dogs going to be able to uh, micro evolve to be better swimmers? We don't know. Uh, try it and see. Are we there do dogs not. that live? Are there dogs that live on places where they have to swim a lot now, between islands or something? Probably. Have they evolved fins or gills? No. Well, the uh, creationist organization Answers in Genesis claims that otters and weasels are in the same kind of family. I don't know if you agree with them, but if you don't, you have a major problem with fitting animals onto the ark. Um, and in that case, yes, the animals have evolved fins. Okay. Uh, are you saying that the variations we have observed, because the topic of the debate is where's the scientific evidence for evolution? What we've observed with variations like you're explaining, is that enough to make you to believe this chart that humans and bears and elephants and whales came from an amoeba? Do you believe you came yeah. from an amoeba? You, you, do you believe you came, give you trillions of generations? Do you believe an amoeba turned into a human? Uh, not the way that you're saying, because you start with the most ridiculous possible straw man saying an amoeba turned into a human instead of focusing on what's actually close. An amoeba turning into a different type of amoeba, uh, which turns into a colony of amoebas, et cetera, et cetera. And so you skip straight to human instead of go to are humans a type of uh, hominid? Are they a type of ape? Are they a type of uh, monkey, a type of mammal? And so you skip all the intermediate steps. And we have uh, observed different kinds of amoebas that have evolved new organelles. And we've evolved uh, protozoans who have evolved new organelles in real time. So we understand how this works. This has happened. It's been recorded. It's not something that's based in fossils. Um, so the amount of diversity that we have observed in real time is not based on the fossils. 
that just explains and predicts the differences in the fossils. And you can't predict things unless you know how it works. So there's no reasonable doubt to the evidence that I presented to that. All right. An amoeba is a single-celled creature. Humans have 100 trillion cells in their body, average. Would you say that you believe an amoeba over billions of generations slowly, slowly turned into a human? No. The charts in the textbook show that they did. Why do they draw the lines on paper? They don't. Because they what the you're human. implying, the way you're wording it is that an amoeba is an amoeba and it's an amoeba slowly, slowly, slowly until one day it's a human. It's not. There are millions of intermediate steps, most of which are not amoebas. A mammal That's turned into a different kind of mammal, which, which gave birth to primates, which gave birth to humans eventually. So the way you word it is ridiculous. Because and, it is uh, ridiculous. It is ridiculous, the, Taylor. The amoeba example, um, that is a, I'm showing the paper back there. I could read it out if you want to know the title. Um, this is a beneficial mutation or a beneficial adaptation um, where an amoeba evolved a new organelle to survive better. I would the other example I gave was the multicellular um, uh, algaes, which evolved to uh, avoid predators, and they became a new kind of organism that had tissue differentiation. And you believe that is enough evidence to convince you that a chart like this is is uh, is science? Yes, because the uh, amount of variation that we can do in tests and observe in nature is larger than the gaps in the chart that you're showing. Well, I'm just complaining here about the textbooks. I have an amoeba at the bottom, slowly turning into, they have a line drawing it, connecting it to a starfish and to a jellyfish and to a octopus and to a uh, corn and a shark. This is not science. You can imagine this if you'd like. All we've ever seen is amoeba produce more amoeba. Where are the two-celled creatures and the three-celled and the four-celled? A group of them getting together to make a colony to fight off an enemy is not a single-celled organism. They might be acting coherently like a unit in the military might act coherently, but they're still individual soldiers. Nope. They don't blend together and become one soldier. Nope, that's patently false. Um, in the algae experiments um, where they were evolving to survive predators, they are indivisible. They have eight-celled bodies. If you cut one off, it dies. It's not a clump of eight individuals. It is an eight-celled clump of one individual. Some of those cells reproduce. The others do not. And if you cut it up, it will not survive. That is, is not the same thing. Send me the link to that paper. I will debunk it for you if you'd like. I don't believe that for one second. And that would take quadrillions of examples like that to change an amoeba to an octopus or a human or a whale. It's not science, Taylor. It's not, it's not observable. It's science by definition because we can predict the gaps between those animals. So if we can predict that with a certain method, then we know how it works. That's how science works. If you can go, if you can say, I predict there's going to be a lump of gold over there and over there and over there, and you get it three out of three times, then you, apparently you know how gold works. Same I thing predict. with the fossil record. We can predict how that works, and the way that we predict that is with evolution. No other competing theory has ever done that. That's Therefore, it is science by well, you definition. Keep, you keep mentioning fossil record. There is no record. There's a bunch of fossils. I predict based upon what I believe that there was a worldwide flood, I predict we will find fossils all over the world if you dig mm -hmm. down in the ground. Why aren't fossils forming today? Millions of animals died today. None of them fossilized that we know of. We find fossils by the trillions. Nobody sees it happening today. Animals die all they the don't. time. They don't fossilize. They had to be yeah. buried. So there's a, whatever you want to say, we can be ultra skeptical on this. There's a pattern to the fossils that pattern can be predicted, and it can only be predicted with one method. You can predict, it's not a prediction because everyone knows it already, 
that there will be fossils in the ground. And yes, there are fossils forming. There are uh, lots of old bones that are partially fossilized that are, have, that are just thousands of years old. And there's a whole spectrum of how fossilized they are, partially mineralized, almost completely mineralized. Um, so yeah, they, they are still forming today. You can predict there's fossils, but we can predict the pattern of the fossils. We can say we're going to find an intermediate species that has intermediate traits between fish and a salamander or amphibian in these specific rocks. We can predict there's going to be a form that has intermediate traits of both dinosaur and bird in those specific rocks. You can't do that. That means we understand the pattern. I, I think, I, first of all, you said fossils are forming. I'd love to see evidence of that. You think they're forming in any great numbers like we see found in the ground? Fossils by the trillions. There are fossils petrified clams like this in the closed position, petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest and in the top of the mountains in Peru, South America, petrified closed clams. I predict that that would be evidence that there was a flood where they were buried so rapidly they didn't have time to even open or they clammed up and got buried deep enough that they couldn't open. And so we have hundreds, we have thousands of these in our museum here, petrified closed clams. I think that's a prediction that indicates there was a flood, rapid burial. I think the layers of the earth with petrified trees connecting them, which you did not address, trees connecting all the layers would be a prediction based on the idea that all the layers are similar age, all probably formed in one year before the tree could rot. Can you explain? how you get a petrified tree running through all these layers, if the layers are different ages, they're found by the thousands. How yeah, do you explain none of, that? None of the polystrate trees actually run through different strata of different ages. Um, oh. they, they run through different strata that were created about th at the same time, and floods do happen around the world. You're claiming that it was one single flood, but so you're not predicting anything. You're just accommodating what is already there, the data that is already there, but you're not predicting the data. So, um, well, okay, I'll make a prediction. Before we move on. I'll make a prediction. I used to raise hamsters. And when I was a kid, that was my business as a you know 10-year-old, raising hamsters to sell to pet stores. I predict if you start with 500 hamsters, and crossbreed them, you can get all different colors. You can get big ones and little ones, but I predict after 500 generations, you're still gonna have hamster. I, I predict if you crossbreed hamsters, they'll get baby hamsters every time. I predict if you crossbreed cows, you're gonna get a cow. Sight unseen, mm -hmm. I would make that prediction. Bible says they bring forth after their kind. That's all anybody's ever seen. I predict it'll always be what everybody ever sees. Farmers try hard to get something bigger, better, stronger, faster and they reach a limit. There's a limit, Taylor. Yeah, but none of the limitations actually preclude any of the evolutionary branches. So the fact that we can have animals that are produced differently, uh, different numbers, different sizes and shapes of muscles, different numbers of bones, different sizes and shapes and locations and orientations of bones, shows that every difference in the evolutionary tree is accounted for by things that we already know can happen. This isn't uh, an impossible thing like a pig becoming the size of Texas. These are things that we observe happen. Farmers have observed pigs on farms getting extra vertebrae, extra ribs, and that's not just a simple copy-paste of a rib gene. That It requires lots of coordinated... Uh, changes and yet it still happens naturally okay so we know that the limitations of the evolutionary tree are already covered by things that we know can happen the amoeba does not have any bones at all mm -hmm. which what was the first animal to have any kind of a bone is there any scientific evidence of any has any fossil been found of something just starting to develop bone material the uh first animals that had hard parts were shelled animals and the first animals that had bones were fish so and the backbone actually was before that so the way that you get that 
like I said in the intro, you know, I focus more on the bones because that's easier to see, but uh, the se individual cells can change their chemical makeup. So you can have cells that mutate and are harder, cells that excrete hard things like calcium. So, and calcium exists in nature. So if a cell is taking in calcium and excreting calcium, that's all you need to have cells that then mutate to coordinate excreting calcium, making shells, or coordinate uh, making harder cells that, ex that use calcium for bones or cartilage. And from there, the shapes can be changed to make any shape. Um, but the point being that we can tell what things are related based on their bones. Um, creationists often argue that these uh, snake fossils are the first fossils for snakes. Um, and they argue that on the basis of their jaw alone, because that's all that exists for these fossils. So creationists simultaneously say that you can't use fossils to tell which are related. And then they turn around and do that with fossils that this is literally all they have is a jawbone and a couple of vertebrae. Go ahead, Kent. Okay. Uh, Taylor, you said uh, they excrete calcium and make a shell on the outside. Uh, is there an example, I guess, of a single celled creature creating a shell? I mean, I don't know if you understand this or not, but shells are on the outside of the animal. Skeletons are on the inside. How is it going to change from having a shell on the outside to having a skeleton on the inside with a whole bunch of muscles and nerves? And they don't. And, 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 able, and able to pass that on to their children. They this don't. Is dreaming. That's dream. why. That's why the entire evolutionary branch of um, animals with an exoskeleton never grow inside bones because they keep inheriting an exoskeleton, and the animals that evolved bones inside of their flesh don't generally develop an egg. Well, they don't have an exoskeleton. Some of them, like armadillos, have hard skin or scales, but they continue to have an internal skeleton, an endoskeleton, because that's the trait that they were inherited from their parents. And yes, in the early differentiation phase, cells could excrete inside the main body or outside the main body. And you have evidence of this, or you're just telling a story? This is uh, observed with biochemistry. Cells can excrete things like any chemical, including calcium, and organisms can change where they excrete things, where the chemicals are brought inside the cell, whether they're brought to a certain organelle or they're brought to the surface of the cell. This has been shown to be changed genetically and epigenetically. Um, so, and, and uh, the coordination of shapes of cells has been observed as, like in that uh, the algae experiment that I'm, that I'll send you the link for um, the cells previously lacked the ability to communicate um, to differentiate their function, but they ended up utilizing and repurposing a preexisting gene that they could communicate with other individuals. And now they're using it to communicate with their own bodies to sell, tell the outside cells not to reproduce, but the inside cells to reproduce. So if you get a bigger version of that, all of a sudden you have reproductive organs and non-reproductive tissues. Go ahead, Kent. Um, he mentioned in his opening, that, which is the purpose of this debate, for him to provide evidence for evolution that ERVs are evidence for evolution. Well, uh, one and... topic at a time, Kent, please. Okay. You are <laughs> imagining that an animal can create a skeleton inside itself. Where's the science to show this happening? Sure, they can secrete calcium. Sure. I can sweat out salt, too, out of my skin. I didn't mean I can build a salt block out of it. Uh, the, sure. You're, you're not, this is not science, Taylor. You're giving an imaginary story. Just imagine, boys and girls, that a bone started growing inside of a cell. 
Well, that's not science. That's SpongeBob. Where's the evidence of this? Science is what we can observe, study, do it again. Get a bunch of amoeba and make them grow a skeleton inside their body. Do it again in the laboratory. You can't do it. You can well, imagine. They, they don't grow skeletons inside of single cells. They okay. do that between get, the cells. Get a colony of, of bacteria together or a colony of single celled organisms and make them grow a skeleton. They have material that binds them together and that could potentially be calcium. That, okay, suppose they're bound together with calcium. Does there, is that therefore a skeleton? Or you're going to imagine that it could become a skeleton if we gave it billions of years? It shows that every single change that is necessary to bridge every gap in the evolutionary tree is observed to be possible. And if it's possible, and if the evolutionary story can predict the gaps in that record, then that is science. So before we move on to ERVs, I just and, have and Snake, one before more you continue, I, I just want to, and, and I don't want to interrupt you. I just want to point out that we got eight minutes left. So if you want to make a quick final point, and then we'll spend the last eight minutes on another line of evidence, maybe ERVs, and then we'll go into concluding statements. So go ahead, uh, Snake, make a quick final point there, and then we can yeah. move to another line of evidence. So we know that an animal can lose hair, that an animal, well, the population. So we're not talking about a single individual here, right? A population can end up having a majority traits where they, compared to their ancestors, lose hair, they get smaller hind limbs, they get bigger tails, maybe flatter tails, and flatter front paws. Well, all, we know that that's all possible. We've observed these, change hap these changes happening in, re in real time in experiments. Uh, uh, creationist organizations say that this happened within the biblical arc kinds. But if we have all of these changes happening in the same population, then it's possible for whales to evolve from wolf-like animals. So any comments there? Uh, uh, yeah. So a wolf, could a whale could evolve from a wolf, okay? I'm not sure how many whales you've seen, but... Uh, well, I explained all the changes necessary. Were you listening? Right, right. Now, they lose hair. That's a loss of information, not a gain. They get smaller hind limbs. That's a loss of information, not a gain. How is this wolf's tail going to turn into a, a, the fluke of a whale? You, I mean, you think a wolf tail, just that simple. Do you believe the tail of the wolf slowly transitioned and became the tail of the whale? We know Therefore, that it's possible, yeah. You think that's? Do you think that's what happened? Well, not actually a wolf, but a wolf-like mammal. Okay, it had hoofs. Are you, but are you aware that the wolf has the nose on the front of the body? The whale has mm -hmm. the nose on the top. Yeah, is that's why slowly, I. That's why I showed you a picture of dogs go, that uh, have the nose go turned up. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. How, if, if Ken could reiterate that point, because I, I don't think we fully got okay. it, and then Snake will how, let you. Uh, how did it? How did it transition from the front? to the top when it had to go through the optic nerve to do that. Well, you, you don't know just... that a nose can be slightly higher, right? In the, the child generation. Well, that just happened again and then happened again and then happened again. I've got exactly what you need. Ah, just imagine. I have to put your name on here. I got Professor Dave. You don't have to imagine it. We know it happens. You know it happens? That's why I, I showed you a picture happens. of the pug, which had its nose turned up. So you think It's just a question of how many times it happens. So the nose of the pug is moving up toward the top of its head and going to become breathing through the back of its head like a whale does? This is imagination. I wish you guys could understand. You have a religion. You don't have a science. You believe this stuff. You believe it very strongly. I admire your faith, but it's not science. Everybody's ever observed wolves producing wolves. That's all they've ever seen. You can imagine it turning it, and whales produce whales, nothing else. You may get a variety of whales, but you're going to get a whale. You might get a variety of wolves, but you're going to get a wolf. I would promise, I'd bet you $5. If you crossbreed wolves, you'll get baby wolves, not, not a whale, not even close to a whale, not even part whale. And to think that the tail of a wolf, which you wag side to side, is going to change to the tail of a whale, which he wags up and down, has all that power, 
And it's just, I, I, I can't understand how you guys can sleep at night and believe something so dumb. Go ahead. Well, the power yeah. from a, a whale actually comes from the up and down motion of its uh, backbone, which right. all mammals have. That's the way that their backbone flexes. And dogs' tails do go up and down. That's how they signal mood to each other. Um, but the point is, all of the variation that you accept within kinds is larger than the gaps between the kinds. So the for the horse kind, for example, having its toes coordinate to have a larger toe, to have its fingernail basically become large and thick enough to support its entire body weight of its just its middle finger, if that amount of change is possible, then the smaller differences between things like horses and tapers are also possible and has been predicted. So, Okay, let me jump in real quick. In the last three to four minutes, uh, Kent, of course, you can have a quick response to, to what Snake said there, and then maybe we should engage the ERVs for the last three to four minutes, and then we'll get into some, some closing statements. Go ahead, gentlemen. Well, again, he can imagine that an animal with toes and fingernails turned into a hoof on one toe. You can imagine that all day long. I would say it's an amazing design. We have llamas and alpacas up here at Dinosaur Adventureland and, and uh, mules and horses. The single hoof is very different than toes and fingernails. You can imagine if you want, but it's not observable. Our, our, dog, our mules had a baby and it turned out to be a mule. Our sheep had a baby, it turned out to be a, a sheep. Every time, no exceptions. So it's it, you guys, I think it's evidence of a common designer. It's a neat design to have the fingernail and the, the hoof material to be tough, but not too brittle that it'll snap all the time, but tough enough that it can walk on the dirt. It's an amazing design. Hoofs are amazingly designed and they work good. And when they crossbreed, they always get babies with hoofs every time. No feathers, always hair on the horse every time. So you guys, I, I feel sorry for you that you imagine these things and can't understand that it's not science. I feel sorry for you. Okay, gentlemen, did you want to spend the last two minutes on, on the ERV argument? And I think that would pretty much give us a, a good segue into the concluding statements as, as you guys would have addressed the major points in, in the debate. But it's, it's up to you, gentlemen. It doesn't yeah, have to be ERV. Have him pick a topic. It doesn't have to be ERV. I'm ready for that one. But... Yeah, okay, go I ahead, love, Taylor. Pick I would a, a love final if you topic. gave your response to the ERVs. Well, ERV, endogenous retrovirus, a virus but lots of viruses have been discovered since the early 1900s. Uh, what is an endogenous retrovirus? You read your whole script for the first 12 minutes this morning. Let me read just a little bit here to you. Endogenous retrovirus can easily turn into one of those terms evolutionists hide behind to try to prove they are right. While the word can be a mouthful and letters sound like alphabet soup, ERVs can be understood by separating the various parts into understandable chunks. First of all, they're viruses. In the fallen world, we understand viruses to be obligate intracellular parasites. Most people think of viruses as being bad. They're not all bad. Basic scientific information about critical components within the genome. In the discovery of ERVs took place in the 1960s and 70s. Three types of ERVs were found, and they named them here. And Darwin's book came out 100 years before that, before they ever discovered ERVs. So why did people believe in evolution for 100 years before they had this evidence? Because every other bit of evidence they've had over the last 100 years has been proven wrong. They keep latching onto the newest and biggest and baddest new evidence. Discovery of ERVs took place in the 1960s and 70s. But people believed in evolution without this evidence for 100 years. What evidence do we have that has stood the test of time? I say none. ERVs are one of the phony evidences. I had not taken time to prepare a reasoned response before. So Baldy Katz brought it up. I said, well, I'm not ready for that one, but I'm ready now. Okay, they went nuts over that. Scientists just discovered this, and they just discovered that, and they just discovered that. And endogenous simply means internal, having an internal cause or origin. It's a virus inside, okay? Growing or originating within an organism. Retrovirus, a group of viruses uh, that, which insert a DNA copy of their genome in the host cell to replicate. So the virus comes along, stick some of its information into the cell. The cell then becomes the copy machine for it. It's, a, it's amazing the way it works. It's like 
lo logging into somebody else's computer and making them run copies for you. Sure. But the DNA, the cell itself is so complicated. One cell is more complicated than the space shuttle. And for this retrovirus to be able to go in and take over that cell's information, copying it is mind boggling in its complexity. Six human retroviruses have been identified so far. All of them affect the T cells. Well, I tell you what, I'll do a whole hour program just on ERVs, just for you, Snake. Uh, and to show you, they are evidence of amazing design. They're really, really cool. They're sharp. They get into the cell, and they're not all harmful. So Viral biology, the results of a new study. There are 320,000 different viruses that infect mammals. Many are beneficial. They have a purpose. They have a function. So the fact that we have retroviruses, ERVs, is not evidence for evolution. The fact that we have similar ones to apes is not evidence. It might be the same designer. The lug nuts on a Chevy will screw onto a Pontiac. That's proof they both came from a, a, a horse. All right. Oh. So uh, if I have some time to respond. Sure. Um, that number behind me. Those are all zeros except for the first three. That is the chances of what you just said happening. Is that uh, if they if it's just all infections happens to be in the uh, apes and humans, um, and it gets uh, it's no less absurd when you think it's good that uh, you admit that they are actually viruses inserting because that makes your argument that they were designed by God even more absurd because as you know, some viruses are important in embryology. Some of the uh, ERVs are important in embryology. So that would mean that for a while humans were walking around without these genes um, that are supposedly necessary. Um, so either we somehow evolved to accommodate that. Or God, God's plan was to give us the, our incomplete genome and just give it to, instead of just giving it to us through Adam and Eve, he decided to give it to us um, by infecting us with viruses, which has about this number over here, uh, chance of actually working unless he physically directs them all by itself. Um, in which case, why bother doing that? So the fact that you admit that they're viruses is good because you admit that they are the result of infections. And yeah, the chances of that happening are astronomical uh, by chance. And there's a, it's absolutely an absurd da to doubt that, that it was due to infections because God would never design humans like that. He would just give us the genes that we need immediately. Okay, let's okay. do this before you respond, Dr. Dino. Why don't we give Kent the opportunity to have a final word on this topic? And then uh, to be fair, Snake, you're gonna be first in the concluding statement. So whatever you wanna respond to, save it for that. And then that way we can still get to some audience questions. So uh, Kent, the floor is yours for a response. Take as much time as you need. Well, I think you need to keep in mind, uh, Taylor, that we are a copy off of a copy, off of a copy, off of a copy of our grandparents, great grandparents. You, by the time you copy this gene code hundreds of times to go back hundreds of generations, the fact that we can still sit up and walk and talk is amazing. OK, get a get a get a piece of paper with any print on it and run a copy of it through the copy machine. Take that copy coming out and make a copy off of that one then make a copy off the copy off the copy. You do that 40 times, you won't be able to read a word on the page. So your gene code, which is phenomenal, the gene code of one human being is more complex than the whole computer system of the world. And you think that when copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and copied, it's, it's stunning that, it's a, that it still works. And it does, I think it was amazing design. Scientists dis identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses. They've only been working on this stuff for like 40 or 50 years. They're finding all kinds of new things. Let's see, endogenous retroviruses play a critical role in the body's immune defense against common bacteria and viral pathogens. Just because it's got the word virus in doesn't mean it's bad, okay? Researchers have found retroviruses are best known for causing contagious scourges such as AIDS and more sporadically cancer. 
but they have all kinds of beneficial mutation, beneficial uses. So I'll do a whole program just on ERVs, just for you. But if that's, a, if that's your evidence that you're related to a worm, I think you need to try again. So you, D Professor Dave admitted he believes he's evolved, he evolved from a strawberry. He and a strawberry have a common ancestor. And you admitted, I believe, that you, I think, over X number of generations, I'll give you trillions if you want, take that big number, you can have triple that in number of generations. You think an amoeba turned to Taylor over trillions and trillions of quadrillions, sextillions, septillions, octillions, novillions, decillions of generations. Okay, that's not science. It's a religion. So I feel sorry for you. I stand my ground. I think there's no evidence whatsoever, no scientific evidence for uh, any animal ever changing into anything we would consider different. You make up these imaginary stories. Well, what if it secreted calcium? Okay, that's not so. We don't observe it. We don't observe anybody growing a backbone. We don't observe uh, any, any creature changing into anything else. Every farmer will tell you cows produce cows. Corn produces corn, no exceptions. So you have joined the SpongeBob Club. You have a vivid imagination and I admire your imagination, but that's not science. Go ahead. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for the enjoyable exchange. Time really does fly by with these debates. And of course, Taylor, to be fair, there might be a few things you want to respond to there. And that's why we have five minute concluding statements. So Taylor, we're going to hand it over to you and uh, take up to five minutes. Then we'll do the same for Dr. Dino and then we'll get into some audience questions. So again, fantastic discussion, tons of fun. we got a huge audience and uh, floor is yours there, Taylor. All right. So it seems like you still were not prepared for the ERV debate. All you said was that it's uh, complex and that there's uh, some benefits to some of them. So God did it, uh, which is unreasonable because God could have just put the ERVs into our DNA from the start and not have to rely on um, deadly pathogens uh, to perchance infect not just human bodies, but they have to infect specifically reproductive cells, um, which is very unlikely in the first place. Um, so that's just a ridiculously contrived uh, method of, I don't know what, what you think it is, updating the operating system. Well, I don't know why he wouldn't just give it to us in the first place. Same with mitochondria. Um, God could have just put mitochondrial DNA in our nuclear DNA, and some organisms do have this, proving that it's possible. But instead, uh, mitochondria actually have plasmid DNA that looks like bacteria. So one of the things that our life is completely reliant on, at least human life, is not pre-programmed by God. It is obviously evolved from endocytosis of bacteria. Um, back to ERVs, I've, I showed that ERVs are evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. The only doubts you could give are so unreasonable, it's like medically concerning. Uh, you And you said that ERVs are new evidence, and therefore that was, well, that was some kind of criticism. I don't see a problem with using new evidence at all. That's very knocked down evidence. Uh, and that's saying, well, it's new. You haven't been using it for uh, the entire time, even though there's other evidence of evolution. This is just really good new evidence. Um, the fact that that's your best response is really telling. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it makes no sense to be talking about uh, whether whales and pine trees are related if you don't first have the conversation about if whales are related to the things in the fossil record that look kind of like whales and the things below that, like Pachycetus, that look like the intermediate whales. Um, so what we're talking about here is not whether uh, a fish is related to human. They are, but what we're talking about is whether a fish population can walk on land. And there are fish populations that can do that. And the question is, since we predicted this in the fossil record by finding Tiktaalik, are there fish populations that can go up onto land that can get better at going on land, like the fish behind me right now. Um, is it possible for fish to have slight changes in their fins that make it easier for them to walk on land? 
Is it possible for fish to have slight changes in their skin to make it so that they dry out slower on land? We know this is possible. It's just that Kent says that this by implication that this can't happen in the same population. For some reason, he wants to talk about pigs getting the size of Texas instead of things that we actually know are possible. So can these fish get better at walking on land? Yeah, I'm, he agrees that things that already have the capability to do something can get better at it. Um, and we've done these experiments on fish. We've done... Uh, there's an experiment I can send you where they took catfish that uh, even in the same species, they had completely different shaped fins um, and all functional. Um, so what, what we're talking about is these small improvements that we all know can happen, but put together. And when we make those assumptions, uh, we can predict where certain animals are going to be. And by that standard, that is the scientific gold standard. That is science by definition. That is proving the theory beyond all reasonable doubts. All we've gotten are unreasonable doubts, misunderstanding of what science is, how science works. Um, and basically, especially dodges, especially for the ERVs. Um, I, I think that might be close to time, Taylor. Yeah, I've got about 30 seconds on my watch, but I'll, Go. No, I'll, it, it, I'll concede. I was going to say my uh, my phone died in the middle of that, so I, I don't know how much. To, if you still got 30 seconds, go ahead. Take it all. Uh, take no, it. I was done, so go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Thank yeah. you, Taylor. And uh, we'll, we'll hand it over to uh, Kent. You have up to five minutes as well. And uh, let me unmute you. Floor is yours. Well, thank you, sir. I would be willing to bet you $5, Taylor, that that fish you show behind you, if it has babies, will do the same thing. Walk just like that along the bottom of a lake. I think the grandbabies and great grandbabies will always do the same. As I mentioned, they tried to get more sugar out of the sugar beet. They were able to raise it from standard 6% to 17%. Couldn't get past it. They ran into a limit. Why don't they grow sugar beets that are 100% sugar or 99% sugar? The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. That fish you showed behind you will bring forth babies that do the same thing it does. No more. Okay? The common ancestor, we covered all this, the different kinds of nuts. But you guys want to imagine that because we see 50 varieties of watermelons, therefore fish and watermelons have a common ancestor. I would be willing to bet you believe you have a common ancestor with a watermelon. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. All we've seen is variations within the kind. Like the Bible says what happened. You've given, in my opinion, no evidence. You've given a story you think it might have happened that way? Let's see, I want to get to uh, 1591, Alt-DV, 1591, enter. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind, they'll bring forth every, every sort. This is not a debate about the Bible, but I think the Bible is scientifically true. That's all that we've ever seen. But yet the textbooks show that humans and starfish have a common ancestor. This isn't science. This is a religion. You can believe that all you want. Oh, and worms, by the way, you're related to a worm. I object to this being taught that humans came from a protista. It would take a whole lot of changes to go from a protista to a human, and it's not science. It's not observed. We don't see any of this happen. This one has a bunch of lines on paper connecting the humans and the birds and the starfish and the pine trees. I object to that. This one shows the birds and the dinosaurs and the worms and the sharks and the clams came from, and, and humans and bears came from a common ancestor. I think it's time for people to say, hold it. Science deals with what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Every farmer in the world, in the, every farmer in the history of the world will tell you cows produce cows, nothing else. Horses produce horses, nothing else. Pine trees produce pine trees. You might get a bigger one or a smaller one. And dogs produce dogs. There are simply no exceptions. So I hold my ground. I think that evolution is a religion. It is not observable. You're welcome to have it. But you guys need to go start a private school and teach it to those who want to pay and come learn it. But you know that only about 6% of the population claims to be atheistic uh, evolutionists. I think that's the number I just read. But 6 to 8%. Okay. 
go start a private school. You know nobody would come. So you got to make everybody pay for your religion to be taught to the kids. And they start off teaching the kids, oh, yes, these layers are different. During the Jurassic period, there's no such thing as a Jurassic period. There's no such thing as Cretaceous, Cenozoic, Mesozoic. It doesn't have, it doesn't exist. All the layers are the same age from Noah's flood. Technically, every speck of dirt on the planet would be the same age, whether it's 6,000 or 6 trillion. They're all the same age. Rearranging them does not change the age. Shuffling a deck of cards does not make the top card younger. All the cards are the same age. So you guys have this imaginary geologic column. You have an imaginary fossil record. There's no fossil record. There's a lot of fossils, but they don't have a date on them. None of them have a date, and none of them talk. It's not a record. You're making this up. And I resent you for calling that science and polluting what is good science with this dumb religion of evolution. So I think his burden of proof on him tonight was to provide evidence for evolution. Uh, we'll re review this if I get time and say, did he actually provide evidence for evolution? He provided imagination stories. He and SpongeBob going to get along good. But did he show that it could, did he show that it has happened? Do it in the laboratory. Grow a spine on a single-celled creature, get a colony together, and make it grow a spine and an arm. Make that fish you saw in the background uh, turn into a bird. Your chart shows fish and birds have a common ancestor. Could you, over billions of years, get those wing, get those arms on that little fish to become wings and fly? I want to see that. I don't believe it happened at all. I believe the Bible is true. I believe if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to go to hell. The Bible says we're all sinners. God made the world. We broke his laws. We're in trouble. He provided a way out. Taylor, I'd like to see you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and get into his family before it's too late. You could die any day. They got some idiots out there driving on the road. Hope you live to be 100. But even then, you're going to die. Then what? Think about it. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much. That concludes the concluding statements. Again, another debate to remember in this 2022 evolution debate series. Uh, Snake was right. I appreciate you uh, doing this debate and, and taking the challenge. Again, uh, fantastic debate, easy to moderate. And now we got some awesome audience questions. We could be here as usual all night and probably all day tomorrow with the amount of questions we got. So I'm going to put a timer on the, uh, the clock, let's say 20 minutes, and we'll get through as many as we can. And in order uh, to move along smoothly, what we'll do is whoever the question is for, we'll make sure they get the last word. And so let's let's start this off. A bunch of super chats have come in from logical, plausible, probable. Uh, he says, uh, prepare yourselves. After show is going to happen. So it looks like there is a debate after show over on John Maddox channel. I appreciate the support. And John, that should definitely be a ton of fun. Okay, so here we go. First one that came in all the way back at the beginning of this debate in the form of a super chat. Here we go. I got it up on screen. This one comes in from Ecom Star, $5 super chat. And I appreciate it. It's for you, Snake. Um, okay, so he asks, atheists believe everything came from a dot. Where did the space come from that the dot originally existed in? thought the dot created uh, space, not necessarily the, the topic of, of the night being biological evolution. I apologize, but uh, go ahead, Snake, if you want to answer. Yeah, very off topic. And also um, millions of Christians also believe everything came from a dot. Uh, originally, a create a Christian came up with the idea of the Big Bang. Um, yeah. Uh, and like Kent was trying to tell me, uh, about accepting Jesus Christ, this is, has nothing to do with the debate. You can accept Jesus Christ and believe in evolution at the same time. Uh, you can accept Jesus and God and accept the Big Bang at the same time. Um, but uh, to answer the question, where did space come from? Uh, as far as I understand it, matter itself creates the space. Um, not an astrophysicist or a physicist, but uh, yeah, has nothing to do with atheism though. Okay, thank you Taylor for the response and we're gonna hand it over to Dr. Dino for his response. Go ahead, the floor is yours, Kent. Well, I don't think anybody could have a scientific answer to explain where time, space, matter came from. Uh, uh, something, some entity, I'll call it God, because I believe God created time, space, and matter. It's a great question. 
How do you get all the energy and all the matter in the world into a dot? The atheists do teach the Big Bang Theory that all the energy and all the matter was in a dot smaller than a proton. How much is the total energy of all the stars up there burning right now? You want all that energy to be in that dot. You couldn't squeeze a gallon of milk into a dot smaller than a proton. You certainly couldn't squeeze the whole Pacific Ocean and the whole United States and the whole world and the whole universe into a dot. They do believe this dot contained all the time, all the energy, all the space, and all the matter. My Bible answers that in 10 words. In the beginning, there's time, God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, matter. The guy who created my computer is not in my computer. He's outside of the computer. He can control it. The God who created the time, space, and matter is not limited by time. The God that I worship is not stuck in 2022, wishing he could go back five minutes. He can go back and forward anytime he wants. God right now is standing at your funeral and my funeral. So the God that I worship created time, space, matter, and it didn't come from a dot. It came from God. Thank you for that response, Kent. And uh, Taylor, we're going to hand it to you for the last word because yeah. the question was for you. Um, yeah, so that's just... Am I, oh, I thought I was muted for a second. Uh, that's just as vacuous as saying uh, not God did it. Saying God did it doesn't explain anything. It's just you can't explain how he did it. Uh, so it's meaningless. I can just say not God did it. And I've explained just as much as you did. Okay, next question. We got a good mix of questions for uh, the both of you. So we'll get one in now for Kent. And uh, this one comes in from Binny B, and I've got it up on screen here. Uh, let's read it out. At Standing for Truth, how do you explain? So this question is for you, Kent. How do you explain having chromosome two? So it looks like he's referring to the chromosome two fusion, being two chromosomes put together without common ancestry or evolution, with apes having twenty-four and we have twenty-three chromosome pairs. Go ahead, uh, Kent. Yes, I gave a very long answer to that a couple of nights ago on our program, Kent Hovind Official. You can go back a few nights and talk about that, the so-called evidence for evolution, chromosome two. Chromosome two is designed exactly like it is. It's not two chromosomes put together. It's very complex and it works just fine. It's not just two of them welded together. The problem is apes, chimpanzees, uh, and other creatures similar to that have 24 pairs of chromosomes. We have 23. Atheists say, oh, wow, we must have blended one together. Well, it's not true, and I show all the scientific journals and all that, why it's not true. It's imagination to believe that they're two, uh, chromosome two is actually two stuck together. So I don't have to, I, I can call it all up, but take an hour to answer, but I just did that a couple of nights ago. If you go watch my YouTube channel, go back and re watch my long uh, response I gave there. Thank you. Thank you very much there, uh, Kent, and we'll give uh, Snake Was Right a chance to respond as well. Go ahead, Taylor. Yeah, that doesn't really uh, address the the telltale signs of having two chromosomes fused together. Chromosomes have these caps called telomeres, which are long repeats of a certain nucleotides. And human chromosome two has the caps of chromosomes in it, in the middle. Whereas chimps, this is a very rare thing. Uh, chimps and other apes do not have this in the middle of their chromosomes. We have it in the middle of our chromosome that looks almost identical in its gene composition to the two chromosomes that apes have. And that I don't know why God would design a chromosome to have useless telomeric repeats in the middle of a chromosome that do nothing when all of our other chromosomes do just fine without them. And if he wants us to not believe that, he would have taken them out just to remove all doubts. Okay, thank you, Snake. And to be fair, question was for Kent. So, Kent, we're going to hand it over to you. You can have the last word. Uh, yeah, I would have to say, go back to watch my video from a couple of nights ago because I covered this in great detail. The Even the part where the, these two appear to be joined together, that has coding information. The information in one chromosome is mind-boggling. To, to say that it's just a matter of sticking them together, it's not, it's not the case at all. Uh, they are very complex. One chromosome... If you unwound one chromosome, it'd be about six feet long, and you have 100 trillion cells in your body, and they've got 20, 46 chromosomes, except for the gametes. So all the chromosomes from one person, one person's chromosomes unwound, 
would be like a ladder reaching from here to the moon and back 500,000 times. It's a really complicated code. You guys imagine that it just happened. I feel sorry for you. Thank you, uh, Kent, for that final word. Okay, let's get a question now in for Snake Was Right. And here is a very on-topic question, as you gentlemen did discuss this in the debate. So this one comes in from Redefine Living uh, for you, Snake. So he asks, ERVs, endogenous retroviruses, are neutral to the debate unless you can show them going from non-function to function. Can you do this is the question, Snake. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, where is that sign? Right there. <coughs> uh, <coughs> it's a study of taking uh, H uh, ERVs that are dead and restoring them to function. It's the identification of an infectious progenitor for the multiple copy HERVK human endogenous retro elements. So there you go, redefine living. And uh, whenever you feel like chatting with me i'm always open okay snake thank you for that response and uh, we'll hand it over to kent now kent if you had a response go ahead well yeah to go from non-functioning to functioning uh, to make uh, people have the intelligence to be able to type on a keyboard and type in certain letters and create computer codes okay is it possible to put a chimpanzee on a keyboard and have him come up with a computer code could a chimpanzee just randomly typing develop uh, Microsoft PowerPoint or Microsoft Word? I would say no. It takes intelligent input to do this kind of thing. I think all of the code that we see, even in ERVs, is intelligently designed and they serve a function. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it, it had to be a designer. And I know who he is. He's my friend, my Heavenly Father. Thank you, Kent. And uh, Snake, question was for you. Quick final word. Yeah, um, just because they contain a benefit does not really mean it came from a designer. Uh, the fact that you admit that it comes from viruses means that saying it's from a designer is one of the most absurd things I've ever heard. And it's definitely not scientific. You can't demonstrate that with science. Uh, we can demonstrate that these come from infections with science. And we've demonstrated with this experiment that I mentioned that they are can indeed be restored to full, fully functional viruses. Um, and so it, it's so absurd because, again, God could have just given us these, uh, these gene sequences. He could have put them in us with, a, and most of them are neutral or slightly harmful. So he could have just not given us those ones. He could have cut out the uh, viral specific elements, just gave us the good parts of all these things, because some of them have a slightly beneficial parts and slightly deleterious parts in the same ERV. Um, so, so yeah, it's absurd to think that God designed humans, set them loose, and then designed viruses to infect humans to correct his perfect design of humans and just kind of hope that they infect the right cells and that they spread throughout the entire population. That's insane. Okay. Moving on to the next question here. Now we got one for Kent. Um, and then I think we'll do one more for, for snake and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. These debates do fly by and uh, you know, we're going to be at the two hour mark soon. So Kent, this one's for you. This one comes in from call me emo. And uh, he asks, Question for Kent. How different must organisms become before they become a new kind? Wouldn't the initial new kind look just like the generations that preceded it? Go ahead, Kent. Um, I mentioned many times on my show that there are 27 different definitions for the word species. Uh, nobody's been able to come up with an airtight definition of this word. What does this word species mean? Man has decided we want to classify animals into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I don't think the animals care where we put them. You want to find out if animals are the same kind? Turn them all loose in the woods. The males will tell you which ones are the same kind. My male horses have shown no interest whatsoever in the pine trees. They want a female horse. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. They don't want the female sheep. They want a horse. So I think they'll tell you if it's the same kind or not. But I don't think we've ever seen any animal produce a new kind. They might produce a variety, big one, small one, you know, smart one, dumb one, but it's still, it just, it hasn't been observed. All of 
observable history says cows produce cows, dogs produce dogs. And there's, there seem to be limits. Whether we've reached them or not with a miniature toy chihuahua, probably about as small as they can go, I don't know. I know this, they wouldn't survive on their own in the wild. So if natural selection is allowed to play out, 90% of the dogs man has created would not be alive. Uh, natural selection selects, doesn't create anything. So I don't think there's been any examples of a new kind of animal or plant created. Only a slice of a pre-existing gene code can be selected for. Thank you, Kent, for the response. Thank you, Call Me Emo, for the question. And uh, Snake, we'll hand it over to you for your response. Yeah, so one reason it's hard to define species is because there actually is no hard limit to life's relationships. There's, there's no actual gap that you can find that you can say, oh, well, this is too big for a pig to have evolved into it. That, that doesn't happen. Well, the limits are like, well, a mosquito did not evolve into a pig, obviously. Um, but uh, I just had a very long conversation with Call Me Emo. Uh, check that out on my channel uh, about his discussion with you, Kent, and this very question, which I was trying to get at this whole time. Um, the point of this question, which you completely did not touch on at all, is that um, what criteria do you need? What changes need to happen for us to say, well, this organism had these changes, it is a new kind. You just kind of colloquially say, well, I'll know it when I see it. Um, so what, what traits? Because we do have examples of organisms where new traits arise in them and they're passed down genetically. Um, and, but is that criteria enough to say it's a new kind? You won't give the criteria. No one will give the criteria. No one will, will, actually meet uh the phylogeny challenge um no one will meet this specific challenge call the the way call me emo words it you won't actually give specific criteria so that we can meet it and say yes this change occurred this change occurred um and that's important because it, the only thing that we need to bridge the gaps in the evolutionary tree is these specific changes that we have observed it just happening multiple times so we need to know how many microevolutions that we have observed is required for it, it to meet a change in kind. For how many micro, basically, how many microevolutions make a macroevolution? I've never gotten an answer. I've asked it a hundred different ways, a hundred different times. Okay, thank you for the response there, uh, Taylor. And over to you, Kent, for you, you get the last word on that one. Well, if the creationists were demanding that everybody pay for their theories to be taught in the schools, then the burden of proof would be on us to answer to this. But we're not. See, this is a classic illustration, and you don't even see it, Snake. You just demonstrated that what you have is a religious belief that they can change from one to another. I don't know where the limits is. Nobody knows. Nobody knows where the... It's hard to define uh, species because it's hard to determine when a population or organism can or cannot reproduce. This is a common problem, and I, I, it's the same thing with the word kind. It's not my, see, but see, that doesn't mean that therefore evolution is true. We can't define species, we can't define kind. It's just, it's a difficult, but we know that animals always bring forth what a four-year-old would tell you is the same kind. Tell you what, bring a four-year-old or a five-year-old up to our, to our barn, and he'll be able to point out which ones are chickens and which ones are ducks. I bet he can point it out. Uh, so it's, it's intuitive in most cases. There's a few that are tough. I think we could line up vehicles and say there are two-wheeled vehicles like motorcycles. There are three-wheeled motorcycles and four-wheeled cars and six-wheeled and 18-wheelers. Could we line them all up and therefore say one transitioned into the other or are each designed to do what they do? I think the motorcycle is designed to run on two wheels. 18-wheeler is designed to run on 18 wheels. It's designed. So I think the cows are designed to produce cows and the dogs are produced, designed to produce dogs. And that's all they've ever, that's all we've ever seen. Okay, thank you for that final word on that uh, good question. And we're gonna wind it down here with one final question and it is the super chat. So I do, I do gotta make sure I get the super chats in here and then we are going to call yeah. it a night. Again, uh, great debate. This was a ton of fun. Um, so this one is for you, Snake. It's from Bubblegum Gun and it's more of a, of a comment 
or a criticism, and therefore you get the opportunity to respond. So $2 super chat. Thank you so much. Bubblegum gun. He says, snake, it's not evolution if it's a pre-existing gene. Go ahead, uh, Taylor. Oh, my bad, Taylor. I had you on mute. Go ahead if Oops. you want to restart your answer. Yeah, it is evolution if a pre-existing gene, well, that's how evolution works. It's changing of pre-existing material. So if the pre-existing gene in the next generation gets, or or combination of genes, which is really uh, how uh, a way that a lot of us don't think of it in, in that, oh, those terms, different combinations of genes produce different effects. But uh, if the gene gains a new function or changes function, uh, or changes the shape of some certain part of the animal, then that's evolution. And uh, all we're talking about is evolution is just a change in the frequency of traits of an animal population. And so pre uh, genes, pre-existing genes are used in evolution. They get changed. That's the point changed and copied and spread. Okay, thank you there, uh, Taylor. And we'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Dino for his response. Well, again, nobody's ever seen this happen. We uh, can imagine it if, you, if you'd if you like. Put the question back up. There's something I wanted to point out on there, if you would, Donnie. Oh, yeah. No uh, Let me just get okay. it back up on screen here. It's not three. evolution. See, one gene is so complicated and it carries information to modify it or rearrange it. His question is very good. Where did the original gene come from? I bet I could take the English language, 26 letters, and modify a few letters and make a, invent a new letter. Okay. Is it going to carry information? Is it going to, that anybody's going to understand? We can take these 26 letters and arrange them in sentences and words and carry information with the just lines on paper that we drew. Uh, but, is modifying it going to be generally detrimental? So far, it's always been detrimental. I, I don't. I think he's right. It's not evolution. It's a pre-existing gene. You didn't. You modified it, maybe, or maybe something happened to make it get modified. But it's still, it's a gene. Thank you, Ken, for the response. And uh, Snake, this was your question. This is also the last question. So, uh, have a final word there. Yeah, so where'd the original gene come from if we're talking about the original organism? Um, for the purpose of, of debating if evolution happened, it's irrelevant. We can say God created the first organism and evolution can still happen. Um, so we can just, that's what I did in this debate. I said God created the first organism and evolution happened. There are millions of Christians who subscribe to this. Um, it's a separate field of study separate mechanisms um but in terms of a specific section or population where the original gene come from the parents um and then through the process of recombination and mutation uh we get uh, different genes that interact with each other differently and so those combinations might get passed on um and there's also, of course, mutations, which uh, some genes get smashed together. Um, some genes have something inserted in the middle of them, and this will change the function. Um, a lot of times this doesn't work. Sometimes it does work. Sometimes you, like, you'll have a protein that's functional, and then you'll have a mutation which sticks something on the end of that protein. The protein gets translated. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. Those animals either don't reproduce or don't live. Uh, one time out of 10, it does work. And this protein now has a new function. Or it, this addition covered up its old active site, and it now has a different function. Um, or you can add a function. It can do the old thing it used to do, but now it does something new in addition to its old function. Um, so... And we've observed this, the uh, algae example becoming multicellular, that is evolution. Formerly, they were just single-celled algae that sometimes stuck together, and they evolved them into a multicellular species that has eight cells, 
It has tissue differentiation, and it is indivisible. It is not a colony of cells that can be torn apart uh, and individual cells survive. It is a single individual with eight cells that if you tar tear it apart, those cells will die. So uh, what was you the question? You want to wrap it up soon, Taylor? Yeah. That's not evolution. Like what we're, we're not asking if an amoeba can give birth to a chicken. We're asking like if we use a small child, for example, if they can tell a difference between a chicken and a pig, yes. Can they tell a difference between um, a bird and an Archaeopteryx or an Archaeopteryx and a dinosaur? No. And that's the point because you can move a dinosaur towards an Archaeopteryx and you can move an Archaeopteryx toward a bird. There's very little gap there. The gaps are filled with things, with changes that we've observed happening in living animals. Okay. Thank you. That wraps up the Q&A and the debate. Uh, great debate. I know we could probably uh, continue this uh, with all these points and topics forever, but we got to end it somewhere. And uh, gentlemen, Kent and Taylor, thank you so much for giving us your time for tonight. Uh, did you gentlemen want some really quick final words or we're just going to wrap it up here? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, I don't know. Taylor. Thanks for doing this. Look into your sources, your source methods. Okay, and over to you, Kat. All right. I guess my final word would be Pascal's wager. If I'm right, you're in trouble, Snake. If you're right, I haven't lost a thing. I've had a good life, enjoy life, find out there's no God and evolution is true. Oh, well, we just die and go to the grave then. I haven't lost a thing. Either way, I win. Unless there's a different gun. All right, uh, gentlemen, mm -hmm. thanks for the great, uh, memorable debate. You guys always make for a, a solid interaction. So we're going to let the both of you get out of here. Thanks for your time. I'm going to stick around for about a few minutes and just kind of go over some reminders and uh, things like that in terms of upcoming debate. So we're going to let uh, Kent and, and Snake get out of here and, and relax for the night. Uh, and don't forget, there is an after show on Logical, Plausible, Probable Channel. So uh, God bless, and thanks for doing this, Dr. Dino yeah. and Snake was right. We're live. Hey, what's up, everybody? All right, so I'm going to be stepping in as guest moderator tonight because as the 2022 debate challenge continues, Donnie just couldn't help himself. He's got to get back in the ring. So tonight we're going to be debating endogenous retroviruses, um, and I'm hoping that everybody here knows what those are. If you don't, uh, these ERVs are just DNA sequences uh, that are present in germlines of non-viral organisms. That's important. So they either resemble a virus or can come from a virus, and they're estimated to be anywhere around 8% of the genomes. The topic is going to have uh, big implications for the ongoing creation evolution debate. So uh, with that out of the way, the debate tonight is whether or not these DNA elements are enough to support of evolution, the idea that common descent is true. So he's going to have the, a little bit of bird proof tonight. He's going to take the positive. He's going to try to definitively show that there that is able to explain these ERVs to the same degree that common descent can. So in this case, Donnie's going to have to show that ERVs either do not support common descent at all or that there is another theory, namely creation, that can plausibly account the existence of these ERVs. So... <clears throat> Get ready. This is going to be a good debate. So pretty cool. These guys are no rookies. They said almost 100 debates. Snake's no stranger. I know a lot of you guys out there know them. So uh, uh, let's give the debaters some grace in the chat. We don't need to be attacking these men personally. There's no need for that as uh, the mob will be, you know, ridding the chat of any irrelevant babble. So as for the format, we're going to do 12-minute openings for both guys. Um they're going to have eight-minute rebuttals. They're going to do around a 30-minute discussion specific to ERV. Five-minute closings, and whatever time is left, we'll, we'll, we'll try to wrap it up around two hours. But uh, whatever time is left, well, we'll save for Q&A. So with that, I hear Taylor's going to be going first. Is that right, guys? All yeah, right. maybe we will um, – we can do – couple intros before the opening statements if you want snake you can kind of uh, give the audience a little rundown on who you are and your channel brandon I, I think it might have improved but you were kind of glitching there a little bit for about a minute 
uh, but it looks like it's it, it's improved. Or, or was that just on my end, Snake? Was it was it glitching uh, for you a little bit too? Yeah, for a second, but it wasn't too bad. Okay, okay. So, I think we're good. And yeah, Snake, if you wanted to give a, a brief intro, you know, who who are you? A little bit about your channel, so on and so forth. Yeah, so uh, I uh, am a molecular cellular developmental biology student, and uh, my channel is Snake Goes Right, and it's all it's basically about uh, various topics, but the central theme is kind of well, the name is derived from the uh, biblical serpent, but the theme shares uh, a common ancestry, if you will. Uh, with that same story, and which is basically that uh, knowledge is worth the cost, or knowledge is always the best, uh, the best way forward. So, um, and knowledge of good and evil is a good thing, I think. So, um, and that kind of applies to a lot of things that I'm thinking about, uh, not just scientific, but. Uh, moral and political and i do get i do take um inconvenient political stances uh that don't necessarily align with the stereotype of an atheist uh things like that and such and um yeah but i have a strong background in science so and that's what we're going to tackle tonight okay much appreciated there uh taylor uh, for me, I'm Donnie, as, as everybody knows, or you may know me as Standing for Truth. Although I uh, started this ministry several years ago, we now have, have a team, uh, Team Standing for Truth. So uh, I'm excited for this. I believe this is uh, formal debate number 98 for myself. I know Snake has had a ton of debates as well. And I specifically like debating these types of topics. You know, the, the more challenging topics, I've had a uh, Plenty of debates on ERVs, chromosome two fusion, Neanderthal phylogenetics, you know, those those types of topics that deal with uh, arguments from the evolutionist side that they would say essentially preclude biblical ancestry or young earth creation. So I like tackling the tough topics and tonight is endogenous retroviruses. So I very much look forward to this. So that, that that's my intro. And uh, I'll hand it over to Brandon, and I guess we can kind of get into some openings. Excellent intro. So like I said, we'll start with 12-minute openings, and uh, whenever you're ready, Taylor, I'll go ahead and start the clock for you. Yeah, all right. Um, so yeah, we had a brief explanation of ERVs. They are uh, identifiable by uh, certain gene viral genes that um, are part of them, and they insert into... The genome that's how they reproduce sometimes they'll insert into the gametes or reproductive cells and thus everything in the surviving lineage of those reproductive cells will have these ERVs so you can essentially trace who's related from that and um, the basic idea is that we share so many retroviruses in uh, the exact same locations of the exact same genes, which are also in similar locations as uh, chimpanzees and other apes. Um, just one viral group, uh, HERVWs, I think, uh, have about 205 out of 211 similarities. Uh, and again, that's just one virus group there are several of them um and the basic idea is that since there are only so many places for these uh viruses to insert uh first of all the the likelihood that it's going to insert into a gamete is very unlikely in the first place uh and then you have to have the specific species of virus um and specific strain of that species and um, inserting in the same location of the same genome in two separate animals, uh, humans and chimps, um, even the, and we do have very similar 
a number of similarities with other apes and monkeys, and those same similarities uh, create nested hierarchies, which uh, look exactly like the same nested hierarchies that are um, produced by other genomic analyses and by anatomical analyses. And so this, uh, by on its own, indicates um, a common ancestry. Um, but as I started off talking about the uh, the likelihoods of these things happening in two separate animals are inconceivably high. And, you know, it could be as high as 5.8 times 10 to the uh, 1,418th. Um, I'm sure that number will be disputed a little bit, but basically the lowest you can get it is still an astronomical number up to like uh, three times 10 to the in the 60s, which is still, I don't know what that would be. That's like uh, somewhere between like quintillions and Google. Um, Google is like a number with 100 zeros after it. Um, so it's just an incomprehensibly high number. And the only way that you could get around this uh, indicating common ancestry as if God put them there, except they are viral infections. So this would be look really uh, bad for the idea of intelligent design because God's updating the system with a really um, inconvenient way to update the system, um, and a and for some reason he's updating both chimps and humans in the same way, in a really inconvenient way, in a very unlikely way astronomically unlikely um so there's there's really no way to get around the fact that these are inherited and the the layout of the suite of viruses viral uh remnants is exactly the same and could not happen unless it was inherited by a common ancestor and so that's that's where we're at. So I will see the rest of my time to discussion. All right. Thanks for that intro, Taylor. Looks like you had about seven minutes to spare, so we can add that to the end. Uh, for now, we'll hand it over to Donnie for his intro. And whenever you're ready, Donnie, start on your uh, on your first word there. Go ahead. Okay, much appreciated. And let me just get my screen shared here. Brandon, I think there are some people in the chat just asking who they tag for questions. So that'll be uh, Brandon at, at Brandon for your questions. <clears throat> okay. So let me get my PowerPoint up here. And let me know when... How's that look? Coming in, Brandon? Audio, everything? Looks epic. <laughs> yes, the epic showdown. Okay, let me get my timer going as well. I was writing things down like crazy there, and time flies by. Okay, so 12 minutes. All right, the epic showdown. Endogenous retroviruses, ancient viral infections, or created units of DNA function. This is my roughly debate number 97, and I look forward to this discussion. So what exactly are herbs or endogenous retroviruses? An herb is a stretch of DNA found in your DNA that according to evolutionary theory, and as uh, Taylor pointed out in his opening statement, got there when one of your ancestors was infected by a retrovirus. What is a retrovirus? A retrovirus is a special type of virus that inserts its genetic material directly into a cell's DNA. Right here, what is an endogenous retrovirus? They are transmitted vertically, right, rather than horizontally through the germline and are thus inherited by a successive generation in a Mendelian manner. 
reverse transcriptase. This is important right here to understand when it comes to this topic. Okay, because retroviruses, however, use a slower, stealthier approach. After entering the cell, the retrovirus uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to turn its RNA into DNA before making its way to the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, it inserts its DNA into the host's genome. Now, when these retroviral genes make their way into sperm and egg cells, they can become a permanent part of a species genome. Proponents of common descent, like Snake was right here, will frequently claim the existence of these ERV sequences are irrefutable evidence for common ancestry, since they can essentially act as a historical record of infection suffered by our past ancestors. And I've got notes here, Snake pointed out that essentially there is no way, no way around this for the creationist. Uh, essentially, they'll say ERVs, the existence of, of these shared ERV sequences across various taxa, preclude separate ancestry. So uh, this is going to be a fun discussion. Now, these uh, small pieces of DNA found in the genome are recognized by various signatures. These signatures reflect similarities found in exogenous retroviruses. And because we share these ERV sequences with the primates, as Taylor went over in his opening statement, we must have inherited, this is their only conclusion, these from a common ancestor in the distant past. Proponents of common descent essentially believe endogenous retroviruses are uh, endogenous retroviruses are um, inherited are, are the ancient remnant. Here we go. Ancient remnants of past viral infections that have integrated into the genomes of living organisms, and that's why in my uh, opening slide, the question is: Are these really the ancient uh, remnants of past viral infections, or are they created units of DNA? function. They assert that these ERV sequences are clearly the remnants of viruses. They don't question it. To them, there is no debate. When we look to the properties of the ERV sequence, we can see that they are found in retroviruses. Evolutionists will also point to, and uh, Taylor mentioned this in, in his opening statement as well, they'll point to the nested hierarchy that these sequences fall into. And, and we'll definitely be discussing that uh, specific line of argumentation as well. And again, herbs that are shared across species are evidence for common ancestry to the evolutionists. Now, I do want to go over uh, kind of some of the details and, and some of the basics before I uh, continue into kind of the meat of this of this topic, as it, it is my goal for people to be able to follow tonight's debate. And at the end of it all, see exactly why herbs are not really good evidence for common descent. And as a matter of fact, they are amazing evidence for biblical creation, as we are going to see. But more specifically, the design diversity model. Now, when a retrovirus becomes a permanent part of a species DNA, according to the evolutionists, it becomes an endogenous retrovirus. This is important to understand. Scientists call it endogenous because it is inside of us from birth. A retrovirus is not passed, passed on genetically or vertically is referred to as endogenous. If, if it's passed on vertically, it would be referred to as endogenous. But if it's passed on horizontally, we're looking at that which is exogenous, okay? And it is the retrovirus, as I pointed out, that is passed down genetically that we would refer to as endogenous. And that's what we're discussing here, here tonight because the organism will be born with this viral DNA. Now, the human genome contains thousands of ERV sequences. As I touched on earlier, these stretches of DNA match sequences found in retroviruses. And to the evolutionists, this is why there is no question, as, as Taylor pointed out in, in his opening statement, that these are indeed the ancient remnants of uh, past viral infections that have been passed down essentially. And uh, the question is though, how do we know for sure genes with similar sequences to virus genes actually came from viruses? And again, to the evolutionists like uh, Taylor here, it's the important properties of the herbs themselves that tell us these DNA elements actually originated from retroviruses. Notice on this specific slide, the structure of herbs match modern retroviruses, for example, HIV, 
On both ends of the retroviral DNA will be two identical sequences known as LTRs or long terminal repeats. In between the LTRs, we find the GAG, the pole, which codes for the reverse transcriptase we were talking about earlier, and the ENV or envelope protein, which codes for the envelope that makes up the body of the virus. These structures are common in herbs and retroviruses. Remember, again, it's important. Herbs are assumed by the evolutionists to be the ancient remnants of past viral infections. Evolutionists consider these to be genetic fossils that point us to common descent. Advocates of common ancestry would say that the chances, and Taylor uh, pointed this out in his opening statement, that the chances of two herbs being inserted at the exact same location in separate organisms are very small. They will argue that the chance of a human and a chimpanzee being infected in the exact same spot by the same specific type of virus is far less than one in 10 million. And to them, as Taylor put it, this is highly unlikely. The more shared herb sequences then that we find, the more unlikely it becomes that these were inserted what? Inserted independently. Okay, so in a nutshell, why do evolutionists believe herbs are a good line of evidence for common descent? One, the sharing of similar herbs at similar locations in different genomes, plus the nested hierarchical distribution of herbs themselves. Two, the properties of the herb itself. We covered that. And three, the examination of shared mutagenic discrepancies between the long terminal repeats of LTRs of shared herbs, essentially the structure itself, okay, uh, that also form a nested pattern of distribution across various organisms. So here's some important questions we have to answer. Why are there herb sequences shared between the genomes of organisms? And two, if viral-like sequences in the genomes are, of organisms are functional, which I am going to argue is the fact today, why do they bear similarity to viral genetic material? So as we know, the entire junk DNA uh, paradigm has been overturned essentially, which is um, confirming evidence for the design diversity hypothesis, which suggests that God would have uh, front-loaded the original created kinds, this includes Adam and Eve, with... Um, created diversity, okay, created nuclear heterozygosity, essentially, as well as functional DNA elements, such as these herb sequences, pseudogenes, ALU sequences, so on and so forth. So as you can see here, pseudogenes necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell, line signs, introns allow for alternative splicing, herbs. Herbs are what we're focusing on today. So uh, they function now in antiviral uh, function, tumor suppression, gene regulation. We are going to uh, get into all of that today. Now, the question is, why do herb sequences resemble viral genetic material? And this is a common response from the evolutionist after we show them just how functional and essential these retroviral-like elements are. And we have an easy answer. Okay, one of the major functional roles of these viral-like elements, these herb sequences, is that they have a purpose in the innate immune system. They play an antiviral role. They are important DNA elements that work greatly in the immune system of their host. The way they me mechanistically exert their antiviral effect has to do with their sequence similarities to viral material. Without the specific nature of these herb sequences, they could not do the important job that they do. Thank God they resemble viruses. Thank God they have similar properties to exogenous retroviruses. Their functional roles depend on these similarities. This is not evidence that they are the ancient remnants of viral infections. No, the properties of an, e of, of an herb sequence is necessary in light of their essential roles in aiding in the immune system and fighting off viral infections. In my last two minutes here, I want to go over some of the, the, the more uh, amazing functions found in these types of sequences. It has recently been reported that herbs can act as DNA regulatory elements, as long non-coding RNAs, and as triggers in the innate immune system. Okay, and this isn't just creationists making this up. Notice this from the secular literature. Herbs 
H E R V S human specific herbs appear to play important roles in physiology, fetal development and human evolution. Notice this, if the accidental, notice this, the, to the evolutionists, it's all an accident, right? Blind chance. Infection of a mammalian ancestor by an exogenous retrovirus had never occurred. The placenta and the mammals that produce it, including humans, would have never existed. Beneficial role of human endogenous retroviruses. They, uh, it has been suggested as mediators of normal biological processes, such as cellular differentiation and regulation of gene expression. And in my last 40 seconds here, I mean, we could, we could go over, uh, Function after function, here's, here's the one that I was specifically referring to earlier, how endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections. They not only regulate cellular immune activation, but may even directly target invading viral pathogens. And that's exactly why they look the way they do, because this is necessary in light of this one of many, many functional roles, which points us to the design diversity hypothesis. And I'll wrap it up there as I've got one second left and we will touch on the, some more of that evidence a little bit later. Thanks so much. Excellent intros, gentlemen. I'm sure that's going to raise a lot of questions, uh, if not within the audience alone amongst you guys. So at this point, we can move on to the rebuttal stage. Uh, we're going to do eight minutes apiece for that. Whenever you're ready, Taylor. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we heard a lot about uh, how ERVs contain beneficial functions and therefore they had to have been designed. Um, but this is not exclusively expected by creationism. So one of the ways that, uh, for example, ERVs can help in cancer suppression is, well, one, it's kind of a double edged sword because the, they actually can cause cancer. Um, some of them cause cancer and don't help at all. Some of them cause cancer and then help our immune system identify cancer because they're producing viral antibodies, which the body has, um, I mean, depending on the age of the, uh, virus of origin, our bodies may have already been used to these viruses for thousands, even millions of years. So, they're, the antibodies are easily identifiable by the immune system. And so I guess um, to kind of recap, uh, an ERV could interrupt certain uh, genes, which can lead to a higher susceptibility of cancer. But then those cancer cells that are expressing that uh, virus now look like virus infected cells. And so our immune system can kill it. And so, of course, that can work out accidentally um, pretty easily. It's a, it seems pretty obvious how that's kind of a self-canceling property of uh, a, a cancer-causing element that can also tag itself as uh, something other than human. So the immune system often doesn't understand that cancer cells uh, need to be killed. Uh, because they have the same proteins as all your other cells. So the immune system can't tell the difference. Um, and so if there's some foreign element that is causing the cancer, then it's more likely that your immune system is also going to recognize that foreign element. So it, it it's completely understandable. Um, it's not like a wild, co like convenient coincidence. It's just, it's very obvious that your body would recognize it as a foreign element. Um, so just the mere fact that it has a beneficial function does not really tell us anything about whether it was created or it was infected. Um, but the structure of it can tell us whether it was infected because it, uh, the ERVs contain elements that are completely unnecessary in uh, from an intelligent design perspective to insert into the genome. So you wouldn't need uh, the pro gag and, uh, and the EMV genes uh, because you, you could just incorporate those genes into uh, the normal genome and put them in an exon and they would get, uh, 
translated just as our normal proteins do. Um, and those could trigger viral antibodies. Um, and you also wouldn't need, uh, and from an intelligent design perspective, it's also a terrible design because a lot of these ERVs are interrupting genes, um, which can cause cancer. So, um, so basically the functions that these ERVs take are going to be infection related, immune related, um, and gene regulation related, which is exactly how retroviruses function as they infect us. So none of these beneficial functions are, are unexpected or conflict with the idea that they are historical infections or how biochemistry works in general. Um, viruses and infections aren't inherently bad for you. In fact, you could not survive without, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's in the uh, thousands of species that infect your gut that you can't digest without or that infect your skin that keeps uh, away um, worse uh, infections. Um, and as uh, a parasitic or infectious uh, pathogenic or a pathogen, um, they don't want to kill their host. So the most successful pathogens actually work with the host. Um, same with the symbiotic uh, biological relationships. Um, you can suck the blood out of your host, but if it kills it, you run out of your food supply. If you're hardly noticeable or if you actually provide some kind of benefit, then your host is actually going to want you around. Um, one example is the birds that... Uh, they're not exactly parasitic, but they clean out the teeth of the crocodiles. The crocodiles don't eat the birds that hang out in their mouths because they clean out their teeth. So these kind of relationships can develop naturally. And um, and it's going back to ERVs, it's not very, well, it's not, <laughs> it's close to zero, the probability that, um, in fact, in one of my calculations, my calculator literally couldn't calculate that low and just gave me a zero for the like the likelihood. Um, so the idea that God would put these things in our genomes that were um, not in the ideal locations, but they were also in the exact same locations as other species, and the fact that he would use... An, like an update to an operating system instead of just put them in our genomes in the first place is really odd um, and doesn't jive with uh, intelligent design at all because in fact we can come up with better designs. Um, so the fact that they're in the same locations does indicate that it was um, a historical infection shared by two different uh, species. Um, not because of the similar sequence, but because, well, they're identified by the similar sequence. But again, similar species, similar location of a similar gene. Well, exact, almost exactly the same. Um, and it's the fact that... Uh, this isn't going to happen just by chance. Um, I had another point, but I, I derailed my train of thought. I'll get it in a minute. But the, uh, the idea that God would use, uh, um, would use ERVs to infect us is even if he's putting them in, the correct location or what, whatever, even if there's not a better intelligent design, ERVs are one of the worst delivery mechanisms for, uh, well, retroviruses are one of the worst delivery mechanisms for updates to genetics um, because they're not necessarily going to get into the gametes. And we even have uh, therapeutics that are based on retroviruses but the fact that they're so unlikely to get into the reproductive cells is a major problem for uh, this intelligent design uh, 
method. And I think that should be about eight minutes. You are exactly correct, man. Eight minutes. Pretty good job. A lot of good points there, man. I think you brought a little more heat in the rebuttal than you did in your opening, huh? <laughs> All right, we're going to hand it that over. That was planned. The, uh, what's that? That was part of the plan. There you go. I think I we that. all kind of know like the topic, so. Turn up the heat on him, man. He needs it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, here we go. Uh, let me start my timer, eight minutes. And the openings were brief overviews, and here we go. Let's get into the fun because I am pumped. So um, Taylor's arguments here, essentially in the opening statement and the rebuttal itself, boil down uh, to a starting point and basic assumption that these viral-like sequences are really the leftover remnants of, of past viral infections. Just so stories aren't going to show us empirically how non-functional endogenous retroviral-like sequences can go from something that is non-functional to critically functional in determining cell types, aiding in the immune system, embryological development, and so on, okay? Because he pointed out um, that it's, it's it's not just one beneficial function, okay? He, um, what I've written down is, is he said, you know, it, it, a beneficial function, one single beneficial function can certainly come about through co-option or evolution. It, it's not just one. Okay, there are massive amounts of uh, ERV-like sequences that, that are aiding in, in tr transcription in, in so many important functional roles. And something important to note is that retrotransposons, okay, they are uh, mobile genetic elements, and we know that they're often referred to as jumping genes because they can actually move around the genome, jumping from one location to the next in, in the DNA itself. They can literally move from one chromosomal location to another. And the ability of, of a retrotransposon to move around the genome allows for what? It allows for genetic variation when mobilized. So here's another important uh, functional role of, of these various classes of retrotransposons. And that's why there's, there's a creationist model called the uh, VIGE hypothesis, which stands for, that acronym stands for uh, Variation Inducing Genetic Elements. And the fact is, and, and what this model proposes essentially is that a lot of these bad viruses have actually originated uh, in endogenous retroviral sequences within the genome rather than outside. And we can actually make viruses in our genome. This is an important point because in our cells, we make all of the parts that make that viruses make. We have all the ingredients and properties to make viruses. We make protein shells, we make DNA, we make RNA, we have DNA and RNA copying enzymes. It is possible that many viruses came from within the genome rather than outside. And this had to be the case anyways, because a retrovirus requires a host to replicate. So what came first, the virus or the, ho of the host? It makes sense and, and it's, it solves this, this dilemma and paradox that evolutionists face in terms of the origin of, of viruses in general, specifically retroviruses. I'd like to ask Snake, you know, what's your explanation for the origin of, of these retroviruses that require a host in the first place? Okay, so it is possible that many viruses came from within the genome. They were made from cellular parts. As our cells are packaging things in various different ways, a few accidental changes during the packaging process can actually make a bad virus. And it sounds like viruses came from the human genome rather than, than vice versa. So his, uh, his response here in, in my notes where he says that um, a, a lot of these ERV elements are detrimental, cancer-causing, disease-causing, well, that's exactly what we would expect through uh, mutation accumulation, through accidental errors in the genome may result in uh, fully working endogenous retroviral-like sequences, altering to the point where they may cause uh, disease and may cause um, cancers of, of all sorts. But the fact is, one of their main roles is the fact that they play an antiviral role. And because of this, they require what he was saying aren't required, like the gag gene, the pole gene, the ENV, okay, the LTRs. No, these are all 
functional properties of the overall endogenous retroviral unit. Okay. And there's a lot of latent genetic information in our genome. We understand this. And many of these retrotransposons actually have a gene promoter in them. And so, so if, if they're stuck in, let's say, one place in the DNA, and within this place in the gene, they can turn on a gene. Okay, they regulate. And if they move, that gene gets turned off. So you, ha you have these signatures of integration, not because they are being integrated from the outside, but because they are actually moving around within the genome itself. Okay, so if this mobile element moves, that gene gets turned off. And what this tells us is that as jumping genes are popping in and out into the genome in different places, they can literally turn things on and turn things off. This is evidence for forward thinking, which uh, points us back to a forward thinker. And I want to share screen and kind of just demonstrate a lot of what I'm saying here in, in the number of papers that, that I have made for everybody. Uh, right here, ERVs are retrotransposons, a type of transposable element that spreads throughout the genome via a copy and paste mechanism. And uh, there's a different class that can do it through a, a cut and paste mechanism okay retro trans retro transposition this capacity allows herbs to make copies of themselves that in turn insert themselves elsewhere in the genome and that's why you'll often uh, see them being referred to as mobile elements all right the ability of transposons to increase genetic diversity this isn't coming from creationists here's an article in um you can find it on nature Together with the ability of the genome to inhibit most transposable element activity results in a balance that makes transposable elements an important part of evolution and gene regulation in all organisms that carry these sequences. So again, jumping genes. And here's something that's interesting about the function of of herbs is that much of the evidence for the function of teas comes from the growing realization that many transposons are highly conserved among distantly related taxonomic groups. So if what we're looking at is high levels of con conservation, that would mean they must be there for a reason if they're not being hit with all of these mutations that essentially could be uh, damaging because maybe we're looking at a sequence that's uh, nothing more than genomic leftovers, ge genetic baggage. No, sequence conservation suggests functionality. And, um, this is an important point, guys. Herbs frequently have important immune functions, and they should not be presumed to be junk DNA. This defeats both the junk DNA or junk herb argument against the design of the genome. It also challenges those who want to use the supposed junk status of herbs as an argument for common ancestry. So the last thing I want is that the LTRs, okay? They're there for a reason. They have the capacity to exert uh, regulatory influence as both a promoter and enhancer of cellular genes. Uh, we went over the fact that uh, what we could be looking at in terms of bad viruses is uh, viral um, viral escapees. And last thing I'll say is, is this argument from co-option, it, it's imagination. Okay, I'm going to end it here with a simple question for Snake, I guess, as, as we move in, into the open discussion uh, after this. He can either choose to answer it first or not. Show me empirical evidence in a lab, a technical paper today. It's not just one or two uh, functional roles in these herb sequences. Show me a non-functional herb uh, sequence going from non-functional to uh, something critically functional in the genome. And that's, uh, that's eight minutes, so I'll yield there. Excellent, perfect timing. So, uh... Now we're going to go into this 30 minute discussion and I guess we can kind of tail off right where Donnie left it. If you want to think, you want to address that question? You got anything else you want to bring up? Well, um, I guess I, I would, uh, offer a, like a slight correction. So, um, so the, the gag and the envelope proteins are potentially useful. They're not necessarily useful. Um, uh, but the, the pole section and the long terminal repeats are basically um, just uh, virus specific, and so the, um, the human the human genome is capable of translating the gag or pole regions, or I uh, sorry the ENV regions, um, independently of uh, of uh, the uh, 
LTRs, long terminal repeats, and the uh, the poll, uh, which is the reverse transcript days, right? And um, so, so there are markers that show that these things are in fact viral, and so, um, and are not necessary as intelligent design elements. So, like, do you do you accept that some of these uh, ERVs are in fact of viral origin? Well, some interesting points that you brought up. So to, to kind of work um, from, from the, your first point is that, yes, when we look to these ERV elements and the properties, essentially, that uh, make up the ERV sequence, right, the structure of it, the LTRs on, on either side, your, your gag, pole, and envelope, protein essentially okay these are uh, characteristics and signatures of exogenous retroviruses okay they have similarities but um that's what's so fascinating about the structure of the herb sequence itself is the fact that one of their their roles taylor is they have the ability to protect against the exogenous retroviruses that supposedly they are the result of, right? You have this uh, viral infection and uh, essentially it gets passed on because it invades uh, the germ cells and it's, it's passed on vertically rather than horizontally. And so it becomes endogenous. It, it comes from within. Okay, the offspring are gonna have this viral DNA in every single one of their cells. And essentially, that's where these ERVs came from, according to the evolutionary story. But the ability of these ERV sequences to actually protect against this, okay, the fact that ERVs block the ability of the exogenous retrovirus to infect in the first place and to, be, and to become an endogenous retrovirus tells me that, and, and you can see this in a number of papers I can screen share later, uh, for sake of time right now, I won't, they uh, perform viral mimicry. And they require the specific structure and properties, okay, including the gag, the pole gene, the, the ENV, in order to um, carry out this, this ability. And uh, another ability as well is uh, involved in, in tumor suppression, where they also, we can get into that a little bit later, where uh, the structure and property of uh, the ERV sequence itself, these similarities, are uh, necessary they're a, a required design feature to carry out the job that it does in disrupting uh, retroviral insertions and in um, tumor suppression so I, I don't think the properties that make up the erv or erv that are also similar to exogenous retroviruses is, is a problem for the design hypothesis uh, what are your thoughts on that go ahead well um yeah i definitely want to get into the uh, topic of discussion um but as for the question are you do you accept that there are retroviral infections that result in these ervs even if you're not accepting any of the beneficial ones you're well that is a good question and it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility that an exogenous retrovirus can invade our cells and invade in, in just the right way and in the right spots for it to be uh, passed on vertically, essentially. So it, it doesn't seem to be out of the realm of, of possibility. So how many uh, have actually occurred, have gotten past one of these functional roles of, of the ERV sequences in general to kind of prevent that and stop that? Um, I'm not sure because as far as I know, we don't really have any observable evidence, unless you can present that, where we have... Um, endogenous retroviruses we have a new uh the virus infecting and then becoming endogenous and fixed within within the population because from my understanding and respond to this um what we're looking at is genomic fossils to the evolutionists and so this is a historical record of common descent but we're not actually seeing the um endogenization i guess you could say occurring today um go ahead what are your thoughts yeah, so uh, like how would you tell the difference between a retrovirus mimic and a legitimate uh, um, endogenous retrovirus? Well, right, that's a good point, but... Because, well, 
if I um, could yeah, add a little bit more. Um, so we do know what retroviruses look like when they infect cells and they have this exact same structure. And um, the, the only difference would be that they occur in gametes, um, which are reproductive cells. And as long as that doesn't kill off the uh, fetus, which is one form of selection, if, if the mutation or the um, infection occurs in a highly inconvenient place, that thing's just not going to even be born to uh, pass on its genetics. So, but yeah, these, we use retroviruses for therapeutics. So we know how they look when they infect cells. It's just a difference of which cell they infect. So what I, I get, going back to the question I asked, is there a way to differentiate a virus mimic and a legitimate ERV? Right. So that's a good question. I would say the majority of what we're looking at in terms of these, um, you know, quote unquote, genomic fossils that uh, evolutionists such as, as yourself look to and compare across different uh, groups, different species that uh, fall within a nested hierarchical pattern, as well as the uh, mute mutations that occur in, in these LTRs, these LTR uh, elements. I would say that the vast majority, if not all of those, are created units of, of DNA function. They are these uh, variation-inducing genetic elements that, that were front-loaded. And, and a way we can tell is whether or not they, they are functional. That's a direct prediction of the design diversity hypothesis that if God front-loaded various types of functional units, in living organisms, that would include these IRV sequences, ALU sequences, we would uh, we would predict function and we would predict a lot of function, not just one or two. So when we find an IRV sequence that is functional in, let's say, embryological development or um, uh, beneficial in like right here, human endogenous retroviruses, have recently been suggested as mediators of normal biological processes such as cellular differentiation and regulation of gene expression. So I would say, okay, confidently, this is a created unit of, of DNA function, given it, its functional role. And uh, for you to demonstrate that, no, this is the ancient remnant of a past viral infection, you would show how it's actually possible empirically for this type of uh, DNA unit to become functional in determining cell types, gene expression, embryological development in the immune response. So that would be my uh, criteria is looking, looking for function. And if we have an IRV sequence, here's the last thing I'll say and then take as long as you want. If we have an IRV sequence, okay, that is, is functional, let's say in, in the immune system. And then we have another IRV sequence that maybe we haven't really tested, so we don't know what the function is yet, but they still bear the same signatures and similarities. I would say, okay, this is, um, I would predict this is also a functional IRV element, but what's its exact function? We still have to uh, test that, which, which is nice because this is where testable predictions um, that are falsifiable uh, come into play, you know? Um, so re respond to anything, but again, I, I, I'd like to ask you, given, given the criteria, what would be your best, um, example of a, a non-functional retroviral like element or sequence going from non-functional to something functional in, in the immune system in, in embryological development? I mean, that paper that I showed in, in my, uh, either opening or rebuttal, uh, the authors, which are secular, they admitted that without this endogenous retrovirus, we wouldn't be able to reproduce. It's required for embryological uh, development. So Snake, go ahead. So uh, to kind of correct something, retroviruses have function from the moment of infection. So the, the, you're never going to find anything that goes from non-function to functional. You might have kind of a change of function or a a shifting of responsibility, but um, um, we can talk about that uh, once we once we're fully on the subject of function. But so it looks like you're saying that they're identical in structure, and you can't really tell based on their genetics 
whether they're from an infection or not. It's just whether or not it has a beneficial biological function. Is that how you're telling the difference? I would say the criteria um, in terms of determining what is a created unit of DNA function versus, versus what, what is a, a retrovirus. For example, it, when we looked at the, the, the Phoenix virus experiment, okay, that, that's a paper you've cited before. That's a great experiment where they uh, took cells in, in a Petri dish and uh, subjected them to uh, various mutations. Uh, they, they produced a virus. Well, that goes back to what I was saying in my uh, rebuttal, that uh, one creationist hypothesis titled the uh, variation inducing genetic element hypothesis, which suggests that uh, retroviruses, exogenous retroviruses, have originated from functional ERV like sequences. And at that point, they can escape the genome, cross species and of course become uh, damaging disease causing. And I think that has to be the case anyways, the nature of, of retroviruses. So if we're looking at what you would say is, is a genetic fossil, a dead virus, that is what I'm saying is, is a created unit of, of DNA function. If we're looking at an exogenous retrovirus, then I would say that is what um, probably originated from the, these functional ERV sequences. And I'd like to see where a, a retrovirus, an exogenous retrovirus like, a, like HIV assists in embryological development or determining cell types. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of any research suggesting that, that these retroviruses, before they integrate and are passed down vertically and become endogenous, I'm not aware, aware of any papers that suggest that they already uh, contain the necessary information to assist in, in embryological development. So uh, go ahead, Snake. Um, so you did say that it is possible for some, for at least one uh, beneficial function to come, come about by infection and co-option. Um, so oh, I wouldn't say co-option. Um, okay. I mean, that's what you said, but you're, well, no, I, I, I you're was saying I, clarify. Well, I, I don't want. I just want to clarify. I don't want to say that it's impossible. I'm not going to sit here and say no. It, it's impossible for an exogenous retrovirus to infect a, a germ cell, enter a sperm or egg, and then be passed down vertically, and the offspring now has an adult. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not going to sit here and go on record saying that that that's impossible. Maybe it's, it's possible. If, if one of their roles, these ERV sequences, is to prevent that, well, we know we have DNA repair enzymes that, that are uh, formulated to prevent mutations, but mutations still occur. So I'm not going to say it's impossible, but we, it's not like we have overwhelming evidence in the lab or a series of technical papers showing this happening. I mean, you can, you can present, if you can present that, I'd like to see it, but we don't see that as far as I know. Go ahead. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. As, I mean, as far as uh, cells that are infected with retroviruses, they can reproduce and they still have the retroviral elements in them. Um, and so as far as co-opting a function, like I said, not all viruses are going to be harmful. Uh, and some of them, are going to be able are going to be harmful in the right way. So there are certain genes that we could benefit from having down regulated. And if the virus is infects those genes, then that's going to be beneficial because it's damaging a bad gene or a, a gene that might be need to be turned down or interrupted in some way. So, um, yeah, what is, what's your response there? Well, a few responses and, and a few questions I would have is if, if what we're looking at here, then, you know, the, these thousands and thousands of, of Irv sequences that essentially are the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections, okay, that have been passed down over millions of years. How in the world did, did these ancestors survive to, to reproduce, especially this, this invasion of deleterious <laughs> exogenous retroviruses? How, how did they survive this, this invasion of all of these viruses? How was this not deleterious to the point where um, 
for one selection would just remove the infected group from the equation and two how how would this result in in fixation since we're looking at fixed irv irv like sequences uh, go ahead snake if you want to answer those well um the first step obviously uh we survive all the time just just as we are now getting infected by all kinds of things um uh as far as deleterious ones i uh explained there is a selection filter where just like any any mutation if it's too detrimental to the organism it's not even going to gestate or it will uh gestate badly and if it's born it will die soon after or not be able to reproduce um so there is a selective filter for based on how harmful the uh inclusion of the virus is so i mean half of all pregnancies don't even um implant uh half of all fertilized eggs don't even implant and and uh there are i don't know how i think it's in the so like dozens of millions of sperm cells per ejaculate they're all going to have different mutations and potentially infections so if the infection is bad the sperm cell will be unfit it won't even get to the egg if somehow it gets to the egg then it probably doesn't have an infection bad enough to slow it down if it if the infection doesn't slow down the sperm cell, it might have a adverse effect on development and thus that uh, genetic element will not be passed on. Um, as far as co-opting a function, there are, we see this in a lot of different um, organisms where two different genetic elements or anatomical elements can serve the same function and they can lose one of these and get along fine because there's a redundancy there. So if, um, so if the ERV is providing a similar regulatory function as a regulatory function that the organism already has, it is now free to have that ERV mutate. And this, this happens a lot where ERVs it might be slightly harmful, but they we've we can uh, sequence them and see that they've lost some of the pathogenic elements of them, so that they're not not harmful. Um, or so it, if you if you have that redundancy, you can have mutations in either the ERV or the previous regulatory element, and you'll still have the same regulation. So there's no theoretical or functional barrier to the co-option of those ERVs, even as essential functions. Okay. So I'd want to respond to quite a bit there. First thing I'll say when it comes to the uh, answer to the question about how, how these species could essentially survive just mass invasion of virus after virus. I do believe it, unfortunately for the evolutionist, does require a lot of uh, just so storytelling. We know that the, the, this hypothetical invasion of viruses occurred millions of years ago in order for them to be passed on. And after the human to chimpanzee split, we have the, the similar herb sequences because they um, the human line chimp line went different directions, but but retained these in, endogenous retroviruses uh, essentially. But my biggest counter to that is is the paper that I showed earlier in my uh, rebuttal that demonstrates we're looking at a lot of conservation, a, a lot of conserved sequences where um, these herb uh, sequences, herb elements haven't really been hit with a ton of mutations. And so this would suggest, and this was from a secular technical paper as well. This would suggest that we're looking at 
genome-wide functionality, essentially, of, of these ERV sequences. Now, of course, through mutations, recombination, and uh, other accidental changes, um, these could destroy the, the functions of, of some of these ERV sequences. Also, we know that a lot of these ERV sequences are only functional. They're expressed during different stages of, of development, okay? And after they are expressed and, and essentially they do their job, they are uh, then turned off or, or suppressed in, in their function. So if we were to test that, let's say, in, in the life of a specific organism, if we were to test that, and even through genetic knockout, we were to snip it out and there was no immediate effect, well, that's because either one, we're looking at uh, redundancy, two, we're looking at an ERV sequence that is turned off. It, it's only expressed under certain conditions, certain environmental conditions, uh, when it comes to uh, tumor suppression or antiviral infection, they're only called upon essentially in, in light of those uh, circumstances. So there, there, there's a lot of ERV sequences, unfortunately, that evolutionists would say are non-functional, but they haven't done enough, I would say, analyses or uh, even knockout experiments to know that for a fact, since we know for a fact that a lot of these ERV sequences are only functional under certain um, conditions. And again, when it comes to the, uh, the, the co-option, you know, here, for example, far from being junk DNA, the pervasive retrotransposons that populate the genome have a powerful capacity to influence genes in chromatin. A new study demonstrates how the transcription of one such element, H-E-R-V-H, can modify, notice this, can modify the higher order 3D structure of chromatin during early primate development. Here's the last thing I'll say and then take as much time as you need, Taylor, okay? In the mouse genome, there's a certain class of retrotransposon that if you snip it out, Okay, you remove it, the mouse is developing, you remove this retrotransposon and the mouse stops developing, it dies. It's because again, it requires that functional retrotransposon to develop and live. Okay, so I don't think your answers here are adequate that retroviruses have some innate functionality that when they uh, infect, integrate and are passed on vertically, okay, through the germ cell lines, they can eventually become not just functional in, um, in a low functional sense, but literally critical. As in that one paper I showed earlier, demonstrated that no, if it wasn't for this ERV sequence, there wouldn't be mammals. <laughs> it's literally required for the existence of mammals. So I don't think you're, you're adequately answering this question because to me, the question could be adequately answered with just a single technical paper that actually shows empirically in a lab, hey, listen, here's here's a, an ERV element that, that we thought was useless, but through a series of mutations or co-option events, you know, it, it went from something that was dead to something that is now critically functional in embryological development. Can you provide an, anything like that, uh, Taylor? And, and go ahead, take your time. Yeah, so they're not functionally dead when they infect. They, they're functionally, well, there's a debate over whether viruses are alive or not, but the retrovirus, as soon as it infects, is functional. All of its viral elements are functional to create viruses. So basically, to gain a function, they have to, parts of it have to die so that they're not viral and pathogenic. But as you said, they can affect regulation. And that's really not hard to explain because mutations affect regulation all the time. Uh, reflect, uh, they can affect um, cellular uh, division. Um, and, and viruses do have self-regulatory elements in them. They, it's not like once they're inside of your body, or once they've inserted into the genome, that they just continuously replicate and replicate and replicate. There are tons of diseases that can go dormant, and there are certain environmental conditions that will then trigger them to turn on. Um, and so they have a, an ability to interact with the cell 
whether it's interrupting it or tagging it for um, being activated, um, which are not, they're completely unremarkable as far as uh, non-designed elements go. And like I said, if there's a redundancy there, the original function to that can be lost and it can look like, oh, the, the ERV was the only thing that was ever regulating this when it's perfectly capable of having just been a redundancy that is left over. Um, well, and yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to be listening, but I'm just going to grab something real quick. No worries. No worries. So again, the example that, that I pointed to where, where you have a class of retrotransposon that if knocked out, if removed, the organism stops developing, it, it dies. I mean, we're not just talking about the, the known properties or function, I guess you could say, of exogenous retroviruses, okay? The evolutionist is saying that these herb sequences that we see, where the debate lies, are these really the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections or created units of DNA function? You guys are the ones purporting. For example, um, I had a bunch of papers here up from, let's see if I can get to them real quick, from the secular literature, where the best you're going to get, for example, here, um, if in the past, HERVs were mistakenly considered as useless elements of the human genome, DNA junk, which they're admitting that in the past, this is what they assume. So one question I'll have, if you want to keep it to memory, is uh, do you have any technical paper or any um, example of an evolutionary uh, scientist predicting function before function was found? That's a question I'd be interested in, in hearing an answer to do. Today, some are recognized as conferring biological advantages. In fact, in some cases, HERV genomes have undergone a process of positive selection during evolution, being exploited by the host to benefit important physiological processes. This is, the this is a paper from 2020. This is the best you can find. I've read through dozens of papers, and they don't actually, they'll, they'll say, well, these are engines of evolution, positive selection, kind of like what, what you're doing. And... Um, Apologies if this sounds aggressive. I just think it's a lot of uh, fanciful storytelling, a lot of uh, informative gloss, and essentially imagination. Like just imagine, you know, an exogenous retrovirus that essentially is is infiltrating in 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 order to do damage to the host. Uh, the exogenous retroviruses we know today, like HIV, for example, nobody wants uh, that infection, right? And again, thank God, we're seeing it in these uh, populations of, of koalas, where these herb sequences are actually now being called upon. And thank God for, for their structure and properties, the LTRs, the GAG, the pole, ENV, which the evolutionists, that's their best argument. They always say, like you're saying, why do they resemble exogenous retroviruses? They literally require these similarities. They require these signatures in order to do their job when it comes to fighting off bad viruses. They have to have that structure in the first place. And so the uh, VIGE hypothesis at least would say, okay, they look the way they do because one of their many functions is to fight off bad viruses. So the last thing I'll say, and, and then take your time, is I don't feel satisfied with, with the um, answers provided, not only by you, just in the papers that I'm reading, where it discusses these functional roles. I never actually see empirical evidence for how this co-option happened or how this evolution happened. They just say it did because positive selection, engines of evolution, so on and, and so forth. So, you know, obviously you, you can disagree with me, but I, I don't feel like an adequate answer has been provided to uh, how these incredibly important uh, functional roles can, can come about. Uh, Taylor, go ahead, take your time. Yeah. Well, first of all, how much time do we have left? Brandon, you might be on mute. And I'm. Uh, you got that. the 30 minutes is up in 10 seconds, but we can add the extra seven minutes that uh, you didn't use in your opening. So if you guys uh, want the extra seven, you can have at it. Yes, please. Um, so um, as I said, uh, viruses are not necessarily bad for you um, or 
they can, it, it's all completely context dependent. So they can be completely neutral. They could be, uh, in fact, uh, we use viruses to infect and kill cancer cells um, because we they can be selective like that. Um, some viruses kill off bacteria, but don't infect humans. Um, or viruses might have a disruptive effect on harmful uh, genes or mutations that we already have in us. Um, so the regulatory nature of retroviruses already explains it in any evolutionary way that they can regulate things. Um, the only thing, the, if there's a dependency there, this would seem to indicate that it was not, uh, based on the, the evidence that it was an infection, would seem to indicate that it was a part of a redundancy that we've lost. And we see that um, such as um, in, there's a species of amoeba, which has a, a sister species, and there's one species of bacteria that infects both of them. One, one of the cousins ki is killed by the bacteria. It's pathogenic in them. The other will die without that same exact species of bacteria. And so there's very little difference between them. But now, but one of them, they're, they're the same biblical kind, but one is entirely dependent on something that it did not have before getting infected by it. So, and this is based on redundancies. So it, it had something in its genome that was able to keep it alive before. One of the uh, pathogenic bacteria infected the amoeba, uh, spread throughout the population because it was not as pathogenic as a variant that it's related to. And, um, and then the amoebas that could tolerate these bacteria basically lost their original function, and now you can't take the bacteria out without killing them. But they originally had this function. So we observe this process happening. We know it's possible in, in viral uh, regulation. Um, so... Uh, Snake, and, if I could... As, it, yeah. I just wanted to make sure you answered the question and still continue on as long as you need. Um, one of the questions I, I asked in my last response was, did uh, evolutionary scientists predict function before function was found? Do you know the answer to that? Um, I, as far as the literature says, it's usually uh, was it was not known. So they it's an investigation. They, they discovered viral elements. Uh, a lot of people assumed because it's an inactivated virus that it wouldn't be that important, but then we discovered that it was. So, isn't that just I mean, retrofitting not... the data, though? No, that's just investigating what what it is. Like, there's no no one's claiming anything outside that it's like if if we f were investigating the genome, we find these elements that look like viruses. And eventually we found out that some of them have uh, beneficial functions. So that's not, that's not retrofitting any data. The only thing that worked. Well, what would be, if you could, are you, like, if you could screen share or present us with, uh, based on, on what you're saying, okay, what would be the best tactical paper or lab experiment that, that you can provide myself or, or anybody on the fence, let's say in the audience, that would would show us and uh, kind of make the light bulb go off where we're like okay okay we can see how because if you notice this paper here herv's appear to play important roles in physiology fetal development and human evolution this is not a creationist paper by the way if the accidental notice this the accidental infection of a mammalian ancestor by exogenous retrovirus had never occurred the placenta and the mammals that produce it including humans <laughs> would never have existed. And I want the audience to pay close attention to that. Without this endogenous retroviral-like sequence, we couldn't exist. Humans would have never 
existed. These beneficial consequences can explain why these uh, HERVs have been fixed into the genome instead of being eliminated over, over the years. The most parsimonious explanation for me is, okay, these are necessary. These are essential. These were designed and created. But for you, I just see, you know, unfortunately, and I understand you'll disagree, I do see a lot of kind of just so storytelling, maybe this, maybe that. But why in 2022 don't we have a, a technical paper documenting some kind of lab experiment where this uh, endogenous retroviral-like element was, was subjected to a series of mutations or, or whatever that actually uh, led to a, a highly essential endogenous retrovirus? Um, yeah, go ahead. What would be your favorite technical paper just to, just to kind of throw at us uh, demonstrating what you're saying in terms of the co-option? Uh, you mentioned the Phoenix virus, uh, so uh, we can make them. We know that these uh, elements are uh, telltale signs of a viral infection. So at some point, yes, some regulatory function is beneficial. That's, that's well, what not did the Phoenix virus any... experiment demonstrate, though, for the audience sake? It demonstrated that it's a virus of viral origin. Well, firstly, so, how is that then, demonstrating their, their, the co-option of these uh, functional roles in embryological development? Well, we know that this is possible. Um, I can cite the, the, <laughs> the amoebas paper uh, that we know that um, redundancies with, like, with this type of thing occurs. Um, it's extremely rare like like you said there's one of these out of thousands of these so uh it's not going to be easy to evolve this in a lab um but we do know that they are viral elements we do know that the result of an infection and we've kind of lost track of the fact that there are hundreds of these that are shared with chimps so this is against since we know that they're viruses, statistically impossible. Well, I, I wanted. For us I, to I just want to make sure suite. that the audience. Obviously, I disagree with that. We don't know they're viruses. I, I think we've demonstrated that they're not. But but I understand you. Th you believe that we know they're viruses. But the only reason you conclude that is because of their properties, the, the structure, the LTRs, the gag, the pole, the their AMD. viral exclusive properties, right? But I've already pointed out that. <laughs> <laughs> the structure, the makeup, the properties of the ERV uh, sequence are required for one of their many, many roles, which is fighting off exogenous retroviruses, working in the... If they did not have these similarities to uh, extant retroviruses or exogenous retroviruses, they couldn't do their, their job. So I don't understand why you believe this is evidence that they're ancient remnants no, so of that would be. Infection. So that would be something like the envelope protein, but the rest of the telltale signs are not necessary because so uh, you mentioned viruses being bad for us. We can't have an immune system unless we're exposed to viruses and bacteria. So our immune system literally needs examples for it to learn. Um, we produce antibodies that go after all kinds of things. And this is a process of miniature evolution is, they're all it's called somatic <laughs> hypermutation produces tons and tons of different mutations uh and then the ones that work survive and proliferate and then that's the immune system that you work with going forward and if you encounter more um there's that and then you you say Wait, that these are if, if, I, could, not Joe, if I could if i could okay i have to point out that no every property of, of the, the unit, the ERV unit. For one, a lot of what we're looking at in terms of these sequences are just LTRs, just functional stretches of, of DNA. You know, we only find very few full endogenous retroviral sequences. I think you understand that. But what if you're looking at the LTRs, the GAG, the pole, the ENV, it, it's all functional for, for the unit, okay? It would be like saying, well, you know, a human no. being is, is not a functional unit. It just has some functional parts and other parts that are not functional. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense. The ERV unit itself 
is made up of properties or ingredients, I guess you could say, that are necessary for its functional roles, including the fact that they jump around retro transposition. They, ju they can jump around the genome, okay, yeah. leading to genetic diversity, turning genes on and off. They require their structure to even do that role. So I, I just wanted to say, I, I think you're wrong on that, uh, Snake. Go ahead. Uh, no, because they, you don't require them to have retrotransposable elements. They stay in the same place. That's part of the reason that that's part of the whole argument, because they're in the same place. If they were hopping around completely, that would... Well, they can move around. They're, they're, they, there's, there's class one and class two. They can either move around through a copy and paste mechanism or even a cut and paste. Yeah, they're transposed jumping but, genes, right? But the fact that they're found in the same locations is one of the pieces of evidence. So there, that's not a functional element that you don't require it to jump around for it to express envelope proteins, which is that's one of the ways that uh, the it's beneficial to cancer is it starts producing uh, viral specific particles that the immune system can recognize, but it doesn't need an entire uh, it doesn't need the LTRs. To, to express those envelope proteins. Um, and in fact, the LTRs, LTRs have a different function. But as you said, not all of these are complete retroviral sequences anyway. They, can, they have function and get along fine without the entire suite of retroviral tags. Right. A lot of what we're looking at in the genome are just LTRs. And notice here from PubMed, <clears throat> Endogenous retroviral LTRs as promoters for human genes. In this review, we summarize known examples of LTRs that function as human gene alternative promoters, as well as the evidence that LTR exaptation has resulted in a pattern of novel gene expression. You can read through this all yourself. My hand and my foot and my heart and my lungs, okay, everything that makes up me, okay, the unit that is a human being, has different functional roles, does different things, just like the ERV is made up of LTRs, or you just have uh, isolated or, or solo LTRs that are just functional uh, stretches of DNA, critical in, in, in um, mm. gene promotion, things like that. Either way, what we're looking at, regardless of the property, it, it's functional and, and necessary. And it contradicts this idea that, that these are the ancient remnants of, of viral infections. Again, I haven't really seen a, a t the Phoenix, Phoenix virus experiment. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That just showed us exactly what we've been predicting, that viruses, retroviruses have originated from within the genome. So they subjected a, an endogenous retrovirus to, to a series of, of mutations and uh, revived a virus. Well, that's exactly what we're saying based on our um, VIGE hypothesis. So that doesn't work to answer the question. Uh, I just think this is a question that that evolutionists really do struggle in in explaining, and I understand why. You know, uh, go ahead, uh, Snake Taylor. Yeah, yeah. Why don't Why don't you go ahead and take the last word on that? Address what he said there. Take your time, and then we'll move into your guys' closings if you want. Yeah. So the entire suite of retroviral parts is not necessary for the beneficial function of it. Uh, some LTRs are beneficial. Some ENVs are beneficial. Some gags are beneficial, but not the entire thing. You can cut it up. Um, and as you said, some of them are missing some of those parts. But those are identifiable tags that show us that they are viral elements. And it doesn't, it actually, we can give you that it's a retrotransposon that originated in the genome. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, well, I'll finish that thought, but... Uh, so even if, uh, so this is a, with the LTRs example that you gave, this is exactly what we expect evolution to do is we have, uh, and uh, promoters, uh, we expect that new DNA elements are introduced or are moved around that can change the regulation of certain genes or change the composition of the proteins of the genes that get made. And this is so this is not news it's just news that some of the vi the viruses are confirmed to have functions so that's exactly what we how we expect evolution to work is to co-opt new pieces of uh genetic information but as far as we can give you that they're not even uh 
the results of uh, retrovirus infections, but simply created transposable elements. So I'll give you God created uh, these pieces of DNA, but if the, if you're going to go with their transposable elements, there's not there's no mechanism for them to transpose to the exact same place or or any very specific place. So the fact that they transpose in the exact same location in the exact same genes in the exact same location of chromosomes with the exact species is still evidence that they come that they are an inherited suite of a pattern well, one, that comes from a common ancestor. Well before you go into your closing and maybe answer this in your closing <clears throat> um you understand that a lot of these uh, jumping genes, these retro transposons, they do have, it, it's not entirely random. They have prefer, preferred integration sites. As in maybe, you know, between this gene and this gene is going to allow for the essential function that, that it requires, or this will allow for the, um, for genetic variation. When they jump around so they have perfect so it's not just completely random a lot of what we're looking at is is non-random and so that's yeah, why we would I, see them jumping into a lot of similar spots maybe save that for your closing you have five minutes sure uh, yeah let's move into that um all right like you said, Am Sam, I going? You're get, uh, five minutes yeah you'll go ahead and go first all right so yeah um i calculated um being extremely generous and only Again, the, this one viral group, uh, the ERVWs, uh, HERVWs, if we're saying that there's only, so there's only, there's 211 that we have, and we're going to be extremely generous and say that there's only 211 possible places where it, it can ins insert, which is way, way too generous to be realistic, but we'll, let's go with that. Let's say that each virus can only go to one of these 211 places. And let's say that each has a 50% chance of going there. Because yet, like you said, there are preferred sections, but there are still millions of them. Uh, but we'll, we'll reduce it down to 211 and give it an extremely generous chance of 50-50%. We still have a 3 Point five times 10 to the 64th chance of it occurring the way that it does. And so there's that. Plus it happened exactly the same way in ch chimps. Oh, well, uh, to the 205th. So uh, that's still statistically that's, I don't know. It's a bigger number than the quintillions. So even if we're being extremely generous and saying that it's a retro transposon that's originating in the genome and it has exactly as many places as there are and no more, and we're giving it a 50% chance, it's still statistically about zero likelihood that this is going to happen the same way in both chimps and humans um there's the and the fact that it just so happens to coincidentally match the exact same phylogenetic trees as is represented by uh genetic barcoding of any other gene or uh and the exact same phylogenetic tree as happens with morphology, that's not, that's also a coincidence because it's a suite of traits. That's, that can't be a coincidence, is what I mean to say. Um, because again, there's hundreds of different insertion sites that could be anywhere, that could be functional anywhere. We know that that, that could be functional anywhere. We, uh, these uh, glowing jellyfish in my background, we just took their uh, fluorescent protein and we can just stick it in pretty much anything and make it glow. And it doesn't really matter. It, there, you can't just stick it literally anywhere, but it, you can put it on different chromosomes, um, things like that. So 
The location is not important to function. So this is an extremely poor design for God to have programmed, knowing full well that people like I and 99% of all of the best scientists are going to see the evidence in apparently the wrong way. I'm not sure why he's going to make the decision to give a design that's apparently deliberately confusing. Um, and I've got about a minute left, I think. Um, as for functional elements, they're all related to uh, things that are that viruses are already capable of. Uh, they behave exactly how we expect um, these uh, signals to expect or to behave. Uh, it's not it's not out of the realm of uh, probability to expect uh, regulatory elements to have deleterious, neutral, and beneficial effects. You can just throw them randomly into things and they'll have beneficial, deleterious, and neutral effects. This happens with viruses. And so that's not a problem. The fact that uh, we observe in many species uh, redundancies that can then be taken up, that, that you can then lose one of those redundancies and still have a necessary function, that explains every functional element that it re required functional elements. Um, so yeah, I think that just about wraps it up. That does it for your five minutes, Snake. Excellent closing. Very good. It's been a lively debate. Tons of points made. So Donnie, whenever you're ready to give your five minute closing, man, have that and I'll start your timer. <clears throat> okay. I appreciate it. Let me start my timer as well. Lots to cover in just five minutes. So no, it's not bad design. It's actually a perfect design. Okay. These elements are essential. They're critical to immune responses, cell stress responses, embryological development. I mean, during this debate, I must have shown at least over a dozen technical papers um, verifying exactly what I'm saying. And uh, Taylor, unfortunately, he didn't provide even, even one technical paper showing empirical evidence for how these uh, elements can uh, evolve such as essential functions, including embryological development. I mean, that one paper I, I showed uh, from the secular literature literally admitted if it wasn't for this retro transposon, we wouldn't exist. How is that bad design? They're admitting we wouldn't exist without it. That's good design. I like existing, and I think Taylor likes existing as well, okay? We share these elements with other forms of life like the chimpanzee simply because of common design since guess what? Chimpanzees also require elements to help with embryological development, determining cell types. Did you know chimpanzees are also made of cells? Yeah, believe it or not. Um, gene expression, gene regulation, okay? Aiding in the immune system, tumor suppression, so on and so forth, okay? So they require these elements as well. Were we just supposed to expect to find them only in humans and not in any other form of life? That sounds kind of bizarre. And uh, Taylor tries to counter... Uh, the fact that these endogenous retroviral sequences have incredibly important and essential roles that if you knock out a certain retrotransposon, the organism dies. Again, that is good design. But he looks to this uh, Phoenix virus experiment where um, scientists took human cells, mutated uh, the DNA ever so slightly uh, in the endogenous re retrovirus, and it turns out that an extinct virus was revived from a DNA sequence that was found in the human genome. That's exactly what we would predict, because as I've pointed out several times in this debate, okay, RNA virus, retroviruses require a host to replicate. What came first, the host or the RNA virus? I asked this question to uh, Snake a couple times. Obviously, the host, these had to have originated within the host, and we would suggest that they originated from functional ERV sequences. And that makes sense. We can actually track back every single exogenous retrovirus, given the genes and the properties it has. We can track them back to the host that they originated from. Okay, and there's there's many creation scientists, one specifically named Dr. Pierre Turborg, I think is how you say his last name, who has done just that. And there's been no counter. 
Okay. So the Phoenix, Phoenix experiment does not help. It actually helps our model that uh, suggests that a lot of these uh, viruses came from ERVs, came from the, the human genome to begin with. There's a paradox. There's an unsolvable problem with those that uh, believe in, in um, deep time evolution. Where did RNA viruses come from in the first place? Okay, so no, this is completely uh, compatible with our model and does not answer the question, the important question, are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? Okay, one function that, that we kind of touched on slightly is that when the cell is under, uh, under stress, okay, transcribed ERV elements gives the cell the appearance, notice this, of being invaded by a viral infection, which as a result targets the cell targets that specific cell, more destruction by the immune system. And some tumor cells can invade detection of the immune system, but this mechanism, which is mediated by what's called, it's a super protein, okay, P53, is a way for those tumor cells to become detectable by the immune system as a way for the immune system to clear these tumor cells from the body. And researchers, they're working on uh, various drugs that will uh, st stimulate P53 activity and the transcription of, of herbs as anti-cancer therapy, anti-cancer. These herb sequences are playing a role in tumor suppression through viral mimicry. Guys, the properties and structure of the herb sequence is required. It's, necess it's a necessary truth for these herb sequences to perform their roles. Notice here in the last 40 second, seconds, um, why would a creator produce functional genomic features that so closely resemble an endogenous, endogenized retrovirus? Okay, we've seen this in real time. I've shown many technical papers. The structural and functional features of the pre-existing ERVs, their capacity to copy themselves and move throughout the genome, are precisely what make these ERV sequences so useful. Their capacity for retro transpositioning affords these sequences the means to disrupt the endogenization process of invading retroviruses. They literally act, they operate as anti-retroviral elements. They must, they must, and I'll say it again, they must resemble endogenized retroviruses. They have to have these similarities to extant retroviruses or else they couldn't do their job. End of story, slam dunk. Irv argument for evolution is, I think, dead. It's a fatal blow. So I'll, I'll yield there. That actually, that's two seconds left. So that that's that's my closing statement. I appreciate it. Excellent timing again as well. Well, pretty good debate. I mean, I almost tailed off a few times not paying attention to the timer because uh, you guys are bringing up some good points. A lot of good questions. A lot of good information. <laughs> uh, now we get to move on Technical to the, subject. the real fun part, right? The the audience Q and A. We've got quite a few here. Um, Looks like we got about 18, 17 and a half minutes left till we hit the two hour mark. So we'll see how many we get through. I'm going to scroll down and we'll jump right into the super chats. Uh, first off, George Bond with the $10 chat. Sweet chili chicken burger for lunch. Not bad, George. That sounds pretty good. Uh, Alec Cox with a $10 chat. Uh, he threw in some random stuff here. But his question... Um, how long does it take a cell to divide in a human? Number two, what is missed in that division? And I'm assuming this is uh, pertaining to something Snake said. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what is missed in that division. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean. Me neither. How about the for any thoughts on the first part? How long does it take a cell to divide in a human? Alex asked. Uh, it's a couple hours, uh, twelve ish hours, uh, depending on the cell. Twelve hours. Excellent. I'm not sure what the second part is. <laughs> me, neither. me neither. Me neither. You're getting a quiz, Taylor. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Question for Danny. Has anyone seen a modern viral insertion into the genome that hasn't caused serious health problems for the host, something similar to HIV? Right. So when these modern viruses, these extant viruses like um, HIV, when they, um, when they invade the host cell, 
Okay. They end up, um, it, it can be passed on uh, horizontally, but not vertically, like the endogenous uh, retroviruses. And they um, result in disease. They were, they, they're deleterious. They're damaging. And these retroviruses are very interesting because I, I pointed it out in, in my um, opening statement is, is that they use a, a very specific enzyme called reverse transcriptase to transcribe. They're made of um, RNA genetic material. OK, so they use this uh, enzyme to transcribe the RNA in reverse back into DNA. And um, the virus uses another important enzyme called integrase to integrate its genetic information directly into the host's DNA. OK, and if you are infected with one of these extant uh, retroviruses like HIV, for example, there's another one, um, the exact name of it. I can't think of right now, but it, it can actually result in lymphoma, various cancers. Okay, These are deleterious. These are damaging. But what we see in terms of the endogenous retroviruses that are tightly regulated and integrated into the genomes of living organisms, they function in the embryo. They function in determining cell types. They function in gene expression. They have antiviral properties. They function in tumor suppression. They uh, aid in transcription, act as promoters. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And th that's, that's not deleterious like these extant uh, retroviruses. So I yield there. And what was the question again? The question was, has anyone seen a modern viral insertion into the genome that hasn't caused serious health problems for the host? Uh, modern, uh, yeah, I'd have to look into exactly what it was, but um, yeah, most uh, diseases are not going to be fatal. Um, and uh, you were mentioning uh, reverse transcriptase a lot which is one of the hallmarks of a viral infection, which is not going to be required by something, even, even if uh, even those elements that are required to mimic a virus uh, for cancer, cancer regulation is not going to require reverse transcriptase. Um, that's just going to look, that's just going to tell us that it's actually from an infection. Any last thoughts um, on that, Johnny? You want to move on to the so, next one? Yeah. Okay, so it's my question. I'll, I'll give the last couple of thoughts. So, again, yeah, a lot of diseases that come about, okay? Not every single, uh, just like a, a single point mutation can kill an organism. Okay, well, you know what? Uh, that organism is removed from the equation, okay? Selection is dealt with that. Selection is all about differential reproduction. Who's, who's having the most babies? Yeah. Most diseases are not detrimental enough to fitness where that uh, person experiencing the disease can not have kids and then pass on their uh, deleterious mutations with it. Like if, if I lost both my hands and both my feet, let's just say even through a mutation, that sucks. But it's not going to prevent me from having kids. Okay. So, yeah, many, many diseases um, are, are not going to... Uh, prevent reproduction. And, and the last thing I want to say is, again, when it comes to the reverse transcriptase, the gag, the poll, the, the LTR, the ENV, whatever, okay, every single property is essential for what these do, specifically the transposons, how um, they, they, they are mobile, mobile genetic elements, and uh, they can move around the genome, jumping from one location to the next in the DNA. They can do this through a copy and paste mechanism or a cut and paste mechanism. And the structure, including the reverse transcriptase uh, property of these uh, ERV elements are required for their many functional uh, roles, this specific one in generating genetic variation, which is what creation is predicted. I'll, I'll yield there. Excellent. I hope that satisfied the questioner there. We'll move on to the next one. I think this one is for you, Snake, uh, pertaining evolution. They say, so if evolution is the result of random, unguided processes, why should we expect to see any kind of a pattern at all? Because uh, it's not. It's, it's not unguided at all. It's guided by chemistry. It's guided by uh, selection pressures. Um, so, I mean, and we can prove that the, these exact mechanisms can create functional elements, uh, whether we're looking at 
uh, computer simulations of random mutations and then uh, being subjected to selection, which can cause uh, functional code or functional uh, body parts if we're simulating 3D body parts. Uh, these All these exact same uh, processes work. Uh, we can also observe it uh, at the genetic level with actual organisms. Uh, but again, it's not unguided. So I'm not sure what... Uh, that That's usually a straw man, uh, calling it an unguided process, because it's not. Okay. Danny? Yeah, if I could, these patterns that uh, that we see, let's say specifically the nested hierarchical patterns, the fact that we share more with other primates, let's say we share more with the chimpanzee than we do with uh, with a lemur. We share more with even the lemur. We can be grouped together with the chimpanzee and the lemur uh, because we share more in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, and genetics than we do with a dog or a fish. I mean, this is expected, of course. Just stand back and, and look at the organism. You're going to predict more similarities uh, in genetics with a chimpanzee than, than with a dog. But even, even when it comes to these patterns that apparently, according to the evolutionists, are expected and, and predicted, uh, from common descent, from the common descent uh, starting point, uh, we see inconsistencies all the time. There's something called incomplete lineage sorting, where uh, depending on what gene you look at, depending on what genetic marker you look at, you're going to get totally different trees. Look at the Y chromosome, for example. The Y chromosome between the humans and uh, gorillas <laughs> is more similar than uh, the Y chromosome between humans and chimpanzees. There's a break in the so-called hierarchy. And even when it comes to these uh, endogenous retroviral-like uh, sequences, there's inconsistencies in the hierarchy as well. For example, here's a paper, a herv, whenever you see the H, human, human endogenous retroviral, K provirus in chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. These observations provide very strong evidence that for some fraction of the genome, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, notice this, are more closely related to each other than they are to humans. Okay, but the bottom line is we do share more endogenous retroviral-like sequences with, let's say, the chimpanzee than we do with a, a creature that we share less in terms of morphology and anatomy with because we, sh we share more in, in terms of anatomy, morphology, physiology. So, of course, we're going to share some of these uh, ERV sequences with them, especially if they function, again, in the embryo, determining cell types, gene expression, so on and so forth. That, to me, points to common design. Um, explaining the pattern far better than evolution. I'll yield there. Last word, Snake. Yeah, so that seems to be an inconsistency that you would expect similar morphology to have the exact same genetic elements. Um, but then you point out places, uh, isolated places where there are uh, certain breaks in the phylogenetic tree. Um, but that's not really how phylogeny is done. It's done with a suite of traits, not just one single trait. Um, and the Y chromosome specifically is one of the most fastest mutating. Uh, well, it is the fastest mutating chromosome we have. Um, but it's not really the arguments, at least with ERVs, is not about uh, strictly about the similarity. Um, it's about the fact that has gone uh, basically unaddressed completely, which is that regardless of where you think they originate, these are elements that uh, came to rest where they are in the genome by, via either infection or transposition, which is statistically impossible to end up the exact same way in two different species like that. Um, and the fact that it we can predict how much that's just an added cherry on top, I guess. Excellent. All right. So before we move on to the next question, let me just say that logical, plausible, probable is having an after show. And that is exclusive for cool people. So if you're not cool, don't even think about going over there. High probability of dumpster fire. And I am a fan of probability theory, even uh, Bayesian probability which puts the resurrection at a probability of 0.97. And I would say the probability of dumpster fire might not be as good as the resurrection. We'll put LPP's dumpster fire at like 0.96. But make your way on over there after this if you want to. Let's get on to the next question. I think this is for both of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's good. Only losers won't come to the after show. 
All right, so question for both of you guys. Do ERVs in similar areas of coding sequence because of similar pressure and similar purpose, ERVs seem to be no more evidence of common descent than of common design. Same pressure, same region. Uh, well, you could make certain arguments that it is, uh, I guess, agnostic for things like function. Yeah, it, it could go either way. Um, but again, the, the thing that really differentiates it is the, uh, the viral elements that, you know, uh, viral exclusive elements that we know are from viruses, um, or if you prefer tra uh, transposable elements, um, like you said, sometimes the uh, there are more or less uh, parts of the virus where the fact that it looks like an ERV is important and it's it expressing itself in cancer cells so that it, it can be detected and will target cancer cells. Uh, this is to be expected. Um, if there's an infection, it, a different, uh, an added genome can tag things to be differently, uh, to look differently. Um, but, uh, other, other things like the, the mammal required uh, placental ERV, it doesn't have to mimic an ERV. Um, so there are certain uh, parts of the genome that are not necessary, but still mark it as an ERV. And that's how we're able to identify them as separate parts. They're, they're, these aren't just random pieces of the genome that we're deciding had to have come from viruses. They have specific tags. Um, and um, yeah, all the papers you're referencing are have been reviewed by evolutionary biologists, and they come to uh, the conclusion that they are evolved. Like the one you quoted about uh, mammalian uh, ERVs is about the evolution of retroviruses. Um, we should go into detail about that study. Uh, there should be around two, <laughs> um, but uh, I guess I started off my statement saying there are things, there are uh, functional elements which could be agnostic, which could be designed. The thing that is not agnostic to this debate is the uh, the likelihoods that these elements are transposed to the locations that they are is uh, basically zero. So, and we haven't really address that at all okay <clears throat> well i appreciate that response um first thing i want to add is <laughs> i'm choking that's the first thing i want to add is <coughs> the evolutionists keep saying that, that these are expected but then they admit that they never predicted the function so uh, how are these things expected if they they never predicted the embryological uh, developmental requirements, essentially, of, of these retrotransposons. And I saw someone in the chat. Yeah, uh, apparently the, the technical way of saying ERV is IRV. They're IRVs or uh, ALU sequences, ALU. Uh, but oftentimes it is easier just to say ERV, endogenous retrovirus. But <clears throat> yeah, so the evolution has never predicted. They, and, and I'll go on record saying they retrofitted the data. And of course, the authors of, of, this, of these papers are not going to conclude, okay, special creation. I mean, that's off the table. Okay, they, they are required. Sure, they can question some details of the evolutionary story, but they can't question uh, the bigger picture. They can't conclude, well, okay, you know, this must mean they're created units of DNA function. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that paper wouldn't be published. That's why they say things like motors or engines of evolution, positive selection. That's not telling us how an endogenous retroviral-like element can go from what they once assumed was junk to something incredibly functional in the immune system. I mean, I find this so funny. So apparently <clears throat> we were invaded by exogenous retroviruses which today endogenous retroviruses fight against, protect us against. So these exogenous retroviruses got passed down vertically, became endogenized, and eventually uh, evolved the ability to fight off that which they were before. I mean, that sounds to me kind of bizarre. Okay, a lot of this is just fanciful storytelling. It, it's a fairy tale. And here in this question, if I'm understanding it correctly, <clears throat> I wanna urge creationists 
Taylor does have a point. If we are saying that these are actually the result of ancient viral infection, some creationists uh, hold that position. And I wouldn't recommend that because Taylor is right. We share a lot of these sequences or even uh, fragments with the chimpanzees. And so it's very unlikely that, that we independently experienced the uh, invasion of, of these viruses in um, similar positions. Okay. You know, one, given the amount of locations in the genome is somewhere like one in a million. So if you go into 200, 300, <clears throat> it's, it's even more than that, of course, because that's not what the evidence suggests anyways. The fact is the mutations that we find in the structure of the endogenous retroviral elements, like the LTRs, yeah, that can be due to environmental pressures. We know mutations are not as random as once expected or predicted. No, mutations are essentially, a lot of them are non-random. Okay, we also know that evolutionists assume all DNA differences are the result of mutations over time. So a lot of these DNA differences are, you know, quote unquote mutations in the properties of the ERV, like the LTRs that form these nested hierarchical patterns, may not even be uh, the result of mutations. They may be uh, functional differences that are required for the respective... Uh, organism. So anyways, I, I could talk all day, but I'll, I'll just say, you know what, as a creationist, we should go with what the evidence suggests. And the evidence suggests that these are created units of DNA function. If a creationist wants to say that these are the result of uh, ancient infections, or even infections thousands of years ago, now the creationist is stuck in the same position as the evolutionist. How do you explain the functional roles? How did those, uh, you know, uh, get adopted, essentially? So uh, I'll yield there. Good question. Anything you want to add to that, Taylor? Um, so uh, in that paper you were talking about, they there are conserved sequences of the ERVs and non-conserved sequences. So they, they're they using that to track basically uh, the, the lineage of a certain ERV, which, I mean, there's different levels of this. So there's the shared ERVs, and then within those shared ERVs, there are even further differences um, that aren't seen in the conserved domains. Um, and the, the point there is the highly variable regions are essentially not functional because they're so highly variable, um, uh, especially LTRs. But... Um, well, actually, Taylor, uh, to, that was a question for both. Can I just respond to one well, thing? And then I, I have one okay. more thing to respond to. Sure, um, as far as, um, what was it? My, I kind of derailed my train of thought there. Um, so, yeah, go, go ahead. As, if, if I can, uh, I'll get my train of thought back, but you can go ahead. And, <laughs> Apol yeah. Apologies. I almost forgot what I was going to respond to. Okay, so the conserved versus non-conserved regions. Okay, when you find these conserved regions, let's say let's say we just stick with ERVs, ERV sequences. If we find an ERV sequence in, let's say, humans and chimpanzees that's nearly identical or um, conserved, as you could put it, evolutionists say, well, you know, these are cons we have these conserved sections of DNA in humans and mice because they're, they're essential, they're, they're important. So selection has essentially conserved or preserved them over time. But here's the thing, an, an ERV sequence in humans that say has to deal with uh, determining cell types or, or uh, regulating genes, but specifically we're focusing on, you know, similarities in morphology or anatomy, that ERV sequence is going to be very uh, similar anyways. And um, that, so that, that could be interpreted as conserved. But then non-conserved regions, that doesn't mean that it's non-functional. It just means there's also some parts or aspects to the gene expression pathway found in humans that's a lot um, more dissimilar to chimpanzees. So we would expect that those would, the evolutionists would say those are non-conserved. No, they're different because humans also have a lot of differences with the chimpanzees. And so those those functional uh, differences would, would reflect in the sequences as well. And, and the DNA differences in those sequences, the evolutionists might say are due to mutations over time. But maybe those differences are actually there because they're reflecting functional differences between humans and chimpanzees. So that was kind of a mouthful, but I'll, I'll yield there. Go ahead, Taylor. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the thing I, I lost my train of thought on was the the idea that, um, 
Wow, I'm losing it again. <laughs> it's I'm going back. What were you saying? Uh, the being able to, uh, you said that we're just kind of accommodating the data. So, uh, I guess I wanted to clarify. Um, yeah. So it wasn't predicted necessarily the, that ERVs had a sp specific function, but it is, it's not unexpected. Like they weren't surprised or caught off guard that ERVs had the specific functions that they did because they already knew that viral elements had that function of uh, they can regulate themselves, they can disrupt genes. In fact, that is one of the causal elements of why uh, so many retroviruses can cause cancers is because they interrupt uh, cell division regulatory genes, um, apoptosis regulatory genes, uh, which is program cell death. Uh, so when we confirmed what, like, we're not going to be able to predict everything about the genome because of uh, basic Darwinistic mechanisms. So there's always going to be something to discover. Um, but it it's always in line with what we know about what the, already knew what the functions that viruses are capable of have. So we're not seeing things like, um, I don't know, like a like a blood coagulant or like an antifreeze gene coming off of the uh, these things that apparently look like ERVs. Um, we're seeing virus-related functions. So, uh, yeah, and just to kind of liken it to uh, crime scene investigation, we're not going to say, well, it looks like the victim has been stabbed with a knife, but he could have just been born with a knife in his chest. We're going to say, okay, we know knives can get there by the process of stabbing. Same thing we're doing with the ERVs. We know that they can get, we know that it looks exactly like this when retroviruses insert themselves. So, uh, and a lot of the functions are not related to needing the entire retroviral uh, suite of traits. Um, and that's why there's such a highly variable region. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so like that question alone could have been a whole other debate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I just want to ask one simple question and then we can move on. Are, are you going on record saying that exogenous retroviruses, they can accomplish many crucial, crucial functions such as regulating gene expression, cell differentiation and embryological development. Is that your position? Uh, they have, yeah, that they have the ability to regulate or disrupt genes that they insert into. <laughs> disrupt. We've seen. But we mm -hmm. have not seen an exogenous retrovirus integrate itself into the genome, be passed on vertically to be essential in embryological development to the point where we could say, wow, if it wasn't for that retrotransposon, we couldn't exist. Show me a technical paper on that. Send it to me after or, it, you know, I, I'm going to call a bluff on that one, uh, Taylor. Uh, but we have seen is that their their ability to regulate the genes that they're part of or inside um, of, or bordering. So we've, we've observed the turning on and off of genes. Uh, the, the, these exogenous retroviruses involving themselves in, in the gene expression pathway, you're saying? We've, we've observed this? Uh, yeah, that's what they do. Okay, so what's a technical paper that, that shows an exogenous retrovirus infiltrating the, the cell and and then um, adopting a function where it actually helps in gene regulation, cell differentiation, expression, things like that. Like we've observed this in the lab, you're saying? Um, well, uh, when you're going highly specific, laboratory experiment that includes a beneficial, necessary retroviral insertion. Uh, 
I can look for one for you. We can have a round two. Um, but as far as the functions, uh, regulatory functions are, and as far as the fact that we can tell what uh, DNA elements are inserted and transposed, uh, yeah, we um, using the evidence that they are, in fact, retrovirus infections, we can tell that certain uh, viruses or certain ERVs necessary for development are were the result of infections. Um, as far as us accomplishing this in the lab, uh, I'll have to search for one for you. But Well, we see these ERV sequences that you say are genomic fossils, right? Brandon's laughing, never ending. We see that they function in turning genes on and off. That's what gene regulation is essentially, okay? And we know that uh, gene regulation is incredibly important in, in uh, development. And these genes are often turned on and off based on the presence or non-presence of these ERV-like sequences. So we see that. We see that they function that way. But we don't see exogenous retroviruses invade the cell and then evolve that function. That we don't see. So it sounds like to me, you're, you're seeing the, the functions in the endogenous retroviral-like sequences and assuming, well, the exogenous retroviruses may already have the built-in capacity for that function. Is that essentially what you're saying? Well, we know that they do have the built-in capacity to regulate. To regulate the host's genes in helping with development, turning genes on and off. We know that. Uh, if it happens to affect a gene that ha is involved in uh, development. Well, let's see that. And, sure. and we're just, I'm just asking, let's see that. Let's see. A, I want to, because all I ever see is engines of evolution, positive selection. We don't see, okay, you know, here's an empirical example and observable and example of an exogenous retrovirus integrated into the cell being passed down vertically. And now, wow, look at this. It's, it's critically functional for the, the organism. You know, I, I don't believe we see that. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And we do, but I would just have to have you prove that to me is what I'm saying. Yeah, um, but that what I'm saying is that's an unreasonable standard of evidence because we already know that redundancies and um, uh, dependencies can evolve. And we already know ERV That's not an insert. answer, though. We already know <laughs> that they can regulate. And we know where we these we know that these elements come from. I think we'll save that one for round two. Huh? Round two. Yeah. yeah, it's a good it's a good topic. And this has been enjoyable, Taylor. I appreciate we, we it. We could we could yeah. make it just on that mammal paper. Well, we here's a, here's a question that might uh, that might lead you into that about mammals and endogenous endogenous retroviruses inserting themselves. The question states if we see similarities in monkeys, would we then find some of the endogenous retroviruses to be in other mammals like whales? We do find directed towards you, Taylor. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry for we do out. have some similarities with whales, yeah. As far as the RVs go. Um, like you said, a lot of these are mammalian specific, uh, which all mammals share. And there there's a uh, phylogenetic tree, a, a nested hierarchy, um, that shows the same relationship as is predicted by evolutionary biology. Uh, through morphology. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> ERV sequences are, are abundant in jawed vertebrates, mammals, obviously, and in primates. We're talking specifically here about um, the primates and how these ERV-like sequences do fall out into a, um, a nested hierarchy as well as their uh, mutations. A lot of the times in the structure of these ERVs, they also fall into a, a hierarchy. But here's the thing, again, going back to the beginning of the debate, is what we're looking at in terms of these so-called genomic fossils, are we really looking at the ancient remnants of viral infections? I'm saying no. Or are they created units of DNA function? That I'm saying yes to. And we can 
predict function. Evolutionists admit that they never predicted it, but they say over and over again that we expected it. Okay. Well, if you didn't predict it and essentially you're retrofitting the data and all their papers never actually say how these functions were co-opted or came about, they just make the claim. They just assert co-option, rapid evolution, engines of evolution, so on and so forth. But they, they don't actually give a, an empirical reason for uh, a creationist to believe, okay, you know, non-functional uh, properties of, of the endogenous retroviral element or unit, uh, you know, went from, from non-functional to something incredibly functional in determining cell types, gene expression, so on and so forth. And again, the question, the follow-up question by the evolutionist is, well, why do they resemble exogenous retroviruses? Why do they have, you know, LTRs and the gag gene, the pole gene, um, and, and the uh, envelope protein, for example. And it's like, we just had a paper in either 2021 or 2022 that, that I showed earlier that demonstrates that these properties and the structure of the ERV is required for its purpose and job. I mean, that's perfectly compatible with the creation model. And the evolutionists can reject it and say, well, no, we were invaded by a virus. And then the virus became an endogenous retrovirus as it was passed on vertically. And then it evolved the ability to fight off that which it used to be. I mean, to me, that just sounds ridiculous. When it comes to the hierarchy, of course, if these are created units of DNA function, okay, this should be basic to anybody, then of course, we are going to share more. For example, humans and chimpanzees, we are going to share more of these ERV sequences with the chimpanzee than we're going to with the mouse or a whale, okay? Because we already share more with the chimpanzee in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, and genetics. A sedan is going to, by definition, share more features with the SUV than it is with a, a bicycle or a plane. Just stand back, look at the... Um, the structures and, and anybody can can predict that. So the nested hierarchies that we find are agnostic. What's not agnostic is the function. That is my position. I am making the claim that DNA function can help differentiate between the models. Ancient viral infections, created units of DNA function, repredict function, evolutionists, although they've had to retrofit the data, they predict these are evolutionary leftovers. Okay. And so they would predict non-function. They'll still predict most of them are non-functional, even though that, that logically has been, has been overturned. So I believe the DNA function and the lack of response from the evolutionists in explaining the DNA function is the fatal blow to, the, uh, to their interpretation of, of the endogenous retroviruses. I yield there. Taylor? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the nested hierarchies are agnostic until you get to transitional forms that connect all the separate hierarchies uh and like when, what you were saying about um the the cancer regulation ervs that need um more of the viral elements that's a completely different mechanism from the mammalian uh developmental ervs that do not um and do not need to uh resemble um a virus that's related to regulation not immune development um and then the final point i guess is just uh prediction versus expectation so it wasn't uh, we didn't predict the functions we investigated the functions so um and then we didn't predict non-function it was more just a lack of we don't know what they do we're, we're not predicting what they do. Um, so they investigated what it does. Um, but all functions were within expectations of what viruses function as. Um, so don't, uh, I don't want people to confuse uh, expected virus function with a prediction that a specific ERV is going to function in a specific way. Interesting. Um, I do have a question from Dustin. Um, it's a little tough to read. I don't know if you can see this, Donnie. I asked him to rephrase it in the comment section a while back, but let's see what you guys can make of this. He says, where does the line lie as far as an inherent genetic trait and a new something that develop? 
I know that sounded kind of choppy, but again, he says, where does the line lie as far as an inherent genetic trait and new ones that develop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says. I can't. For example, new alcohol was once thought to be passed down, but not every ancestor had access to alcohol. Does that make any sense to you guys? The line between inherent genetic trait and new ones that develop. Um, as <laughs> if I try and understand that as far as the evolutionary perspective, uh, there isn't a line because new traits that develop are derived from inherited genetic traits. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, the enzyme to metabolize alcohol is what he's talking about it's possible i don't know what a wan is the w-o-n-s i don't know what wands are so I'd, maybe you make sense of that donnie you maybe got he's talking about um the difference between uh genetic traits that we all share and and traits that have been regionally adapted yeah i don't see him in the chat anymore maybe he left so if i mean if you got anything to say on that, Donnie, feel free. If not, we can we can uh, <laughs> skip that one. <laughs> yeah, let's move on to the last one or two because we're coming at the two and a half hour mark, and I'm getting pretty exhausted at this point. Very well, this interesting is, technical debate. So this, this is, is the last one here from Bubble Gun. Um, Bubble Gum Gun. It's a little tongue in cheek, but this is more of a statement to the both of you. He says, how convenient that these ERVs found just the right spot to insert themselves to later in the future become necessary. Such foresight from that virus. Uh, yeah, so that's not, as I've explained, that's not really how it works. So the, the fact that something is necessary is not an indication that it was ever the only necessary element or the only uh, part of the genome that served that function. We know there are biological um, redundancies. We know the mechanisms by which you can gain a redundancy and then lose that redundancy, but the part of the genome supporting that function changes because there is a redundancy. Uh, it's like if you have a uh, I don't know, two different uh, ways to support. Like my computer is supported by a couple of books right now. I'm putting it up high. If I put another book in there and I take another book out, it's still supported. Um, so it's not the second book having the foresight to be necessary. There And there are a lot of uh, ERVs that are not necessary. Uh, and in fact, are still harmful. So, so much that could be said there. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, hinder myself from, from a monologue, but um, I, I think Bubblegum Gun nails it there, where it, it must be convenient that the essentially these deleterious exogenous retroviral infections um, invaded the genome, invaded the cell, invaded in, in the right spot to uh, be passed on vertically and eventually become an endogenous retrovirus. The offspring um, would, would have this viral DNA in every single one of its cell. And then eventually it also adopts, co-ops, evolves the uh, essential functions necessary for humans to even exist. Okay, uh, essential in embryological development, snip out that certain class of retrotransposon. And although the mouse is developing, bam, you snip it out, it dies. Okay, in evolution, when they talk about uh, redundancy, they'll often uh, talk about it in a different way than we would. Okay, redundancy is evidence of, of forward thinking. Anybody who does computer code understands that, okay? Or let's say a spare tire in, in the back of your car. Well, to the evolutionists, that might be redundant. Like, why is that there? I've already got four tires and they work just great. But you know what? If the environmental condition arises where you get a flat tire, thank God you got that, uh, that spare. 
Okay. But what's, what's funny about that is once you use that spare, okay, that's it. You're even, even uh, redundancy can only go so far because mutation, like treading on your tires. Every time you go out driving, you are ruining the, the, the treading and eventually you'll, you'll need new tires. Now it's there. It, it, it's redundant. It's there for wear and tear, but it can only last for so long. Okay. Any, any computer coder can tell you redundancy is evidence of forward thinking. The evolutionists though, they look to redundancy and essentially they give evolutionary mechanisms a mind. Because they'll say, well, these neutral mutations, which we know is false, we know they're they're uh, nearly neutral, effectively neutral, slightly deleterious, they build up over time and they become like a hidden reservoir of genetic change, where at some point this quote unquote redundancy or genetic baggage can be called upon through mutations, neo-functionalization, co-option, whatever, co-option when it comes to the, the herbs, and, uh, and and they can become beneficial, okay? Now, th this hasn't been observed specifically with the ERV sequences. We haven't observed the types of functions that we see. The evolutionists never predicted it, and they'll admit, no, we never predicted it. You know, we used to assume that, that, that these were uh, the junk, useless and now we know that that they are uh, functional in tumor suppression gene regulation antiviral function okay again i want to point out it sounds silly to anybody who thinks about it logically that these viruses invaded the organism and then eventually evolved the ability to fight off that which they were <laughs> it's like a robber breaking into your house but deciding to live there for some reason has an agreement with, with, uh, you know, the, the people that live there and own the house at the time and, and decides to just have a change of life. He repented and now he's going to fight off future robbers from breaking into the house. It's just, it's ridiculous. And a lot of this, it's storytelling, it's imagination. You know, we want the empirical evidence. We want the technical, uh, data and we just focused on ERVs tonight for the most part. But I mean, we can talk about uh, all sorts of, of function for, for what was once assumed to be uh, junk DNA. Nucleoskeletal hypothesis is fascinating. I talked about it with Dr. Fazrana in my two-part series with him. Uh, these so-called uh, junk DNA regions are acting as a mutational buffer. They're maintaining the 3D structure, which, which is amazing. It's like, the, the, this just came about for, for no reason because of uh, the buildup of neutral mutations, regulate histone binding, gene regulation, the pseudogenes code for uh, functional proteins. So I'll, I'll end it there. I, I just think that the whole uh, model of these neutral mutations building up to the point where they can be called upon for um, beneficial change or novelty. I, I think that that's more in theory or, or even just a hypothesis which, which without any real uh, solid supporting evidence. So I guess we'll give Snake, I think the question was for Snake. He can have the last word. Yeah, so we have an anti-fragile genome, which basically means um, that uh, you can mess with it a little bit. Um, some, some mutations are worse than others. Um, but we get along just fine with uh, some instability where uh, we have certain things like um, like with cancer. Um, there are certain things that are, are cancer causing, but we can get along with them for a while and then cancer hits an old age. Um, so uh, some instability where ERVs can cause uh, cancer. Um, we can live with those mutations. Um, and then there are some ERVs that cause instability in cancer causing uh, genes uh, that um, interrupt those or combat them in some way um, by tagging them, or they can also, uh, uh, they can upregulate or downregulate genes. And the fact that we see both is more consistent and, pro and actually exclusive to evolutionary mechanisms um, uh, because this is like this is more consistent with the hit or miss type of uh, method of evolution because we're seeing from the same uh, genetic elements viral elements we're seeing both beneficial and deleterious uh, effects um, Upgrading, up, up regulating, down regulating. Uh, out of the thousands of ERVs we have, there are 
literally just a handful of uh, like one or two that are absolutely necessary. Um, so, and all of the rest of them are not. Um, so that's way more consistent with the kind of shotgun approach of evolution where most of these are going to hit in places that are really not going to do much. They're going to be basically neutral. We're going to see all, uh, their function all over the place, um, going up and down, um, beneficial, uh, deleterious. That's not what we're going to see if we're looking at a perfectly designed genome. So, um, and then let's not forget that even in the best case, these are transposable elements that could not have possibly ended up in the same locations. Um, yeah. Is, Is that, that it? it? <laughs> Is that our final question? <laughs> we made it. Two and a half hours on just ERVs. I think that's that's pretty, you know, Snake, this might be the most comprehensive debate on endogenous retroviruses that, that exists. And I think this is an important topic. And I, for one, want to do more of these types of debates where we focus on one line of argument as compared to some of these debates where it's just a shotgun of, of arguments that, that we deal with. ERVs is an incredibly important topic, incredibly technical topic. And I'm glad that we had such a great audience on, on a very technical topic. So of course, let's do a round two where we can go over uh, some of the papers brought up, some of the arguments. Yeah, um, like I, I would I would even say, we go even more specific, like just talk about certain, like one or two a handful of papers at a time within a, at a very highly specific topic. So, cause, cause Why don't lot, I say at this point we've had the same, like, Oh, evolution versus creation debates, like hundreds of times. So I think the audience is ready for Amen. a little Amen. deep, Let's deeper dive there. Yeah. Let's uh, let's give them the meat and potatoes. So yeah. uh, ERVs is uh, to the evolutionist the uh, one of some say that the number one best evidence for evolution. So as a, as a creationist, I think, uh, you know, we should be tackling these, these types of debates and arguments. And I really, really enjoy this. I think this was a ton of fun snake. I'll send you uh, maybe a few of the papers that, that I brought up. You can look through them and, and pick which one you want to discuss specifically. And we'll, we'll do some type of follow-up discussion on, on those. So again, Taylor, thanks so much. Brandon, great job moderating, brother. You're a superstar. You're the man with the plan. Very impressive. So listen, so next time you guys debate, it's going to be a rigid timer. I'm going to bring a blowhorn. <laughs> and that's it. We had a kind of a second debate there at the end. Yeah, you did. We did. You yeah, did. That, I'm not sure who, who asked that question, but uh, kudos to you. <laughs> uh, your one question was a ripple effect into a whole nother debate <laughs> brandon go ahead as host uh closer down with with some closing words thoughts jokes you know i don't want to put you on the spot or anything but man i gotta tell you i i actually learned a lot from that debate uh not just from donnie but you as well taylor i, I think you're you know pretty well read in the topic and not a lot of people are it's just, it's one of those uh niche topics that's tough to get into um and in in and kind of stay, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. Like to keep it interesting where, you know, people don't find that topic interesting like some of the other things do, but it is really important. Like SFT mentioned a few times. So I appreciate the debate. I learned quite a bit uh, from the both of you. I think a, a second debate is going to be excellent. Um, I'd like to read some of the, uh, you know, studies both of you have looked at. I think it's some pretty good talking points and, Something I'm definitely interested. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to run too long. I guess I'll just remind everybody again, head over on the LPP's channel. If you want to experience what it's like to stand on the surface of the sun in a blazing inferno, you can have <laughs> that, that over there. <laughs> For me, I'm going to get some food and, uh, you know, get some beverages in me. And then I may just... Uh, 
head on over there after. Uh, this was a fun, engaging technical debate, so I'm definitely going to uh, relax for a bit and an important debate. So I appreciate the the prep, obviously, that, that you know Taylor put into this because to make for a nearly three-hour debate on ERVs is, is pretty awesome, and I had a ton of fun. So those are my final words. Uh, Taylor, final words from you? Yeah, it uh, depends on what the, the ladies in my house uh are feeling whether I, my my dog and my girlfriend uh, if I go over the after show or not. But uh, yeah, they're they're the boss for now. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Snake. Thank you so much to the audience for tuning in. I appreciate some some great um, engagement in, in the chat. Although I was debating, I didn't see a lot of it, but I look forward to uh, rewatching and, and getting some, I'm sure, laughs from the uh, from the side chat. One quick reminder, this Friday, we've got uh, Matt Slick, the great Trinity debate. He's taken on Otis Lewis. And on the Thursday, we've got the uh, the epic round two between uh, Kent Hovind and Wade the Wizard. So there's three heroic debates for you guys this week. So lots of fun. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not yet subscribed. And share around this content and share around this debate. It's an important topic, and I think this one was a ton of fun. So anyways, God bless. Stand for Truth is out. All right, welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your uh, I, I am your host and moderator for tonight's epic debate. My name is Donnie, and tonight we are debating the topic of evolution. This is the much anticipated debate on is there reasonable evidence for evolution? And before we get into the five minute opening statements, what I want to do is kind of break the ice a little bit, get to know. Uh, these debaters a bit, although they are no strangers uh, to debates and uh, this specific debate community. So Atheist Jr., it's been a little while since you've been here on the show. So uh, why don't we start with you? A little bit about yourself, how you've been, and also a little bit about your channel. Oh, I'm good, Donnie. Thank you so much. So uh, my channel is just mostly making response videos uh, about younger creationism, religion, um, and the way that I see that different people can use religion in a way that is harmful and the effects of younger creationism on our public school education system, on uh, our society in general, and having discussions with people, uh, religious and atheists, talking about faith, uh, life, and just different things. So it's pretty much it. Okay, well, AJ, I appreciate the introduction. Your channel is linked in the description box for people to check out. And uh, Kent, uh, over yeah. to you. Uh, you were just here uh, last night. You'll also be here again tomorrow. So you're a busy guy. When it comes to the channel itself, we've got four debates in three nights. So for the debate attic, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the summer of debate. So Kent, how you been? A little bit about yourself. How's everything at Dow? Well, my name is Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years, taught high school science and math 15 years. We have a ministry in Lenox, Alabama called Dinosaur Adventure Land, all about dinosaurs in the Bible and how stupid evolution is. For those who think they came from a rock, they need help and where to help them. People visit from all over the place to come see our place. It's all free. I've been sick for four days and I'm much, I feel much better, but I'm still coughing. So I apologize for that, but I'll try to do my best to minimize it. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to get Atheist uh, Jr. converted and get him into God's family. That'd be great. That's my goal for tonight. Well, Kent, I appreciate that uh, introduction there, brother, and glad to hear that, that you're feeling better. So no worries. No worries. Okay. Well, for the audience sake, uh, the format is going to be uh, relatively the same format that we'll that we've been doing over the last several debates. It's going to be more free flowing, easy going and, and organic in terms of the discussion, focusing on one topic or one question at a time. Uh, but before we do get into the discussion itself, we're going to do five minutes uh, intros just to kind of set the foundation for tonight's discussion on evolution. And uh, AJ, we will start with you. So I am going to give you the floor. For five minutes of course if you need to screen share let me know we can get those slides up there as well 
And uh, before I forget, as I'm getting your slides up there to the audience, uh, just make sure you're tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth. And that way, uh, that way I won't miss them. And also just give me a thumbs up in the live chat for the audience that is uh, letting me know that the audio video and, and everything is, is going good. So, okay. That being said, AJ, we're going to hand it to you for five minutes. All right. Uh, thanks, Donnie, for hosting this debate and Kent for agreeing to rematch. So the title of this debate is Evolution on Trial. Uh, is there re reasonable evidence for evolution? Of course, it's not on trial in the scientific community where there is no debate. At some point during this debate, you're going to hear Kent say that the purpose of this debate is for AJ to provide evidence for evolution. I'd like to see it. There's a lot to unpack in that statement, and there are some problems with it. Kent has already said that he will say until the day he dies, there is no evidence for evolution. So Kent's already made up his mind. He's decided, and Kent thinks that he's an authority on what is or is not scientific evidence. I'd like Kent to explain what gives him that authority. Why are they teaching this? I think when you teach the kids evolution, that is child abuse. You are lying to them to get them to believe a theory. There is no evidence for evolution. If you disagree with But there's also another problem. Me and Kent are talking about different things when we use the word evolution. When I say it, I'm referring to the scientifically accurate definition, which is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. This is the definition you'll find from Google. And evolution by natural selection is about biodiversity, and it encompasses microevolution, which is variation within a species, and macroevolution, which is variation between species. Now, Kent already says that he accepts microevolution, so that's half the battle right there. Although saying that you accept microevolution is still saying that you accept evolution. But my question is how can we debate on evolution if we can't even agree on a definition? So, Kent Hovind's quarter million dollar offers. Years ago, in the early 2000s, Kent posted an offer on his website claiming to offer a quarter million US dollars to anybody who could provide evidence for evolution. Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis commented, AIG would prefer that creationists refrained from gimmicks like this. But if you read the fine print when you actually went to go and claim that offer, you had to prove the following. You had to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the process of evolution is the only possible way the following observed phenomena could come into existence. Time, space, and matter. Planets and stars. Matter, which created life by itself. Early life forms learned to reproduce themselves. And, ma and that major changes occurred between these diverse life forms i.e. fish changed to amphibians, amphibians changed to reptiles, and reptiles changed to birds or mammals. So you have to assume that a god already exists, in which case he's omnipotent and could do anything he wants. So there's nothing, and you have to prove that God didn't do it this way. Another quote is, it is your job to prove what is being taught to our kids as fact. All six meanings of the word evolution above is indeed a fact. So is this the only thing that would qualify as evidence to Kent? On paper. Let's observe it. That's what science is. Get in the laboratory, make your chimpanzee, produce longer arms, longer arms, and turn to a human. That doesn't happen. So Kent wasn't looking for evidence back then, and he's not really looking for it in his debates either. That's why he defines evolution as starting with the creation of the entire universe instead of Earth having already been formed with life already on it. His definition is a straw man. He's conflating things that are not the same. He claims that evolution says that one animal gives birth to a different kind of animal. So he wants to make it seem like there's a legitimate debate in science between younger creationism and biological evolution by natural selection. That's why he reframes the definition of evolution to start with the creation of the universe. So my first question to Kent in this debate would be, what would you actually accept as evidence of evolution? Because 
he's been presented a lot of the similar lines of evidence many times. He's done almost 300 debates and he always hand waves away huge categories or huge scientific fields outright like paleontology. Just no fossil could possibly count as evidence. No fossil you could ever present can't counts as evidence. No DNA counts as evidence. So my question is, what would count as evidence? And that's where I'll end my statement. Okay, AJ, thank you so much. That was um, perfect timing, actually, between four and five minutes. And I do appreciate the visuals there. Let me get rid of the uh, full screen. Also, to the audience, I am all caught up on questions. And, of course, we've already got a big audience. So if you do have questions, just please make sure uh, you're tagging me. Okay. That being said, we're going to now hand it to Kent. Kent, you have equal time, five minutes for your intro, and we'll get into the discussion. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, it's good to uh, get to know a little bit about AJ. I looked at his channel for the first time today. It says he's five foot one. And April 21, at 21, he came out as online as bisexual. He's a makeup artist. So uh, it's good to know. And he sure likes to make fun of me on his channel. Most of my, most of his videos are about me. I'm living rent-free in his head. That's okay. So not a problem. Come visit our dinosaur adventure land where God gets the glory for his creation. We're in Lenox, Alabama. We'll get into that some other time. Okay. There's our science center. You can... <coughs> my objection is that the evolution, the textbooks teach the kids with charts like this, that humans and pine trees have a common ancestor with whales, which was a single cell creature. So it's way more than AJ wants you to think. It's just biological variations, you know, within the same kind, micro and macro. There's way more to it than that. I would like any evolutionist to answer the question. The standard definition of science is the knowledge man has accumulated by observation, experimentation, and testing. Nobody's ever observed a dog produce a non-dog or a cow produce a non-cow. Nobody's ever observed that. But the standard definition of science is observation. So why do, you put, why do you make these charts showing that the whale and the horse and the human and the pine tree have a common ancestor? This is not observed. This is not science. This is a religion. Evolution is a religion in every meaning of the word, okay? How do you define the word evolution? We'll get into that in a second. How do you define the word species? Charles Darwin's book titled The Origin of Species is really not what the argument is, okay? Uh, 20 times the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. So if they're able to bring forth, they're the same kind. There's 250 varieties of cows. Nearly all of them can interbreed and bring forth a calf. The cows and the pine trees cannot bring forth anything, okay? What's the best evidence for any plant or animal turning to a different kind? So I define evolution with six different meanings, and it drives guys like A.J. crazy. Uh, well, it's a short putt, not a drive, but okay. Cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. You guys have to have something to evolve. Where did time come from? Where did space come from? Where did matter come from? Then you have to have chemical evolution. If your Big Bang theory is true, which it's not, the Big Bang only produced hydrogen. Third theory of life's origin known as chemical evolution. Chemical evolution, Harvard University, okay? So you have to have chemical evolution, the formation of organic molecules. This has never been observed. It's not part of science. You don't have a complete theory. You guys want to skip this, I know, because it's, it's embarrassing because there's no answer for it because it didn't happen, okay? But chemical evolution, chemical evolution is found all over the place. That is an essential part. You have to have your Big Bang produce hydrogen. The hydrogen that has to turn into lithium and helium and all the different elements, all the way up to uranium, platinum, silver, gold, all that stuff. You can't fuse past iron. So <clears throat> then you have to have stellar evolution. The stars have to evolve and the planets. We're living on a pretty good sized planet, a little less than 8,000 miles in diameter. Where'd all this matter come from? Where, how did the planet form? Stellar evolution is all exactly part of the theory. Stellar evolution, stellar evolution. We don't know how a single star managed to form. They never have. No, nobody knows how a star forms. They dream about it. How do stars evolve? They have these imaginary life cycles, but that's not science. Then you have the origin of stars is an unsolved problem. AJ wants to skip all these, I know, and I know why, because they don't have an answer for it. But you don't have a complete theory, and you shouldn't be teaching it to the kids in school until you can explain all this stuff. How do stars evolve? No one knows how star formation proceeds. We see stars blow up once in a while, but we've never seen a star form. There's a lot of stars in the universe. 70 billion trillion, that 70 sextillion stars is the current estimate. That's the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones we don't know about. So there's a lot of stars out there. The Bible says God made them. I don't have a hard time believing that. Now, 
that's a religious belief on my part. I'm not asking everybody to pay for that to be taught, like you guys are asking for yours to be taught. But the Bible says clearly that God made the stars. So I believe that, okay? You guys think the stars made themselves from nothing. I think that's stupid, real stupid, okay? Should be 9.7 million new stars forming every minute for 13 million year, billion years. Never seen, never happened. Then you have organic evolution, the origin of life. How did life get started, AJ, from non-living material? That's an essential part of your theory, or organic evolution. It, it, there's nobody's got an answer for this. If it if it's so easy to make life non-material, non non-living material come alive, do it again in the laboratory. I want to watch it this time. Nobody knows how chemicals turned into a living cell. Then we talk about that for a long time. Then you finally have what we call macroevolution, variations changing from one kind of animal to another. That one's never been observed. Macroevolution. All we have ever observed is what we sometimes call microevolution, and I don't like that word, it's a bad term. We see dogs produce a variety of dogs. They're still dog. Where's the evidence of a dog coming from a non-dog? I challenge you to show me that tonight. Thank you, Mike. Okay, there we go. Five minutes uh, on the dot from the both of you. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for giving me an, an easy job tonight so far, that is. Okay, well, we're jumping into just a free-flowing uh, discussion now, focusing on one question and one topic at a time. I'm looking forward to this. This should be fun. Okay, AJ, we're going to hand it to you since Kent just ended with his five minutes, and we'll let you uh, choose the direction uh, that, that we should take for, for the discussion. Go ahead. Okay, could you show my uh, screen share again? So uh, Kent said that he's not trying to get uh, his theory of younger creationism taught in public school, taught in public schools. But I would like to play these video clips to refute that. Buy a stack of these from our ministry and pass them out to every kid, and say, "Kid, I'll give you ten dollars if you'll watch this." This one right here has helped tens of hundreds of thousands of public school kids. It's also part of our seminar series, if you want to get the whole thing for 50. Bert can help you get creation materials into your public school libraries. So he's just wrong when he says that he's not trying to get younger creationism into the public school. That's not true. But it was an impressive gish gallop that Kent went on for the past five minutes. Kent complains in every single debate, he accuses the other person of bringing up multiple topics. And yet his definition of evolution, like you just saw, is six topics at once. We went to star formation, abiogenesis, macroevolution, microevolution, chemical formation, element formation, and planet formation. That's more than one topic. So I'm not sure how Kent can justify constantly saying one topic at a time when he says, let's debate evolution, and he brings up six different scientific fields. Okay, Donnie, do I get a chance yeah, to respond? That, He's already of got course, two things. Yeah that, was a, yeah, that was a minute and 20 seconds, so go ahead. Well, Ken. it's a free-flowing discussion. Forget the time. He's already got two, top, two topics going that I, don't want, uh, I do want creation taught in public schools, and now about the definition of the meaning of the word evolution. AJ, your religion of evolution is the only thing taught in public schools. It is a religion. None of these five have ever been observed. It is a religion, but it is taught. So I want all the public school kids to be able to see both sides. I think all the teachers should see both sides. I think they should simply avoid the topic of origins altogether. It, evolution has nothing to do with biology. You can teach the kids all the bones and the tendons and the muscles and the ligaments and the organs and the functions without mentioning evolution at all. But you guys who believe you came from a rock will not leave that out. You want to sneak that into biology class. Evolution has nothing to do with biology. So since you've got it in there, I think all the schools either teach both sides or teach neither. But right now, it's not that way. All the schools teach only one religion, and that's the religion of evolution. Yes, I think that's wrong. I think that's evil. I think you guys who believe you came from a rock should go start your own private school and teach it to those who wish to pay and come learn it. But I resent paying, and everybody else that I know of resents paying for property taxes, which go toward the public schools when they teach a religion of evolution. It does not belong in schools. So as far as uh, creationism in schools, if you're going to teach evolution, then yes, we should better get both in there. Otherwise, take evolution out. I'll be happy. So you do want younger creationism taught in public schools? No, I don't think there should even be public schools. But if there are, they shouldn't teach evolution. 
listen to me, if they're going to teach evolution, then yes, they should show all sides. Well, they are you teaching evolution. You want exclusive rights to the kids' brains to make them believe like you believe, that there's no God, we gave it from a dot of nothing exploding. That's not science. So I have said many times, if we're going to have public schools at all, they should avoid the topic of origins. Since they don't want to do that, well, the other option is teach both. Either teach both or teach neither. How, what do you not understand about that? I understand that you're saying if they te are going to teach evolution, which we do, although I live in Texas and they didn't teach evolution when I was in high school because creationist activists you know, flooded the judges with Republican senators. Um, but you're saying if they do teach evolution, then we should teach both. So you do want creationism taught in young earth in, in school. You just said it and you just said it in the clips I showed. Okay, I'll say it again. If we're going to teach origins at all, which is unnecessary which for biology, then yeah, teach both or teach neither. What is going on right now is completely one-sided. It's not fair. Does it, would, you be a, would you be concerned about students learning about creation? Does that bother you? Uh, yes, I would. Why? Because creationism is based on one specific version of Christianity. And I don't think that one specific religion should be taught in a public school over all other religions. I mean, would you be uh, comfortable if Muslim creation was taught in a public school? AJ, that's what they're doing now. They're teaching this stupid religion right here in all the public schools. It is a religious belief. Do you believe you are related to uh, seaweed like this chart shows? Well, hold on a second. One topic at a time, Kent. Okay. Well, this is the religion that's being taught. This chart is nothing but religious. Nobody's ever seen a frog produce a non-frog or a whale produce a non-whale, but they've got lines on paper connecting them back to an amoeba. This isn't science. Nobody's ever seen an amoeba produce a non-amoeba. Never. But they got an amoeba leading to a human and a pine tree and a frog and a scorpion. Do you believe you're related to seaweed like this chart shows? Is this your religious belief right here? Well, I've never seen a mountain form in front of me. Does that mean that mountains don't form or aren't forming now? So you're avoiding the question by saying, well, maybe it happens yes. too slowly to see. Okay. Do you believe no. an amoeba turned into a human over billions? I'll give you tr quadrillions of years. Would an amoeba ever turn to a human? Do you believe that? No, I don't believe that. Well, then why, you let, why do you like charts like this in our school system? This is not science. This is pure propaganda. Yes, you didn't this answer is my religion. question. What now? You didn't answer my question. If I, if, I can't see, if I can't see a mountain form in my lifetime, does that mean that mountains don't form or aren't forming? Well, that's a straw man. You're drawing attention away from the obvious here. That's a non-living material. Rock formation. We know how rocks and continents are moving and uplift and uh, continent. Subduction, plate subduction. Yes, I understand that thoroughly. I taught her science 15 years. But this, we don't see. We can see examples of mountains forming. We can see some happening rapidly. Either whether it be uh, <coughs> the various different mountain building processes with igneous rock or metamorphic rock, I understand. But this chart shows an amoeba turning to a human, and nobody's ever seen that. But you're trying to avoid answering the simple question by saying, what about mountains forming? You're diverting attention. Do you believe the amoeba turned to a human and you are related to seaweed like this picture shows? Do you believe no. that? Just a yes or no? No. You don't believe you're related to seaweed? Good. Well, then would you help me get this kind of stuff out of the textbooks? That wasn't this the isn't question. Science. What now? That wasn't the question, Kent. Are you saying that that chart says that the earliest single-celled organisms were modern amoeba? Well, they're showing a single-celled creature. Let's see. Uh, I got all kinds of charts here. The family tree. Oh, no, geologic column. Uh, I got 20 million slides here. But the textbooks are full of this kind of stuff. The, there you go. These family trees, 85, shows humans and <coughs> Australopithecines and Homo erectus all connected by lines to a common ancestor. Do you believe you're related to a lemur? Would that be a simpler question maybe you can answer? Yes, but I want to stay on the question previously because okay. the this earliest is a religious single... belief, you want, you want your religion taught in the schools. 
I resent that. Go start a private school. It's easy in Texas. Start a private school and teach the kid, hey, you're related to a, a, a monkey. Teach them that. But that's not science. They show this kind of stuff, and it's pure propaganda. This is a religious belief. Here we go. Single-celled creatures turning into humans. It happens. It's in all the books. I okay, think this is no, there's nothing scientific about these charts. Nothing. This one shows the birds, the reptiles, and the mammals have a common ancestor. Wow. You believe you're related to a snake. Chart says okay. you are. One topic at a time, Kent. So the okay. earliest single-celled organisms were not amoebas, not in the slightest. Okay. Amoebas okay. are super specialized creatures. Amoebas are highly derived eukaryotes. The first cells, first single-celled organisms were anaerobic prokaryotes. So, and how do you know that? Because of the taxonomy. Well, you're using a big word there. So because we can put this thing into a chart and, and call it, uh, and, and claim it happened, claim it came from that, therefore it's science. It's not. We don't see this happen. No single-celled creature has ever been observed, whether it be amoeba or a eukaryote of any kind. No, but no single-celled creature has ever been observed turning into anything else. It's not observed. E. coli has a generation time that's really short. I think you get five or six generations per day. We've watched it for years and years. It never produces anything but E. coli. Do you believe a single-celled creature turned into all the creatures that we see today? Do you believe these kind of charts are, is, is this science or is this a religion? No, I don't think that a single-celled creature turned into multiple different animals. Because you're talking about one single-celled organism that turning into a bunch of other animals. That's not what evolution describes. It is exactly what they say, that single-celled creatures slowly turned into humans and bears and starfish. This is what they teach, and this is my point. And you're trying to very skillfully avoid answering the simple question. Do you believe these charts are religious? Is this science? Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Nobody's ever seen a monkey produce a non-monkey, or a chimpanzee produce a non-chimpanzee, or a baboon produce a non-baboon. Nobody's ever seen a human produce a non-human. Nobody's ever seen a, a single-celled creature produce anything other than same kind. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind, but you wish to believe, capital B, believe, that all the life forms came from a common ancestor, and I'm just saying most people with a brain resent that and think it's a religious belief, and you want your religion taught at taxpayer expense and nobody else's religion taught. So if you're going to teach yours, then I'm going to try to get mine into the schools any way I can. I'm going to pass out DVDs. I want every kid every teacher to know the truth. So when the textbook says, well, you're related to an amoeba, uh, they'll all laugh at it. That's the best we can do right now. Well, thank and, you and for before admitting. Before you respond, AJ, I want to give you plenty of time. I've just okay. now got about 20, at least 20 people in the chat saying that uh, we should keep it on topic as much as possible. Not saying that this uh, isn't a fantastic discussion so far, but again, you know, what is the best evidence for evolution or is there reasonable evidence for evolution? So maybe let's, let's try and uh, shift our focus e even slightly if we can. Gentlemen, go ahead. Okay. Well, I have some slides uh, of evidence. But real quick, uh, I would just like to ask, Kent, what do you mean uh, when you say we've never seen a dog produce a non-dog? What do you mean by produce? That means have babies, have sex, produce a baby. Only happens with male, female, by the way. But go ahead. So um, does that mean that you think evolution teaches that a dog could give birth to something like a cat? Evolution, the charts show very clearly that dogs came from something that was non-dog. That's what they show. I don't think that's science. I think that's pure religion. This one shows mammals like humans and birds coming from a common ancestor and crocodiles. That's not science. But you know that those charts aren't talking about an animal giving birth to another animal. Do you think the ancestral amphibian at the bottom of this chart slowly over millions of generations gradually gave birth to humans? No, and we, that, that's not possible to gradually give birth to something over millions of oh, generations. Brother, you can't be this dumb, AJ. You know full well what I'm talking about. Your textbooks teach that all the animals slowly change to other things. Slowly, bit by bit, this early reptile turned to a bird. This is what the charts show, whether it took one generation or 10,000 generations. Nobody's ever seen a reptile produce a non-reptile at all. This one shows 
birds coming from reptiles. That's not science. Not even common on. sense. You're conflating two different things because on one hand, you're talking about an animal giving birth to, to its offspring. And then you're comparing that to charts that talk about changes over millions of years with populations of animals over many generations. Okay. So you're conflating so, these two different things. So you believe the birds gradually turn, reptiles gradually turn to birds over millions of generations. Where is the scientific evidence for this? Nobody's ever seen any of it. It's imagination. That's all you have is SpongeBob imagination. Give me your address. I'll send you one. You need one. We'll keep on your dresser. Just I'm not going to give you. I'm not going to give you my address, Kent, because you'll give it out like you gave my last name. So give me um, a, give me a post office box, then. I don't care. I'm not. Believe me, I'm not stalking anybody. I want to get you converted. You believe one of the dumbest religions in the history of the world. Nobody's ever seen any animal or plant produce offspring that would be considered a different kind by anybody with one functioning brain cell. It just doesn't happen. Only in your imagination. Happens so slowly we don't see it happening. Well, science is what we can observe, study, test, demonstrate. Do it in the laboratory. Get a bunch of reptiles and slowly turn them into birds again. Turn a reptile scale into a feather. Just start with that. Let alone the hearts are different, the lungs are different, the reproductive system different, the DNA different. Just the scales turning to feathers. It doesn't, it's not science. It's all you, you believe in it, and I admire your faith, but your faith is misplaced. These charts are not science. They're propaganda. That's all I'm saying. They got them all lined up here going back to a common ancestor. Do you believe kids should be taught stuff like this? Should this chart be included in a public school textbook? Sure. But it's a good thing that you mentioned that. Can, uh, Donnie, can you show my screen share again? Yes. Uh, this yeah. is actually relevant to the slides I, I prepared. So feathered animals uh, did evolve from animals with scales and feathers as well as hair and fingernails are made of the same protein as okay. scales. One, one topic at a time. You're, you're making a statement there. Put it back up if you can. Feathered animals evolve from animals with scales. This is propaganda. This is not science. Nobody's ever seen any feathered, uh, any animal with scales produce anything other than babies with scales. So where's the science? You're claiming this is evidence by making a statement. That's not evidence. I'd like to see this happen. Where is the scientific example of any animal with a scale having a, feather, a scale slowly change into what looks like was going to be a feather? Where's the science for this? You making the statement isn't science. This is propaganda. Well, if you would let me finish, then I would okay. get to my evidence. Go ahead. Go ahead. So where's the evidence? On, on the left, we have uh, a picture of the common roach, which is a fish that has scales. And on the right, we have a snake uh, that also has scales. So this is a fish and a reptile. And here we have a close up of a pangolin, which is actually a mammal. So if you look at the structure of the feather, you can see that it's actually got a lot of similarities with pangolin scales. So feathers are a specialized type of scale. Human hairs are also, in effect, modified from scales. So are fingernails. So scientists actually did uh, a experiment where they were able to turn scales into feathers by turning on and off key molecular circuits at critical stages of scale growth and development. So uh, they were able to put, they were able to take the uh, embryo of an alligator and add a chemical to it and start growing feathers. So this has actually been done in the lab. Scientists in the have lab. converted Does that scales. Therefore, mean it did happen in nature. That's your evidence. You said that it's only science if we observe it. So this is science according to you because it's been observed. Well, it's been observed that people can put nuts and bolts and, and parts together and make a car. But the question is, can the car make itself? You're claiming, and I'd like to see the evidence. I'd like to read, read up carefully on what they actually did in the laboratory. You're claiming that they turned f scales into feathers. I don't believe you for one second, okay? But if they could do such a thing, again, that wouldn't prove it happened by itself in nature. I got pictures here someplace of the scales and feathers. Uh, you can put your feather, your picture back up of the feather. Feathers are incredibly complicated. 
they have little barbules that hook together so that the, 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 it locks together and makes one coherent unit like a parachute so the bird can fly. And if you think scales, you compared the pangolin scales and some other scales, sure, a lot of animals have scales. So, some have different types of scales. They're designed to have scales that work for what they need to work with. But nobody's ever seen a scale turn to a feather. Nobody's ever seen this happen. You believe it, which is fine. I admire your religion, but you don't have science to back that up. There's no scientific evidence in nature of a scale turning to a feather. You just believe it and you expect everybody to pay for it and be happy about it. I'm sorry, I'm not happy about it. Uh, well, well, you, um, Dinosaur Adventureland is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so you don't have to pay property taxes. So your, your property taxes don't go to the public schools, so you're not paying for evolution to be taught. Are the atheist, are the atheist organizations also uh, tax exempt? Many of them are nonprofits, yes. Okay, there you go. Thank you, sir. So I've got so many slides here to get, but if you believe scales turn to feathers, this would only be one of 10 trillion changes to turn a reptile to a bird, okay? And it's not observed. But if you believe that, that's fine. But my point is, this is not part of science. It shouldn't be taught in schools. It's part of a religious belief. But they got the charts here showing, here we go, uh, all the charts, the family trees, show all these creatures changing to something else. Nobody ever observes this in the laboratory. To make it happen in the laboratory is like a bunch of carpenters making a house. That takes intelligent input. We don't see it. Uh, so I'm sorry, what you have demonstrated is clearly to the audience, I think, that you believe reptiles turn to birds. Okay, believe all you want. My point is, that's not science. Science is what we observe. All the reptiles every, everybody's ever seen make babies and make babies that turn out to be the same kind. I mean, a four-year-old will tell you it's the same kind. Snakes have baby snakes. Lizards have baby lizards. They don't change at all, slowly, gradually, at all. None. I can't find my slides right now, but anyway. So you had a great picture there of yourself, of the, how complicated the feather is with the little barbules that hook together. That's why the birds have to preen their feathers. Uh, some of the, many of the feathers are the flight feathers. The shaft is off center. One side's longer than the other. So it opens and closes like Venetian blinds. On the upstroke, when they lift their wing up, the feathers open to let the air go through. On the downstroke, the feathers close like Venetian blinds. How long did that take to evolve? Flight feathers and contour feathers for the body are, are very different, and warmth feathers. So the, just the feathers, and so complicated. I just think you guys ought to admit, you know, we believe by faith that animals can change to something else, but we really don't have any science to back it up. I wish you guys could see it's a religious belief, but you don't believe, you, you want us to pay for that to be taught. I'm sorry, not, not, uh, not cheerfully for me. So meanwhile, we will get my videos into every public school we can, every school teacher, Thousands and thousands and thousands of public school teachers and students do not believe this propaganda like these charts show. And I, I encourage the kids, if this comes up on the test and they say, boys and girls, did reptiles turn to birds? You could say, kids, the textbook says blah, 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 but I don't believe it for a second. Not a thing they can do about that. This is not science. This is propaganda. Okay. So and I know... I know you'd rather your propaganda was in the public schools than that, but animals, <laughs> reptiles are just air breathing vertebrates that are covered in scales, bony plates or a combination of both. So birds are reptiles the same way that, um, everything descended from a vertebrate is a vertebrate. A bird is a reptile. So I don't know why you're saying that we've never seen a reptile turn into a bird. Like birds are reptiles. How can you make such a statement? How far did you get through school anyway? You think birds are reptiles. I'm going to quote you on that. Sure. How do we classify any animals then? Well, you can I don't start think you find by... A, I, don't think, I don't think you find any biologist with an IQ above five that would say birds are reptiles. You can believe that if you want. Birds are birds. Most can fly. Some cannot. We got some emus here that can't fly. Ostriches can't fly. But they're flight, flying birds. There are lots of different kinds of birds, and they are not reptiles. This crazy textbook here says animals, fungi, and plants are related. Do you believe whales are related to pine trees? That's what the kids are taught. This isn't science. This is propaganda. So you think reptiles, birds are reptiles. Don't teach my kids that. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, 
you can Google it for one thing, but it's the way that you classify animals. This is a, what Carlos, Le, Carlos Linnaeus uh, first tried to answer that question by starting with the morphology or how animals look and, and organizing it by that. But then cr pretty quickly you find out that that's not specific enough and you have to get into the genetics. The genetic similarities between two populations of organisms are how scientists tell how closely related they are. Like dogs right. and wolves have a lot of similarities in their in their <coughs> in their nucleotide sequence. Right. Okay, just because they look similar doesn't mean they are related. They might have had the same designer. They use the same design over and over again. The Honda Accord and the Honda Prelude and the Honda Civic have a lot of similarities because Honda is designing and building all of them. So if there are some similarities, it does not prove common relationship. In your mind, it might, and you might be stuck in that rut, and that's the only way you can see it. But I think most folks say, wow, that must have had a common designer. We got two arms. A lot of animals have two arms and two legs. Great, that's a great idea, works good. Two eyes to get binocular vision. It doesn't prove any relationship. Why would you think that proves a relationship? We never see humans produce non-humans. But yet you believe humans came from, uh, there it is, an amoeba. Nope, what do we got here? Yep. Bacteria, amoeba. This chart is in all the, is in many of the textbooks. I got them right here beside me here. This isn't science. This is propaganda. The burden of proof is on you tonight. Where's the evidence for evolution? Where's the evidence of any animal or plant ever producing babies that were different than itself? And to say it happens too slowly to see, you're admitting there's no evidence. Well, there's no evidence of dogs giving birth to cats. I'll admit that because that's what you seem to think evolution is. Evolution doesn't suggest that an animal like a dog will give birth to something like a cat because of an evolutionary law called the law of monophyly. Animals are always going to be in the same category that every one of their ancestors was. That's okay, like I good. said, why a vertebrate is always going to produce a vertebrate. Well, hold it. Amoebas don't have backbones at all. Somewhere along the line, the single cell creatures without a backbone produced a backbone. So your law of monophyly, you're talking out of both sides of your face here. Which is it? Is the animal that never has a backbone like an amoeba or a single cell creature going to somehow produce one with a backbone now? Which is it, AJ? No, I, like I said, the very first Single-celled organisms were not amoeba. They were eukaryotic single-celled organisms. And if you go down the line to humans, humans are still eukaryotes. So okay, just wait, like wait. every one of did its that, ancestors was a eukaryote. Did that first single-celled creature, whether it be amoeba or whatever you want to call it did, it, did it have a backbone? Did the single-celled creature have a backbone? Did a single-celled organism have a spine? Did no, the original... Kent, it didn't. The single-celled organism didn't have a spine. Good. But you think it turned into a creature like us with a spine. No, I don't. Well, that's what I you just I don't think it said. turned into anything. It doesn't transform into a human. You seem to think that well, a single-celled organism can magically shapeshift into a full-blown human. The law of monophyly says they stay within their same clade or whatever word you want to use. Well, the one without a backbone... Didn't stay there, did he? He grew a backbone somewhere over millions and billions of generations. So the law of monophyly, which is it? Do you believe the law of monophyly or do you believe in evolution? The law of monophyly is an evolutionary law. Not if the creature without a backbone grew a backbone. Okay, but you were, we're talking about giving birth. So an, a vertebrate is not going to give birth to an invertebrate. So did the invertebrate over millions of generations develop a backbone. What invertebrate? What what you mean? The, 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 the original single cell creature was an invertebrate, didn't have a backbone. Now we have a backbone. So I said, nobody's ever seen any animal produce anything other than its kind. But somewhere along the line, that single cell creature without a backbone over millions of generations, slowly grew a back. What good is 1% of a backbone or half percent of a backbone? And where's the evidence for this? It's not science. You have a religious belief. It didn't, it didn't give birth to an animal with a backbone, though, did it? Do you believe it gave birth to an animal that had 0.01% of a backbone? And then the next one, no. maybe five generations later, had 0.02%. 
You believe no, it's slowly not how developed the back? You have a backbone, I'm assuming. So did you come from an invertebrate that didn't have a backbone? And if so, how did you get the backbone? I got it because of the DNA that my parents bestowed upon me from my mom and dad. They were vertebrates. So I, too, am a vertebrate because my mom gave birth to me. Correct. What about go back a thousand generations? Great, 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 great grandpa. Did they have a backbone? That's not what the law of monophyly talks about. It talks about one organism producing another organism giving birth. That's why I said you're conflating and you're doing it right now. You're conflating one animal giving birth to another, one generation, and millions of generations. Okay. I, simple question. Over millions, uh, over billions of generations, did the single-celled creature, whatever kind it was, the invertebrate, slowly grow a backbone? If so, no. where? It didn't grow believe, a backbone. How many of you here can believe that is what he is saying or trying not to say? He does believe an invertebrate came to in, turned into a vertebrate over many generations, isn't how, how did it? Happen? Is that what this chart is showing right here? How did it happen? How did we end up getting a backbone? Okay, so I guess I, I, I to be fair, I answered your question no, because I'm talking about a single celled organism growing a backbone. But to be fair, yeah, okay, what I'm saying is that yes, down the line over a long of generations, you could say that a animal with a backbone came from one that didn't but it didn't give birth to one in well, one that, generation. That's what okay. I'm saying. That violates your law of monophyly. No, they it doesn't. They will always be in their same clade. Yes, it does, AJ. You can't have it both ways. You don't even see that you're trying to talk out of both sides of your head. You don't even see it. You're blinded. I, I'm, I can't help you on that, but I think the audience can see it. This chart shows a single-celled creature, whatever kind you want it to be, an amoeba or bacteria or some kind of single-celled creature, slowly becoming... Everything, humans, dinosaurs, birds, bears, it's all on the chart. My point is, this isn't science, but this is what is taught. And the purpose of this debate is for you to say, here's the evidence for why stuff like this should be taught. Where's the evidence for, th this is evolution right here, the tree of life. Textbooks are full of them, and it's baloney. It's not science. I don't know if I can take questions from my audience or not, but... Uh, he does. Well, I, I, actually, I'm going to jump in, Kent. Let, actually, let's just make sure it's between the debaters. Uh, AJ, sure. I noticed you wanted to share your screen. Was there another uh, line of evidence you now wanted to? We went back and forth on that one for about 12 minutes. Maybe we should uh, jump into another. Um, I, I can share your screen if that's what you wanted, AJ, or however you want to proceed. Go ahead, guys. Great discussion so far. Yeah, if that's okay, I'd like to talk about uh, kinds for just a second. Um, so what is a kind? Let's find out. So Kent says that the definition of a kind is two animals that can interbreed. Bible says this 10 times in the first chapter, and a dog cannot produce a non-dog because they would be a different kind, like we just went over. But what about squirrels? So the Kaibab squirrel is separated by the Grand Canyon from the Abert squirrel. And these two squirrel populations, because evolution is about population genetics, have been separated long enough to where they cannot interbreed and produce fertile offspring anymore. It's not because of any physical limitations. They, their genetics will not allow them to interbreed if they tried. So I just have a few questions for Kent. Um, do you agree that animals can change over time? I think the animals can change wildly within limits. I think they're both still a squirrel and a four-year-old will tell you that. Now, whether they're interfertile or not for genetic reasons or biological reasons or mechanical reasons, there's all kinds of reasons creatures cannot be fertile, but that does not they're still the same kind. Yes, the Abert squirrel and the uh, uh, Kaibab squirrel are still squirrels. Okay. Um, well, can this be caused by natural selection, this change? Nature can select which ones survive. That happens all the time. You turn all the dogs in the world loose in Alaska, the ones with short fur aren't going to survive. Your nature is going to select the long-haired dogs to survive in Alaska. It's not going to create long hair. It's going to select that part of the population. That's all it does. Natural selection selects. You want to give it creative power. I'm sorry. It doesn't create anything. It can only select. And it works fine. Yes, I believe in natural selection. Okay. 
Uh, well, and then can this produce animals that can't interbreed anymore? This process. I think that yes. I think at the extremes of the kind, there might be some that can no longer interbreed. The Great Dane and the Chihuahua would have a difficult time, but they're still dog. To a, a four-year-old will tell you that, and that is not evidence that the dogs, the Great Dane and the Chihuahua, both came from a rock. Not evidence at all. You guys want to take that the examples like this, like the uh, squirrels and say, see, that proves we came from a rock, which is what your religion teaches. And that's not science. I got the Abert squirrel stuff right here. I'm looking for my slides. But, uh, so yes, I believe natural selection works just great. And it only selects, doesn't create a thing. You want to give it creative power. OK, so you do um, agree with me that one population of squirrels can, over time, because of variations produce two populations of squirrels that can no longer interbreed. Would you agree that this same population, this new population, let's call this one the Kaibab squirrel on the left, do you think that this population can also produce two populations of squirrels that can no longer interbreed with each other? Possibly over generations that could happen. Now, did they come from two squirrels as parents? Every one of them yeah. came from parents that were two squirrels, no exceptions. Now, if they eventually get to the point where they can no longer interbreed, which happens, uh, that's still a squirrel. Uh, I think we see this happen all the time in just about every type of life form, whether it be potatoes or squirrels or pine trees, variations certainly happen. And sometimes they get pretty bizarre. Finally, I got it, uh, 1396, okay, 1396. That's what's happened with horses, for example. There are some okay. that are no longer interfertile. You got itty bitty horses and great big horses, and they're still horses. So the Kaibab squirrel, the Abert squirrel, we've got uh, eight of them in our museum, I think, stuffed and mounted up here, someone gave us. They're still squirrel. Now, whether they well, can interbreed or not, <clears throat> not after they're stuffed and mounted, they can't. But before that, they might have been able to. I don't know. Well, Kent, you know what this image reminds me of? The tree of life. Wait. So this same process oh. you just described is the same process that is described by hey, evolution. Wow. Back up one slide. Back up one slide. Okay. You have seven different kinds of squirrels. And so that reminds you that going to go one more, advance one more. So because you see seven kinds of squirrels, therefore, sunflowers are related to kangaroos. Do you believe sunflowers are related to kangaroos? Sure. I said okay. it reminds me of this image because of the shape of animals diversifying into other populations like the fish here. So this same process extrapolated over every living, living organism, that's what evolution is, is, is describing. So okay. my question would just be, where's the cutoff point where this is no longer science? Like let's the start with the point, fish. If, the cutoff point is where they can no longer interbreed. <laughs> These squirrels that you showed all originally had a common ancestor called a squirrel. And if that's enough to you for you to believe that a squirrel and a sunflower are related, you need some real serious psychological help. I think we see a variety of owls. 225 owl species have now been identified. Okay, pretty impressive. Eight varieties of bears now been identified. Okay, different kinds of fish. Okay, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage all came from an original mustard plant. They were mostly selectively bred by man, but they're still a plant. But you want to think because of this variation we see, therefore, mustard plant is related to a whale. How can you not see you've gone bonkers on this, taking the little variations, which are science and extrapolating in your mind to believe all this family tree stuff? I don't care that you believe that. I do care that you want to force that down the throats of all the kids that I care about. Not science. Well, you also want to force your beliefs down the, the throats of kids, but and you admitted that. Um, but I, I'm curious. So you say that two animals are the same kind if they can interbreed, and yet these two squirrels that can't interbreed are the same kind because they had a common ancestor. I think anybody with IQ above five would say all the squirrels could have easily had a common ancestor. Now, have they diversified to where they can no longer interbreed? They're still the same kind. They're a squirrel. I think everybody would agree with that. 
You want to extrapolate that into thinking squirrels are related to watermelons, don't you? One topic at a time, Kent. Uh, Donnie, well, you, you, I'm done with my slides. Okay, this is the topic. Where is the border in your line? You said the law of monophyly, and yet a single cell creature without a backbone gradually, over trillions of generations, got a backbone. So do you believe the law of monophyly or not? Obviously you don't, but you don't even see that you don't. You got a backbone. The single cell creatures do not. So yes, wow. variations happen and they are limited. Nobody's ever seen a watermelon produce a non-watermelon. You might get a big one or a little one. There's now 50 varieties. Most have probably been created by man for a particular purpose. But the God said they'll bring forth after their kind. There are, what, five, a thousand varieties of mangoes. Whoa. They bring forth after their kind. 7,500 varieties of apples. But the squirrels I agree. can't this bring apple. forth anymore. They can't what bring now? forth anymore. These two squirrel populations can't bring forth anymore. So how are they the same kind? Okay. Well, if that's enough for you to believe squirrels and watermelons are related, you need help. Okay. You're picking at a little tiny straw. They, they could originally bring forth, I think all seven of those kinds of squirrels you showed had a common ancestor, which was a squirrel. I don't think that's evidence that squirrels are related to pine trees. But so, they cannot interbreed with pine trees, that's for sure. And squirrels and apples cannot interbreed. Let's see, squirrels and mangoes can't. Squirrels and watermelon can't. So I think it's, it's obvious to a kindergartner that's the same kind. 3,000 3, varieties of tomatoes. Wow. Might have had a common ancestor called a tomato. 1,000 types of bananas. Might have had a common ancestor called a banana. <coughs> but you <coughs> wildly imagine that bananas and whales are related. You think you're related to a banana, don't you, AJ? No. Are you, your chart you showed a minute ago of the family tree had bananas on there and humans with lines going back to a common ancestor. Okay, do you think you have a common ancestor with a banana? How's that? Bananas aren't living organisms. A banana bananas is the fruiting body of a organisms. banana plant. Hold it. Bananas aren't living organisms. No, a banana is the fruiting body of a banana plant or a banana tree. A banana by okay. itself is not a living organism that has relatives. So we're, <laughs> okay, let's try it again here. Um, let's take something simpler, watermelon. Is watermelon a living organism? Sure. But a banana is not. Okay, the purpose of the debate tonight is for you to show scientific evidence for why you believe in evolution. Do you believe, you, and you, you do believe, you, by your charts you showed, that you, are, you have a common ancestor with a watermelon. Where's the scientific evidence for that? Squirrels producing squirrels that can no longer interbreed, is that your best evidence? I didn't say that was evidence. That was me examining your own claim about kinds, which apparently is so easy to understand even though your definition has no consistency. So I didn't say that that was evidence that squirrel is related to any other animal. I was well, your talking about- Okay, your definition of monophyly doesn't make any sense either then. Because an animal without a backbone produced a backbone, didn't it? No. It didn't? No. Over millions of generations, it slowly produced a backbone. Sure. Okay. That's not science. That's a religious uh, belief. Wh wh why do you get to decide what is and isn't science? Oh, I'd rather have me decide it than you. Why do you get well, to I, decide what is science? I don't Who gave claim you this authority? I don't claim to have that authority. Why do you? I'm, I'm going by the definition of science for the last hundreds of years. What well, we can acknowledge, <coughs> the word science comes from the Latin word seer, which means to know. What do we know? We know squirrels produce squirrels. We know that. We do not know that squirrels and watermelons have a common ancestor. You can believe that. So science is knowledge, and look it up in dictionaries for the last 500 years. Knowledge gained by observation, experimentation, and testing. You'll tell you what, you can test it all you want. Get your squirrels, test them all you want in the laboratory, turn them into anything that anybody would consider a non-squirrel. Could you turn the squirrel into an oak tree or a watermelon or a human? 
or is it always going to be a squirrel? Well, what about uh, squirrels and chipmunks? Are they related? You didn't answer the question, but okay. I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt squirrels and chipmunks. They have a lot of design similarities. Same God made them all. But that doesn't prove they had a common ancestor. We've never seen squirrels and chipmunks interbreed. We see squirrels and squirrels interbreed. We got them in our trees by the hundreds around here. Uh, so, yeah, I think squirrels can make baby squirrels and nothing else. Chipmunks. Okay, well, well uh, man has been about... might have been, Some humans might have decided to put chipmunks and squirrels in the same family. We've divided animals up, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I don't think the squirrels care how we organize them. They don't care at all. They don't even think about it. We've decided squirrels and chipmunks are in the same family. Okay. Squirrel doesn't care that. Are they the same kind? No. Why is the kind any less arbitrary? Because God said it? God said 20 times in the first seven chapters, they will bring forth after their kind. I've chosen to believe that. That's all we've ever observed. I think that's science, but I'm not demanding that be taught. Yes, you are. I am? Okay. <laughs> you admitted it. And the Bible also says to stone homosexuals. Do you think that we should do that? The Bible says to stone homosexuals? Yeah. Is that the topic you want to get on now? Well, you're the, one that yeah, you're the one that brought up what God said. So I was just wondering oh. if, if well, you're God consistent said, with God that. God said quite a few things. We could bring that up if you'd like. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's stick to the evolution. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. I know why Kent would want to avoid that. Well, certainly homosexuals don't bring forth at all, if you know how it works. Okay? I've been married a long time. I, I know how it works. I taught biology and anatomy. Got it figured out really well. Okay? So they don't bring forth at all. But that's a different topic. We only have a debate on that if you'd like. But no, I don't think we should stone them. I think they should give their heart to the Lord and get saved. God can save them. Now, they may have hardened their heart where they don't want to be saved anymore. Okay. So back to the topic, though. Mangoes, apples, wasps, tomatoes, bananas, always bring forth after their kind. Yeah, you guys want to have these charts taught to the kids that animals and plants have a common ancestor. Where is the evidence of any animal ever producing something that would not be considered an animal? You want to connect animals and plants back to bacteria. This there, isn't science. There's no evidence of an animal giving birth to a plant, but there is evidence of common ancestry and that's the DNA. So the fact that they have plants and animals, some have similar DNA, is evidence they're related. Could it be evidence they have a common designer? Could it be evidence that God designed the plants so the animals could eat them and digest them? If they were too radically different, the brown cow couldn't eat the green grass and give the white milk and churn it and get the yellow butter and I eat it and get the blonde hair. I think it's an amazing network of all kinds of things work together. So sure, there are similarities in DNA, similarities in cell structure. So otherwise, we could only eat each other. Why is that? It's not that way. It's designed so that brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk. I think that's pretty cool. Are there similarities in DNA between the milk and the grass? Maybe so. Probably because... They're designed to work together. But you guys, we see, you see similarities and immediately conclude common ancestor. That's not common sense, let alone science. If I see similarities in two different books, I read different books by Shakespeare, and I see similarities between Macbeth and, you know, Romeo and Juliet, okay? Okay, so I see similarities. What's that mean? The same guy wrote the book. That's what it means. If we see similar DNA from a squirrel and a bat, it doesn't prove a common ancestor. The same guy wrote the code. The code to any living creature, any living creature's DNA code is more complex than the space shuttle. A single-celled amoeba, the DNA structure of an, one single cell is more complicated than the space shuttle. And you think it happened by chance with no designer. I feel sorry for you if you want to live that way, but that's not science. That's my whole point. All so, the leopards might have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue with that. Hybrid cats, they can crossbreed. Let's see, they can crossbreed jaguars and lions and get a jag lion. Wow, because they're still in the cat family. You can't crossbreed a jaguar with a pine tree. That I'd guarantee, or a watermelon or a bat. So they get all kinds of crossbreeding within the cat kind. Where exactly is the border in the biblical cat of kind? I don't know. I'm not asking that to be taught. 
Yes, but you, you guys are. see these varieties and say, see, that proves oak trees are related to tigers. That is, is, it, is real it my turn stupid, finally? And I wish you could see it. Go ahead. So you have a son, Kent Andrew, and a daughter, Marlissa. They have DNA similarities in the sequence of their genetic code. Is that proof that they have a common ancestor? Oh, yeah. Both of them have a common ancestor with their mother and I, and probably with grandma and great-grandma. I bet it goes back for hundreds of generations, and they were all human, every one of them. Doesn't go back to an amoeba, though, like you believe, or a single-celled creature, an invertebrate. So DNA similarities prove common ancestry. DNA similarities can be proven, <coughs> can give us a lot, of <coughs> a lot of evidence for a lot of different things. I think it's limited at some point. And like I said, if there are similarities in the DNA of the grass and the cow, maybe that's so the cow can eat the grass. If they were too wildly different, they couldn't digest it. We can't eat and digest rocks. That's pretty, pretty obvious. So I don't think the DNA of a rock exists at all. But if it's got DNA, which is a really complicated, I think that's indication somebody really smart wrote that code. The DNA code, you take the simplest life form you can think of, a single cell, anything, bacteria, eukaryote, it had a really complex DNA, more complex than the space shuttle. So if you wish to believe it happened by chance, that's great. That's not science. I wish you'd keep your religion home and not in our school system. Um, what, what do you mean when you say by chance, just that a God didn't do it? We don't ever see complex things happen by chance, just random yes, chance. We do. Yeah, we do. You do. You think, you think the DNA code could evolve, could develop itself over millions of generations and all the uh, parts of the DNA could be lined up and the uh, helical uh, chromosomes could work and they could learn to divide themselves with mitosis or meiosis. You think all that really happened with no designer involved? You really believe that? Well, that wasn't the, the question. The question was, can complex things happen because of chance? I mean, if you've ever heard of the butterfly effect, something like a hurricane can is extremely complex and it can be caused by a chance happening. Natural disasters can be caused by chance. If you have a system that's very simple, but you give it rules that are very rigid and eventually that complex that simple system will become very complex this is what happens in nature so a butterfly flapping his wings could cause a hurricane over someplace else <laughs> well, i don't think that that's literally what it means but that's the idea yeah i understand the butterfly effect and i think that this is not a living organism the hurricane isn't and the wing flapping is not moving a living organism it's just moving air so if you want to take the dna code of a bat, which is really complicated, it's always going to produce a baby bat. Now, there's 1,100 different species of bats have been identified. They're still bat. Nobody's seen them never produce a non-bat. But you wish to imagine, and that's why I say all you have is imagine over millions of generations. Just imagine. No, I want to see it. I want science. Your imagination evolution is not science. The whole purpose of this debate series is where's the evidence for evolution? You say, well, over you can't see the mountains growing. Yeah, I agree. And you can't see it gradually change from a single cell creature to a vertebrate. I agree. So Where it's not science. Where do we get to see this? Where do we see it? So geology isn't science then, by your definition? Geology is one branch of science. Evolution has nothing to do with that. Biology is another wonderful branch of science. I taught it for 15 years. But evolution has nothing to do with biology. Bio means life. Ology means study of, the study of living things. All we've studied and said, wow, there's a lot of different kinds of bats. They might have had a common ancestor, which was a bat. That's science. But you want to draw a chart saying the bat is related to the pine tree. That's not science. And I can't get you to see it. At least I can't get you to admit it. I think tonight you're starting to see it a little bit, and it bothers you. Because if I'm right, and there's a God who created these things, you may have to answer to him for some things. I'd like to get you ready for that. I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. But I got a savior to save me. Praise God. And he loves you and wants to save you. If you don't want him, okay. But he available, offers available. Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. Second Peter chapter 3.
I got to put your name in the margin of my Bible right there. Second Peter chapter three, because you're one of the scoffers. Yeah. You're scoffing and you're willingly ignorant of the creation. You just don't want to see it's so complicated. Had to be a God. Make it. OK, believe what you want. But it's not science. You have no scientific evidence of any animal or plant ever producing anything that any four year old would consider a different kind. Do you have a textbook that says that evolution says that dogs give birth to things that aren't dogs like cats? I can show you the charts from the textbook that say dogs came from something that wasn't dog. But that's but not giving birth. No, you, you see no. here you are. You're trying to hide. You, dogs always give birth to dogs. That's the law of monophyly. But the dog came from something that was non-dog long ago and far away, didn't it? So you don't, have a, you don't have a textbook that's, that says that evolution suggests that animals give birth to something that is not the same species. 1470. No, I've never said that. This one you, has You've said dogs. it multiple times in this debate. Okay. Top one o'clock on this chart here is a canine, the canine, canine family. This chart taught in public school textbooks is showing the canine is related to the human on the bottom at uh, say nine eight thirty on the on the thing here, and let's see we have the kangaroo, or marsupials, at about nine thirty ten o'clock. So do you believe dogs, kangaroos, and humans go back to a common ancestor like this chart shows? Dogs always produce dogs going forward, but apparently going backwards didn't work, did it? They came from something that was non-dog. Well, there's no, there's not a reverse process of giving birth, so I don't know. But I would answer yes to that question. Yes, animals have common ancestry. That's what evolution says. It doesn't say anything about dogs giving birth to cats. I didn't but say that said, either. Yes, you, had, you said it multiple this times in this debate. This chart has lines on the paper showing the dog and the cat having a common ancestor. Do you believe the dog and the cat had a common ancestor, AJ? Yes. Okay. Why do you believe that? Where's the evidence for that? The DNA, because the DNA, they have DNA similarities. That proves because common are, ancestry like you admitted earlier. So because there are DNA similarities, the only thing you can see is they got to have a common ancestor. But we don't ever see this happen. You can't even see that maybe they got the same designer. It's a pretty complex code. The DNA code of a cat and the DNA code of a dog might have a lot of similarities. They might have DNA code to tell them how to grow hair. I bet they do. And there might be cut, copy and paste. I think Microsoft PowerPoint and Microsoft Word have thousands of identical lines of code. I bet if I'm in PowerPoint and I click spell check, it takes me to the same dictionary as when I'm in Microsoft Word and I click spell check. Identical lines of code, whole dictionary. That doesn't prove they evolved. The same guys wrote the code. So if a dog and a cat both have a DNA code that tells them how to make hair and how to put a tail on the back and the nose on the front, that wouldn't prove a common ancestor. I think it proves some same designer wrote the code. This, this one has the dolphin at about three o'clock. Dolphin related to the horse and the bat and the elephant. This, my whole point is, this isn't science. This is propaganda. This is lying to the kids. They're claiming they've got evidence for this when we don't. We never see a dog produce a non-dog, but they think a dog came from the same ancestor as a, as a whale. I think that's propaganda. That's my whole point. I accept the facts that cows can be trained to jump. They have rodeos where they jump cows, okay? Therefore, if you make your cow work out, go to the gym, take a lot of vitamins, you could eventually get your cow to jump over the moon. This is what you believe, AJ. We see these little changes, therefore, everything's related. No, I bet there's a limit how high cows can jump. And I bet there's a limit to how far dogs can change. And I bet there's a limit to how far squirrels can change. What is you that might have limit? Found where they're no longer interfertile. Kaibab squirrel, a bird squirrel. I don't know that they're interfertile for biological reasons. I know for you know geographical reasons they are. But so what? It's still a squirrel. So the cow can jump higher and higher. Therefore, someday it'll jump over the moon. This is what you believe. That these changes are unlimited. And what this is, is where limit? you're crazy. The What's changes the are obviously limited. 
biologically, all of us, science, science is what we can observe and study and test. That's why my hammer, when I whack an atheist, science means knowledge. That's what the word means. Look it up. Latin word seer, to know. What do we know? We know there are limits to how high a cow can jump. Has they, have they reached that limit in the rodeo? I don't know. They might get one to jump a little higher next year, but they're never going to get one to jump over the moon. Have we reached the limit in dog size? Great Dane, Chihuahua, has that, have they reached the limit? Eh, probably getting close. They're never going to get a dog as big as Texas. I guarantee that. They're never going to get a dog as small as a flea. So have they reached the limit? I don't know. And actually, I don't care. But I think there's a limit. That's the whole point. You guys don't see the, there's a limit to all of these changes. There's 1,100. What is that limit? All the different varieties of watermelons. Is there a limit? You think they'll ever get a watermelon as big as Texas? What is the no. limit? What now? What is the limit that stops a dog from changing? What we, all we've observed is you get bigger dogs or smaller dogs through selective breeding, most of which would not survive in the wild by themselves. But okay, there's a limit somewhere. And have we reached the limit? Have they reached the limit in the 100 yard dash for man running 100 yard dash? I don't know, somebody may break the record someday, but it'll be by a hundredth of a second. I think they're getting close to the limit in most things in sports. They're never going to get somebody to throw a baseball 10 miles. They might have somebody throw one, you know, from left field to home plate and, and no bounce. That's a long throw. But are they ever going to throw one from Texas to California? No, I don't think they'll do that. There are limits to all these things, and you don't see it. You don't want to see well, it. Well, I can't see it because you can't tell me what the limit is for oh, dogs changing. Okay. So because I can't tell you what the limit is for how high a cow can jump, Therefore, it's not what I said. You think a cow could jump over the moon? Okay, it's Second Peter said. chapter 3, the scoffers who are willingly ignorant. Here we go. AJ, you just made it into God's word. Go ahead. What's your next point? Actually, before um, you do ask, AJ, and, and I don't want to, um, no, you know, go ahead. It's such a fast paced discussion that uh, I do want to inform you, gentlemen, that we do have. You know, we've had almost 400 people in the live chat, so we do have quite a few audience questions. Did we want to jump into maybe three minute? Uh, okay. Okay, let's do this in order to be fair in case, you know, maybe AJ, there's a couple points you wanted to make sure you got in there. Same with you, Kent. Let's do three minute uh, closings, if that's okay. Uh, three to five minutes, whatever you need there. And then we'll get into some audience questions. So uh, that was over an hour of open discussion. So great job, gentlemen. And AJ, why don't we start with you? three to five minutes and then uh, same for Kent and we'll get into some questions. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Donnie. And I want to say thank you to Kent for uh, doing this debate. I know we unfortunately had to reschedule uh, last time because Kent wasn't feeling good and I could tell that he's coughing a lot. So I appreciate Kent for sticking it out for the whole debate, seriously. Um, and I told Donnie that I would rather face Kent when he's at a hundred percent than do like a half a debate with him. So I, I do pre appreciate that fact. Um, although I don't think that Kent was able to answer some of my questions about what the limits are for dogs changing. You know, if a dog can only get as big as a Great Dane, what is the limit that stops it? He seems to be suggesting that it's something to do with physics, like the gravity will be too, you know, too strong for a dog to get bigger than that because its legs wouldn't be able to support its weight. I can understand a limit like that, but genetically, I don't see a limit to, you know, that suggested that we couldn't have a dog bigger than a Great Dane. That doesn't mean I think that we can have a dog as big as Texas because that's obviously ridiculous. Now, Kent was really talking out of both sides of his mouth, even though he accused me of that, of saying that he's not trying to get creationism taught in public schools when I show that he is, and he said it multiple times. He, in fact, he seems to relish the idea of putting his materials into the public schools he, because he's got a vendetta against evolution, even though he doesn't pay for it because he uh, operates a 501c3 nonprofit organization that does not pay property taxes, and yet he complains about having to pay property taxes and pay taxes that go to ev teaching evolution in public schools. It seems kind of hypocritical. But 
evolution is pretty simple. It's not as complicated as Kent makes it out to be. It's just microevolution, which is variation between species. You take that process and extrapolate it out. Small changes over time can lead to big changes, i.e. macroevolution or variation between species, which is speciation, just like Kent admitted happens with squirrel populations. You can have squirrels that, oh, sorry. You can have squirrels that get variations and changes over time, and then eventually they become so different that they can no longer interbreed. Well, that prop, and he says they're the same kind, even though they can't interbreed because they had a common ancestor. That's evolution. Flat out, that is evolution. Not what Kent's describing, this other ridiculous process that he says that a dog will give birth to a cat or a bottle of shampoo. That's not what evolution says. And he seems to be intentionally conflating these two things on purpose. So it was a good debate. And thank you to Donnie for hosting it. That's all for me. Okay, Atheist Jr., thank you so much. That was three minutes on the dot. And uh, Kent, we're going to give you the same amount of time, three to five minutes. Then we'll get into some audience questions. Kent, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Sure. I think there are limits on dog size. I think they might have reached it with the Great Dane. But there are animals bigger than that, like an elephant. You think I'll ever get a dog as big as an elephant? Let's forget Texas. No, they're never going to get one as big as an elephant. But there are animals that big. So the Bible says very clearly, 20 times in the first seven chapters, they will bring forth after their kind, after his kind, after his kind. Charlie Darwin wrote a book, The Origin of Species. Well, that's not the argument. A dog and a wolf are different species, but they're the same kind of animal. So there are six meanings to this word evolution, in spite of what AJ and others would like us to believe. There is no evidence whatsoever for cosmic evolution, a big bang. There's no evidence that time, space, and matter could create itself, which is what evolution has. Where did time come from? If the universe began 13.772 billion years ago, what was here 13.773 billion years ago? Where did time come from? Where did space come from? Where did matter come from? This is essential to have a coherent theory. Then you have to have the chemicals evolve. <laughs> we talked about that. <coughs> the Big Bang would produce hydrogen. Well, how do you get gold from hydrogen? I'd like to learn that one. Then you have to have the stars evolving. Nobody's ever seen a star form or a planet form. Then you have to have life get started from non-living material. At least, AJ, you guys could start with number four. How do you get living organisms from non-living material? Where is the scientific evidence? You can't even make it happen in the laboratory. And if they could make life in the laboratory, that would prove it takes intelligence to make life. Duh. That would prove creation, not evolution. Nobody's ever seen number five, macroevolution. Nobody's ever seen an animal produce a different kind of animal, even slowly. Like the uh, you carry, like the uh, single cell creatures they do in the laboratory uh, with thousands of generations observed by one lifetime. One observer can watch tens of thousands of generations of single cell creatures replicate, replicate, replicate. That's all they ever get, single cell creature, same kind. That's all they ever get. It's not science to say that that single cell creature slowly grew a backbone and turned to an elephant. Microevolution is a lousy word. We shouldn't use it, but they do. It's a variation within the same kind. Now that one is science. The first five are pure religion. So I stand my ground. Variations happen within the kind, but that's not really evolution. They shouldn't call it microevolution. They should call it a variety. That's all it is. It's all we've ever seen. You guys believe that humans and birds and reptiles and ladybugs have a common ancestor. Oh, and, and pine trees and worms. This is propaganda. This isn't science. Wish they'd quit teaching it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Kent. That was three minutes for your concluding statement. Uh, gentlemen, definitely a, uh, a debate to remember. So tons of fun in the free-flowing discussion style format. All right, let's get to uh, some of these 1,000 questions that have come in. And uh, we will start with, we've got a solid mix of questions for AJ and Kent. As you both know, I believe, uh, you know, you both can have responses to each question. We'll just make sure the uh, the qu the person who got the question gets the final word. So here we go. First question comes in from Luca Medugno. This one is uh, for you, Kent. 
And Luca asks, can you give an example of evolution that you would accept? Of course, just a hypothetical one, he says. Sure, I accept the idea that microevolution happens. I accept the idea that probably uh, the varieties of, let's take humans, there are dark-skinned humans and light-skinned humans. I believe they're, they probably had a common ancestor called a human. That's as far as it goes. I think there are probably 20 different varieties of horses and zebras that might have had a common ancestor. It had, had four hooves and four legs and tail on the back and nose on the front, and a recognizable as uh, equus. So I think variations within what I would consider the same kind are obvious, and they happen all the time. There's 115 different varieties of pine trees. Might have had a common ancestor called a pine tree. That is microevolution, if you want to use that word. I accept that. That's as far as it goes. There's no evidence it goes beyond that. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, AJ, go ahead if you had a response. Um, well, an example of evolution, uh, I would say Darwin's finches was the first uh, notable example of evolution or the, the big one. And when Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that finches that had been blown to different islands because of hurricane or, you know, strong winds had small changes based on, they had different beak size based on the environment that they lived in. So that would be my example. Thank you, AJ. Kent, you get the final word if you wanted it. I covered that very carefully in my video number four of my series about Darwin's observations. He found 14 varieties of finches on the islands. They had a common ancestor called a finch. They had different beak shapes because of the food supply on that island. Some islands only had b nuts to crack that were hard to crack. And so the heavy beaks survived. Skinny beak didn't survive. Didn't create the beak. Didn't create the heavy beak. It didn't give them a jackhammer or a, a pliers. It only selected those with a heavy beak to survive. That's all that did. Natural selection works great. Darwin discovered natural selection. I agree. Good observation, Charlie. But then he went to the wild conclusion that the finches are related to the pine trees and the, and the elephants and the whales. This is so stupid. Okay. 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 Thank you for that. Luca, thanks for the uh, responses, AJ and Kent. Okay. $5 super chat comes in from James W. James, appreciate it. He was just here last night for our double header debate night, and he will be here next month debating Kent again as well. So a uh, question is there for you, Kent. He asks, what mechanism enforces the limit in microevolution? How does an organism stay the same kind when it keeps accumulating mutations? All the mutations that have ever been observed are harmful or fatal or neutral. We have ducks on our pond here that flew in and they got some feathers sticking out the side of their head because the skull didn't grow right. So it's a mutation. Nobody's ever seen a beneficial mutation that could take over the population. So what mechanism enforces, I think, the, the DNA replication process, uh, reproduction enforces, there's going to be a limit. You cross two cows, you're going to get a cow every time. No exceptions. You cross breed two ducks, you're going to get a duck every time. There are no exceptions. So there are genetic limits. There are obvious uh, physical limits. Okay, you're not going to get a dog as big as Texas. Uh, there are, uh, see, science is what we can observe. We observe, hey, there's limits. How fast can a horse run? Have they reached the limit? I don't know. Secretariat was pretty fast. Have they beaten that record yet? Maybe not. Might by a second or two. But it, there's a limit. Physical limits, biological limits. I think it's obvious. It's limited in the DNA code. So what enforces it? I think that God must have designed it that way to work that way. But I don't know. I'm not enforcing it. But I know when I had children, they turned out to be human every time. Go ahead, AJ. Well, um, since there is no such thing as a kind, there is no limit. There is no mechanism. And um, I don't think that Kent can really answer this question because I was trying to ask him the same question or a similar question about what, what are the limits that stop us from getting a dog bigger than a Great Dane. But DNA replication errors... I don't see how that will stop an animal from becoming a different kind because the definition of kind is whatever Kent wants it to be. Thank you, AJ. Kent, if you want, you get the okay. final word. So for the record, he just said DNA replication errors 
uh, make there's no limit. I think that's crazy. It's not science. <coughs> to draw a chart like this that says birds and humans and ladybugs have a common ancestor is not science. Where are the limits? Uh, mutations happen. I don't know that they accumulate very far because you get too many mutations. The creature dies or can't, reap or can't live at all. All mutations observed are harmful or fatal. Maybe when we debate James, James, show me the best mutation you know that adds information. All the, all the mutations scramble existing information. They don't add any information. They scramble what's already existing. Where's the mutation that adds new information? I'd like to see that. I don't think there's any. I defy you to show me some. Okay, thank you for the responses, uh, debaters, and also James. Thanks for your question. Okay, so next one um, comes in from, let's see here. Got a solid mix, but I don't want to pick questions that we've, we've already kind of answered. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, Snake was right. So $5 super chat. Thank you so much. And uh, Snake and Kent debated last night. So here we go. He asked. Good debate. Good debate. That was. So he's asking you, uh, Kent. He says, um, for Kent, birds are reptiles and dinosaurs by definition, whether related or not. Do you agree dogs and whales are both mammals? Well, uh, Taylor, your first statement, birds are reptiles and dinosaurs by definition. This is propaganda. This is not science. Birds are not reptiles. Birds are not dinosaurs. Birds are birds, okay? Ask your mama. She can explain it to you. The fact that you make a statement like that doesn't make it true. This is propaganda. This is not science. Birds make baby birds every time, without exception. You got an example, exception to that? I'd like to see it. So for you to just make a statement like that, that's like me saying, well, elephants can fly. No, they can't. You can't fly. And birds are not reptiles. I'm sorry, they're not. So you're dreaming. Your premise is totally wrong. So your question's invalid. It's like me asking you, why are elephants orange? They're not orange, okay? The question's invalid. Your statement starts off with something real stupid. Birds are not reptiles. Real stupid. Believe that if you want, but that's not science. Go ahead. Appreciate it, Kent. AJ, anything you'd like to add? Well, I think we have another question that Kent didn't answer because the oh, question okay. was about are, are dogs and whales both mammals? Oh, yeah. So, dogs, do, man has decided to classify animals that breathe air, that are warm blooded, that produce live young as mammals. I don't think the dog cares that we put him in the same category as the whale. I don't think he even thinks about it. But yes, man has decided our careless lineage classification system in 1700s divided it up, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Man has arbitrarily decided to arrange things in categories. That's great. It's wonderful. No, I'm not against that. That's changed over the years many, many times and probably going to change again. Some animals move from one species to a different kind or a different variety or a different uh, subspecies. But yes, man has decided dogs and whales are both mammals. That does not mean birds are reptiles. Totally unrelated. Go ahead. So man has decided that uh, dogs and whales are both mammals, and you say that that's valid, but man has also decided that reptiles are vertebrates that have scales on, part, on at least one part of their body and lay eggs, but that doesn't include birds as reptiles. That's invalid. Seems like a double standard to me. Birds lay a calcium-covered egg. Reptiles lay a leathery-type egg. The reproductive system is very different. The number of DNA chromosomes is very different in these creatures. If you wish to believe birds are reptiles, I got some property I want to sell you in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. You'll fall right, for here anything. We go. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for the interesting back and forth as always. So uh, another super chat comes in, this one from SWE, appreciate it. And again, this one is, is for you, Kent. So she asks, how does Kent explain the tetra tetrapod forelimbs, for example, like in whales, frogs, bats, etc., all having the same pattern. A single bone is followed by a pair of long bones, which are linked to the hand with digits. Go ahead. I explain it like that is an amazing design. You got the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, the carpals, the metacarpals, the phalanges. I think it works amazing. I like mine. I use them all the time. Broke them several times, but they healed up. That's a good question about the healing process. 
So a lot of animals seem to have this same pattern because they function, they do the same thing. I think a lot of vehicles have a drive shaft to get the engine, to get the power from the engine to the back wheels somehow, either through a spinning shaft or through a chain in the early days. So I think that there's an amazing design that so many animals have a similar design in the forelimb that's not evidence of a common ancestor. That's amazing design. So the question was, how does Kent explain it? God created it, and I love it. It's amazing. Okay, thank you, Kent. SWE, thank you for the super chat. AJ, if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, I mean, you spent $10 to ask that. Of course, he's just going to say that God did it. But the reason is that they're a homologous structure. And it's uh, I, what's really interesting is why do whales have bones inside their flippers? Why do they have what appear to be finger bones instead of, I don't know, just a solid plate? Maybe it's because they share a homology and they share common ancestry with these animals that had tetrapod forelimbs. And that's why they have the same pattern of bones or that they even have what appear to be finger bones at all inside their flipper. It doesn't really make sense to me as a design. <coughs> doesn't make sense to you, but the reason the whales have bones, the whales not only just paddle with their flippers, they can maneuver them and contour them to give more thrust to one side or the other and to swim. They actually can move around different directions while they swim. They can decide to surface or submerge. So the fact that they can have flexibility within their flipper, I think is amazing design. Homologous structures. Here we go. Uh, there we go. There they are. Just went right to it. Slide number 1619. Alt DV 1619. Enter. Okay. I agree. There are four limbs of different animals that have similarities. I agree. There's not, it's not proof of a common ancestor, though. It could be proof of a common designer and a design that works really well. Simple enough. But you guys refuse to see the obvious, hey, there's two choices here. Maybe it's designed to be this way, or maybe it just happened this way. You can believe whatever you want. My point would be that real science would say, we don't know. We couldn't prove either one. But you guys want your religion only taught to the kids. I resent that. Okay, thank you so much. Another one comes in from Snake Was Right. So uh, $5 super chat. Thank you so much. And he's asking again for you, Kent. How do you know all squirrels had a common ancestor? What would be your method of comparison? First place, I don't know that. I haven't watched them reproduce all of them. We got a bunch of them doing around here all the time. So I suspect that's true. But again, I'm not demanding mine to be taught. Uh, they want, us to, they want uh, us to all teach that squirrels and pine trees have a common ancestor. How do you know squirrels and pine trees have a common ancestor? I think it's logic 101 to say, sure, all the squirrels could have come from a squirrel. It's not logic to say all the squirrels could have come from a pine tree. But you got these lines, lines on paper connecting plants and animals to a common ancestor. That's... Propaganda. Thank you, Kent. Uh, AJ, go ahead. Well, uh, Kent is trying to get his uh, creation material taught in public schools. I've established <laughs> that, and he's he admitted that. Well, you're the one that brought it up. I, I yeah. thought that science was what we know. So if you don't know this, then I guess it's not science that all squirrels had a common ancestor. Is it science that squirrels and pine trees have a common ancestor? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, uh, gents, we got one now for you, AJ, a super chat. So again, ahead of time, I do want to let the audience know that, um, you know, we, we, we've gone a bit longer on this debate. So apologies ahead of time if we don't get to your question. Of course, we can't be here all night. So here's one for you, AJ, Boomer21. And he asks... <laughs> Question for Atheist Jr. If the dinos, the dinosaurs, are over 60 million years old, how do you account for the ongoing discoveries of soft tissue in their bones and fossils? Well, I, I assume that he's talking about the, uh, dy the soft tissue that Mary Schweitzer discovered within uh, T-Rex bone. And that's not blood, like liquid blood that, that was discovered. What she found was evidence of blood. The iron 
and hemoglobin. And the reason that it had lasted so long was similar to the same way that leather is produced. Things in inside the molecules, the iron wraps around these molecules and is able to produce uh, to, uh, I forget the word, to save some of these parts of the blood vessel. But you don't find dinosaur fossils and you crack it open and it's got liquid blood in it. There's remnants that have been preserved. That was the word I was looking for. I couldn't think of it. But I don't think you can find soft tissue like you can't f dig up a, uh, a dinosaur fossil and find like a kidney in it. So I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about, about ongoing discoveries of soft tissue, but uh, that would be my answer. Hey, thank you, AJ. Uh, Kent, anything you'd like to add? Oh, yes. Many examples have been found of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Uh, it's not just Mary Schweitzer's. It's been many since then, okay? Uh, they tend to get not published very well because they go so much against the theory. But I think, how would I explain it? All the dinosaurs that drowned in the flood in the days of Noah 4,400 years ago, many turned to fossils, some rotted, some turned to oil. But uh, some we find, the fact that we find fossils at all is indication of rapid burial. Animals die today by the millions and nobody, they don't, none of them fossilized. So yes, you are simply mistaken, AJ. There have been many examples found of soft tissue in dinosaur bone, and I explain it very simply. They're not millions of years old. The 60 million years is pure baloney, not true. The world's 6,000 years old. It was destroyed by a flood about 4,400 years ago. And so some of the animals that were buried turned to stone. Some didn't quite finish fossilizing yet. No problem for me at all. Thank you, Kent. AJ, question was for you. Get the last word. Okay, so when a large animal dies and blood begins to decompose, iron is released from the hemoglobin. And as it seeps out into the tissues and bones in high concentration, it initiates something that's called cross-linking. And cross-linked proteins are what's used in forming leather because it preserves the tissue. So soft tissues are preserved sort of like leather. This is why these soft tissue are able to last so long. But like I said, you're, you're not going to find uh, soft tissue or, or bodily fluids that look like they're from a week ago. They're going to be part of a fossil. So they are extremely old, but it could still be, you know, soft tissue is a little bit of a, a misleading term. Okay, thank you, AJ. Uh, next question is another super chat from Snake Was Right. Appreciate it, ten dollars, and uh, for you again, Kent. So it looks like we're having another debate between you and Snake here. Appreciate these questions, keeping it fun. So he asks, uh, well, he says single-celled eukaryotes have been observed to produce multicellular eukaryotes. Doesn't break the law of monophyly since eukaryote isn't defined by being unicellular. Any thoughts, Kent? I'd like to see the evidence for that. I'd be glad to study. Is he talking about a two-celled creature or a colony of cells working together? Single-celled creatures coming together to make a colony is not the same as a multi-celled creature. Appreciate it, Kent. Uh, AJ, any response? Well, I mean, all humans start out as a single cell and become multicellular eukaryotes, although I'm not sure if that's what that person means. Now, um, there are examples of algae, like we talked about in, in the last debate I did with Kent, that were observed to produce or to become multicellular. And the reason that this grouping of cells is not a colony is because in a colony, any cell can break off from the group and live on its own. But in a living organism, all of the cells have different functions. And so if it breaks off, it'll die. That's the difference between a multicellular organism and simply a colony of single cells that come together. Okay, appreciate it, AJ. Kent, uh, you get the last word, brother. Question was for you. Well, humans can work together. I, got, I work together with people all the time, but we don't become one. We're it's a group of people. It's a colony. Uh, so that's all that's ever been observed. Nobody's ever observed a two-celled creature or three-celled. But somewhere along the line, it had to go from single cell to 100 trillion cells like a human today. Somewhere along the line, 
something happened in their theory that they cannot prove. That's why evolution is a religion. Nothing scientific about it. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, again, this has been a ton of fun. Very engaging debate. Well worth the wait. Time has flown by, so we're going to wrap it up here with one or two more questions. And uh, AJ, this one is for you. This one comes in from Taylor K. I do appreciate the question, Taylor. And she asks, question for AJ. Do you believe all of the symbiotic relationships pr present in the world and require to sustain life all occurred by random chance? Well, if... If by random chance you mean just that means God didn't do it, then yes, I do believe that. But if you say that God is the one who created all these symbiotic relationships, then you also have to accept the fact that God would have created every parasitic relationship, like parasitic wasps that lay their eggs inside of a caterpillar. And then when those eggs hatch, they eat their way out of the caterpillar, killing it. So I guess God created parasitic relationships too. Okay, thank you for that answer. AJ, uh, Kent, anything you'd like to add? I think there are probably billions of examples of symbiotic relationships in nature. Classic one, plants breathe in CO2 and give off oxygen, which we need. We breathe in oxygen and give off CO2, which is what they need. So plants and animals have a completely symbiotic relationship as far as reciprocation of the gases go, as well as hundreds of other things. I think you'll find millions of animals require certain plants. And some plants require certain animals to pollinate them. Like the bee with the fuzz on his back, when he goes in and touches certain parts of the flower, the stamen will come down and deposit the pollen on the bee's back. How did the stamen learn to do that? It works. It works really well. It's amazing. You'd almost want to think God did it if you didn't know better. So I think you could, the good question, you could find literally probably into the millions of symbiotic relationships if you look for it. And when I see them, I just give God the glory. They praise God. You're smart. Thank you so much. Kent, a uh, question was for you, AJ. You get the last word. Well, you could take that same argument and say that all of those symbiotic relationships were created by Allah. So we should praise Allah and it would be just as valid. Okay, let's uh, let's do one last question in order to wind it up at the two hour mark. I do appreciate uh, you know the time from both uh, AJ and Kent. So, uh, firstly, before the last question, I will say it looks like there's an after show. So, any after shows for any of our debates, you just let me know, and of course, I will uh, advertise them. So, logical, plausible, probable. Appreciate all your super chats tonight, brother. Uh, your feedback, and also uh, it looks like there's an after show. Uh, kicking off right after this debate. So here we go. Uh, last question from Ken Rock. Ken Rock is here in the chat, has debated Kent a couple times, and he has a question for you. He says, isn't the definition of science something that can be tested and also have predictions made about it? Well, as I mentioned, you can look up the definition of science for the last several hundred years in old dictionaries. I collect old dictionaries, too. Uh, it says, what do we know? based on observation, experimentation, and testing. That's science. Now, science is useful for a lot of things to, uh, that may go outside that field. Uh, you know, like nobody knows for sure what gravity is. We know what it does. We can test it in you know, 9.8 meters per second or 32 feet per second per second on the surface of the planet Earth, different on different planets. But that's, nobody really knows what it is. So, we, so science is limited to what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. That's, I don't think anybody has come up with a better definition. Does, but these, these, these guys keep trying to twist the definition of science to include their religion. That's what's silly about it. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, Kent. Uh, go ahead, AJ. Well, I'm confused because Kent says that atheism is a religion and evolution is a religion. So I guess I have two religions. But the, the definition of science uh, that I've seen on Google is saying that it's the study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So science isn't just what we know. It's about learning things that we don't know yet. Okay. Thank you, AJ. And uh, Kent, you get the final word. Oh, that, that's a good point. And I would agree. There's the science is the study of things that we take what we do know and try to figure out what, what do we not know? You know, can we extrapolate this? And sometimes we do really good, sometimes not too good, but, uh, uh, all the science tells us dogs produce dogs, nothing else other than that. 
So if somebody wishes to believe otherwise, that they've just really left science and gone to religion. I found my whole section on seminar part seven about soft dinosaur tissue. Wow. It's not just one, it's hundreds of examples. Nature Magazine, Discover Magazine, uh, National Geographic, uh, all kinds of people, Science Magazine, uh, Nature Magazine. If I, I think you're mistaken, AJ, you need to study this a little further. Soft dinosaur tissue, not just blood cells co coated in iron. Soft dinosaur tissue has been found, Christian Science Monitor, let's see. Uh, so I'll, get my, I'll send it off to you if you'd like. Of course, I don't think you want an answer to that one, but okay, go ahead. Okay, it's been two uh, hours, Donnie. It's been two hours. I'm old. I'm tired. I'm ready to go to bed. So how much more? That's it. You stole uh, the words right out of my mouth, brother. That was the last question that we're going to uh, get to. I had a double header last night. So we did five hours of debates uh, last night, two hours today. And we've got another one tomorrow but uh, with Kent again. So three in a, uh, in a row, Kent. You're a busy man. So again, uh, Atheist Jr., Kent, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this was an epic debate, one to remember. Uh, any final words you gentlemen want to say before we shut it down? Uh, no, just, um, you, you know, if anybody in the chat, uh, is seeing me for the first time, you can go check out my channel, uh, just atheist junior and, you know, check out my videos and consider subscribing or follow me on Twitter. And Kent. Well, yes. And check out my, uh, website, drdino.com, D-R-E-I-N-O and my YouTube channel, Kent Hovind official and AJ, God loves you. And I'm trying. Oh, <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for keeping it fun and easy to moderate. So uh, blessings. Thank you to the chat. Of course, as always, I stick around for two minutes. So to the debaters, thanks again. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Looks like we are live for another epic debate in the 2022 evolution debate challenge series. Tonight, we've got Runa Norderhog and Dr. Dino debating, is there reasonable evidence for evolution? Evolution tonight is on trial. Runa, this is your first time here on the platform, and I do appreciate you uh, being willing to engage in, in this important discussion and topic. So Runa, I want to start with you in terms of, of an introduction. Uh, not necessarily an opening statement, just a little bit about you, a little bit about uh, if you've got a website or a channel, anything like that. Uh, go ahead. No, no, I, I am just a regular biology student, as well as just someone also, oh, um, just interested in technology and as well as so, social and behavioral studies and just someone who loves learning in a variety of ways, both about the sciences in general and, and a large amount of other to topics. And to be honest, I also love discussing them. So, and, and always interested in asking questions and, and thinking about the answers, which is also why I'm here. Yeah. Because, obviously, I've also asked a lot of questions on your channel. <laughs> well, that's why uh, I'm excited for this. I'm sure you and uh, Kent are going to have some interesting dialogue. So let's hand it over to uh, Dr. Dino. Dr. Dino, you've been a busy man. You've got a ton of these uh, important debates here in this uh, challenge series. So how you been? How's your day? And how's everything at Dow, brother? Uh, God's been good. Some of God's kids drive me crazy, but God is good. Uh, Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama is going great. We give tours all the time. I found something interesting today, Donnie. I found an old slide. I, my debate number 230 was back in April of 2021. I have now, because of your channel, done so many more. Tonight is a blessing to do uh, Runa. Thank you for doing this. Number 286 for me. I've done 56 debates in the last 58 weeks. <laughs> Bring them on. Bring them on. Okay. The, somebody called me the Hulk Hogan of the Hulk Hogan of the creationists, uh, the evolution destroyer. <laughs> and we got three next month. Uh, the, uh, thank you, uh, Donnie, for doing this. Uh, even Lathius Jr. going to try it again. Praise God. So looking forward to that. I believe the Bible is true. Evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. Didn't happen. Not dumb. 
<laughs> appreciate the intro. Can't, that's got to be a world record, and we'll have you over 300 debates in no time. So uh, for the audience's sake, though, I want to uh, give them a little bit of a rundown in terms of the format. It's going to be very similar to the last several debates where we are going to be taking one topic at a time. Uh, Rune being the affirmative, he is going to start us off with a an opening statement where he's going to kind of lay out a, a single argument with some slides and then we're going to go from there one topic at a time and and some sophisticated dialogue so we will be having an audience q a though so everybody in the audience please if you've got a question pertaining to creation versus evolution make sure you're tagging me at standing for truth and that way i don't miss them okay room uh, we're going to hand it over to you whatever you take opening statement we'll give to kent and i do see your slides popping up so yeah there we go you know the opening questions are the real hell uh, so i'm happy when we get to that part but you know for now let's have a discussion so oh you know i have the most boring opening slide but let's go <laughs> to the next one so Though it is often understood from a, the, like, in the current, current like, scientific worldview, we often, people often think that, you know, people often misunderstand that it was like everything came out in a instant and that that's what we mean, that it all came out of nowhere in an instant. But while well, there, there is talk about nothing in the beginning, though that is under a distinct category, right? we, when we are often actually talking about large amounts of processes over time that eventually got us here, not everything popping into existence. The, these processes include the stellar formation hints that that it got us here, here, different stars or originally forming from hydrogen and helium and then the metal and, and those stars themselves, elves, because they formed a, a, a specific amount and near each other, you're actually sharing metal and then, then being able to increase the higher or levels. Eventually, biological evolution is itself one of those, those, those processes. Well, different and forms of like abiogenesis are posited. The only requirement for evolution is basically that different forms of these processes could have happened, not specifically a, a one form from happening. And there needs to be an access to zones. So many creationists will put these processes other, under the categories of stellar evolution, chemical evolution, cosmological evolution, biological evolution, as I believe Kent is going to do today. Though you can fairly argue there are a form of change and process that is advocated for by modern science and definitely are interrelated with each other, they're in fact not a required premise in each other's basis as they can be supplemented with each other. They do have to defend themselves, but they do not rely on each other. Just like knowing the origin of the stream Moses was put in could be used for or against his story in the Bible, we can still explore or evidence around that story without knowing the origins of that specific stream. So now let me go on to talk about one of my first topics, diatoms. Where did all the diatoms go during the flood? Diatoms are a group of multiple genera of single-celled SRR clade protists that are organisms with cell walls composed of transparent silicae. When we consider that these species would not have been on the ark due to not having the breath of life, yet should be expected to be one of the original existing kinds due to their inability to reproduce with other forms of protists, thus carving out what seems to be the closest form of a kind category, we can at least guess that they were 
er, 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 that a form of them uh, must have gone back. As a result, assuming that, as Ken Coven often asserts with his, his shake em up uh, density model, we have to ask the question, considering that they were in the sea and they must have died, died as a result of the violent turbulence that occurred during this thing, why don't we see a, a large amount of diamaceous earth when there would be a distinct inked amount out of density of it separated under the way Kenthoven pre presents it. If they were moved, moved by some other mechanism, what mechanisms would allow both that model well, and the, the young earth model to coexist as well if instead they came out after the flood existed as a result of the supposed post-flood diversity increase, why isn't there a noticeable shift in the amount of silica present in layering past that specific point versus before? As, and why isn't there a more noticeable spread of that diomaceous earth, earth around? Another topic to continue, or Donnie, would you like would you prefer that I introduce this later? That's a very good question. Uh, what I'm seeing here is arguments from uh, diatoms. So maybe we'll we'll stop there. We'll allow yeah, uh, can... Ken equal time maybe to address it. You guys can um, go back and forth on it and then we'll pull up your slides again for uh, your That's next fair. line of evidence for evolution. So uh, let me just get that. Good, we're good. Dr. Hoven, we're going to hand it over to you um, to take equal time. It looked like it was about four minutes or so and kind of go from there. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. I've never had diatoms used as an ev evidence for evolution. I think uh, most people would agree that diatoms live in the ocean and they would not need to go on Noah's Ark. They had plenty of water outside. On my seminar part six, I'm flashing through my slides quickly here to see if I find I've been to the diatomaceous earth quarry in uh, Lompoc, California. I have some huge uh, sections of diatomaceous earth here in our museum. Uh, it is made up of bazillions and trillions and quadrillions of diatoms. They probably died rapidly with the uh, uh, temperature change in Noah's flood. Uh, let's see, diatomaceous earth. Uh, you have to, oh, here it is. Chalk cliffs of Dover as an example. There we go. Finally, found it. Okay, slide number 268, uh, Alt-DV. Two, six, eight. There. Uh, a fossil whale was found standing on end uh, and running through all these layers of diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth, here's, here I am at the Lompoc, California uh, diatomaceous earth quarry. When you split these layers of diatoms open, they contain billions of fish fossils packed in between the layers. I think it's pretty obvious the diatomaceous earth was formed by a rapid die-off of diatoms, like trillions and quadrillions of them, probably from a great temperature change. But the diatomaceous earth contains literally trillions, quadrillions of fossils, huge fish found in the diatomaceous earth. Damien, do we still have these in our science center? Uh, at least one, yeah, things kind of disappear. But I think that's an awfully poor argument for evolution. The diatoms haven't changed. The chalk cliffs of Dover, same thing, they're 300 feet thick. Something, a rapid temperature change would have caused a massive die-off of the chalk and the diatoms, and these creatures would have snowed to the bottom of Noah's flood. Um, calcite, another one, the white cliffs of Dover. So I think the Bible is, is correct that certainly the existence of diatoms in great layers is not evidence for evolution. The purpose of the debate tonight is where's the evidence for evolution? When they look at diatoms today swimming around in the ocean, they're identical to the ones they find in the fossil record. There's been no change. They're still the same. But how do you get a layer 300 feet thick of diatoms? It's not happening anywhere in the world today. And you split them open and there's fossils inside, bunches of them. So I think if that's uh, uh, Runa's best evidence for evolution, that's, that's evidence actually for a flood, a rapid die-off of creatures. 
And I think if God created the world to be inhabited, like he said in Genesis, the purpose of it being made was to be inhabited. I think the world was entirely habitable, whereas today large portions of it are basically uninhabitable. Um, and so I think it was a very different world before the flood and the uh, uh, crust of the earth breaking open. The Bible says the fountains of the deep broke open. The hot water coming out would have killed all the diatoms within 100 miles of the crack. And the uh, diatomaceous earth quarry in Lompoc, California is right on the San Andreas Fault. I think that's one of the places where they died off and made huge layers. So I, there's been no change in the diatom, so it's not evidence for evolution. The ones we find fossilized and the ones today are identical. It's actually a great evidence for a flood. So I'm not exactly sure what he's driving at here, how this is somehow evidence for evolution. It, it's rapid die off. I mean, you go out there, just Google uh, diatomaceous earth quarry, Lompoc, California. They dig it out with monster machines, truck train loads of it go out of there every day, train loads. So not evidence for evolution. Uh, let's see, he also asked about, um, oh, he's a biology student. I appreciate that. Keep studying, you can become a creationist. Uh, you love learning? Good, good. We'll, we'll use you on our side when we get you converted over, uh, Runa. Runa. Uh, okay, I think those are the only two things he covered. I'd like to see more evidence for evolution, uh, if he's got some. Go ahead. Appreciate oh, yeah. it. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, no, Red, Don, Runa, if, if there's anything you wanted to... It's, um, it's, I, I do. I do want, but it's your show. No, yeah, if, if you wanted to uh, have a quick response. You guys can go uh, you, back and forth on that slightly, and then we'll have you present... Okay. Another what, line of evidence for, for evolution. Go ahead. What you said is actually the crux of my point. There is huge layers of it in the in quar quarries, but they're specifically in quarries, in locations that are specific, rather than spread out all over the earth. 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 That implies that there was some mechanism to push these things over rather than what we'd expect in a global flood where all of it should be e, e, dying everywhere, especially in as the model you have proposed and shown with your sand-based thing multiple times um, shows, it should be weight-based. You, you have often suggested that it is that different fossils well, based on their weight go up and went up and down um, during the flood. If that was to occur, we should expect much more of a distribution in, of diatoms, much more evenly than we actually see it in reality. So if, the, if we assume that is true, then there must have been, and that the flood occurred, there must have been another mechanism after the flood to who distribute Ute, those diatoms towards those specific quarries from the even distribution and that occurred during the flood. Uh, and then the question and comes up. Uh, if Unless this occurred, you wanted to stop there, Runa. And allow because the, there's a few things you said there. We'll allow this, uh, I guess, topic to be discussed briefly. But I do also want to make sure that that we're sticking to uh, the main topic, which is evolution, right? Evidence for evolution. Um, and, and I appreciate those points, uh, Kent. If there's anything you wanted to respond there, go ahead. Well, yeah. The the purpose of the debate is evidence for evolution, not evidence against the flood. I, I don't have to defend that. The Bible says there was a flood. I believe that. I've chosen to believe it. But I think if you go any place where there's been a flood, go, go to Louisiana after a big hurricane. <clears throat> Things are sorted out. There are trees and logs and leaves and sand dunes and mud. It, the, the moving water separates things very quickly. I've often said in my seminar, when I use the little uh, sand things here, I can flip it over and make 10 or 20 layers in a matter of minutes, okay? It does not take millions of years. Uh, I think the fossils, if there's any sorting at all, the fossils we find are sorted based upon habitat Clams are at the bottom, generally, because clams already live at the bottom. That's where they live. Of course, they're the first ones buried. Birds are at the top, generally, because birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. So I think you'd have to consider, if we're arguing flood geology here, the habitat would determine some sorting. You're probably not going to find mm -hmm. birds with clams very often, because birds don't hang out with clams. They don't, they don't hang out with them. Okay. Secondly, I think they're going to be some sorting based upon body density. 
clam shells are heavier than bird feathers. I think they're going to be sorted based upon mobility. Clams can't run very fast. A bird can fly pretty fast. And they're sorted based upon intelligence. As best anybody can figure out, clams aren't too smart. So I think those are some of the factors that would have played into the sorting of the fossils in these layers. Plus, when water is moving, it automatically sorts things. It's called hydrologic sorting. And when water is moving sideways, like you would get with the flood of Noah, if the moon is pulling the tides up during the flood, which it certainly was, the moon pulling the, pulling the tide up means the water has to rush into that bump to stay under the moon, all the while the earth is turning. So the water is constantly moving sideways at the same speed the earth is turning to stay under that bump. Not all of the water, but the bump would go up 200 feet with a, a, a tidal change during a liquid-covered earth, harmonic tide. So moving water will make eight or ten layers at the same time. Type in... Um, Hydrologic or no, experiments in stratification. The Colorado tank that they did, the French guy did all the experiments in. He said, look, you can get a fossil up here that's actually older than one down here. This one can be deposited before this one gets deposited. But the evolutionists are stuck with this dumb idea that the layers of the earth are different ages. They're stuck with it. They, got, they, they try to fit everything into that stupid paradigm. No, the layers are not different ages. I made these in the last three minutes. Is the top layer younger? No, they're all in the thing at the same time. If they say the top layer is younger, where's it coming from? Outer space? That's why I say the geologic column does not exist anywhere in the world. It's the biggest lie taught to humanity, and some folks swallow it, and they try to force everything to fit in that stupid geologic column, and it doesn't even exist. There's no such thing as a geologic column. So <clears throat> anyway, but this is not about the flood. I think I could defend the flood in a debate. But I'd still like to see how that is evidence for evolution, that we came from an amoeba or a single-celled creature, or that life could get started from non-living material, organic evolution. Or pick, pick whichever one you want, uh, Runa. Which, where's the evidence for evolution? You're teaching a, taking a biology class. What are they telling you? Why, do you, why, do you? why do they make you believe this? Let's say biology oh, generally Runa. talks more about more round evolution, actually, honestly, than you often present it um personally but actually part of why i talked about that previous topic was its relevance to aging but i'll be fair to and respect donnie and let's go on to the next topic which is curie um so in the I got your slides up by the way runa i got your slides up now yeah in the 1950s in the Forey region in a fatal there was a fatal neurodegenerative disease found that would become known as Curie or laughing sickness. And it was first officially described by uh, the Australian officers there. Though, naturally, like every disease, it had been known about uh, slightly before then by the locals oh, of Papua New Guinea. By the local tribesmen, it was initially thought to be sorcery or witchcraft sp spread by some members of the tribe and by those primarily, and, and was primarily affecting the children and women of the tribe. Even when this came out, out and they looked into it, even amongst biologists, there was a heavy debate on the cause of this neurological, whole, whole, um, I mean, neurodegenerative disease because there was such a prolonged waiting period in the disease itself between when they got, when they appeared to get it and when the people got affected. Ed, Ed. The cause was initially described as the, I mean, the cause was eventually discovered to be what would become known as a prion, which is a misfolded protein. And it turned out that these proteins were being spread from brain to brain by the ritual ha habits of this people group. We confirmed this by actually um, getting some prions from someone who was infected and spreading it to ooh, an orangutan. And it turned out, out, out that the prions were also likely the cause of diseases such as Crutchfield Jacobs disease and similar diseases that had changed from its initial form and spread from the initial victim. Uh, 
But the story of Curie doesn't end there. Within the region that Curie appeared, a missense mutation started spreading, known as G1, now known as G127 um, polymorphism. These types of mutations are point mutations wherein the amino acids switch in a single nu nucleotide and sometimes result in the protein being non-functional leading to specific diseases sometimes, or potentially leading to beneficial effects, depending on the environment and its interaction. In this case, it enabled a specific increased resistance to curing because it resulted in a specific prion protein. It appears to be as recent as only 10 generations, and it was specifically limited to the region where Curie had been most widespread had, and was only seen in about 3,000 3, individuals, well, but quickly spread. And this kind of brings up a lot of interesting in questions about both creationism and evolution. Why can prions transfer from what could be considered different kinds, yet only within kinds that are closely related, such as orangutans and humans. Yes. Since that appears to actually indicate a evidence of a close relationship as well. Why uh, can something be end up being misfolded just by interacting with different misfoldings? And how did it it start a chain of misfoldings in the first place. And finally, considering that there are, that this appears to be a beneficial mutation is, and also was from a duplication error, does this not show that there are times when new information can be added added and a benefit can come from it. Okay, Runa, if, if that's mm -hmm. it for that uh, specific argument, um, I guess the bigger yeah. picture beneficial uh, mutations and specifically this example, let me get your uh, slide off the screen. And uh, Kent, brother, we can hand it over to you for, for a response. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, mutations are often cited as evidence for evolution. All of the known mutations are harmful, fatal, or neutral. In this case, it didn't add any new information. It selected, oh, I'll get into that in a second. Textbooks often mm -hmm. say mutations are the raw material of evolution. Okay. Mutations are essential to evolution. They are the raw material of genetic variation. Without mutation, evolution could not occur. I agree and it can't occur, evolution doesn't happen. Mutations have a range of effects. They can often be harmful. Others have little or no detrimental effects. Sometimes, although very rarely, the change in DNA sequence may even turn out to be beneficial. In this case, his whole last, his whole last speech he gave was about a deadly disease, laughing sickness, that some mutation prevented them from getting that deadly disease. Well, that's like, well, bacteria don't become resistant to drugs. Uh, it only deformed, misshapen bacteria do, but it involves an information loss. I've got plenty of that from Dr. Spetner, who taught at that John Hopkins University about bacteria. Uh, let's see. He said, uh, after all the reading I've done in the life sciences, I've never found a mutation that added information. All point mutations studied by the molecular level are not to reduce genetic information, not increase it. Bacteria antibiotic streptomycin attaches to part of the bacterial cell called ribosomes, Mutations sometimes cause a structural deformity, like you talked about the folded protein here. It's a deformity. Since the antibiotic cannot connect with the misshapen ribosome, the bacterium is resistant. Even though the mutation turns out to be beneficial for the moment, it still constitutes a loss of information, not a gain. No evolution has taken place. The bacteria are not stronger. His argument that he just gave would be similar to saying, uh, if the police are going through handcuffing everybody to haul them off to prison and somebody doesn't have any arms, oh, he can't be handcuffed. Is that beneficial? No, 
it's beneficial for the moment. He gets away from getting handcuffed, but it's still, it's not, it's a loss of information. So the misshapen folded protein he's talking about is not going to help turn the bacterium into an elephant or a whale or a human. In that, if that's the best evidence they've got for evolution, they're bad shape. There's no evidence. I've been saying for years, there's no evidence of any animal ever producing a different kind of animal. And let's see, I got more stuff on mutations here somewhere, but I'll rest my case on that one. Uh, he mentioned uh, they can be transferred to apes, therefore we must be closely related. Well, the fact that certain diseases can affect certain creatures, different uh, phyla or, or um, different uh, families or genus or species, that doesn't prove any relationship. It might prove the same designer. It uh, doesn't have to prove, in, their, in the evolutionist mind though, the only answer is we gotta be related. Well, maybe we got the same designer. The Fords in our driveway and the Chevys both have four tires. It's a good design, it works, okay? So I think uh, if that's the best evidence for evolution, you don't have any at all. Go ahead. Okay, appreciate it, uh, Kent, that response. I'm really enjoying this uh, one topic uh, at a time. So Runa, oh, I'm going to unmute you, uh, my good man. Uh, go ahead with your response. Also, that will bring me to what he last said will bring me to my last slide. Um, but actually, I want to point out something. You, you misheard me, and, you know, I'll fully take that on me. It was, it was the disease that caused the misfolding. Hang, hang. The neuro, it was Curie that caught us the misfolding and the prion suspect. The mutation was actually what correct, corrected the misfolding. Hang. And that is what is interesting about it. In combination with that it was localized to a specific region and, and where this disease was spreading. Hang. Hang. It would, you are definitely kind of correct if it had just been a, like, misforming thing of it. it. Though we can definitely make some evolutionary arguments for what is a misformation and what can be beneficial in different circumstances. Is. But it was actually, the mutation was correcting the misformation. And that is what is really amazing, especially with how localized the mutation was towards the disease itself. But in relation to your la what you said at the end, let me bring up my last slide. Right. How do we recognize design? Actually, Runa, right. um, Maybe we should let Ken okay. respond okay. to anything there that he'd like to, and then we'll jump right to your next slide, and then that'll, that that way we'll keep it going at, at a nice flow like this. Um, Kent, over to you. Uh, I'd have to do some study on what he said about the, the mutation was correcting the misfolding. So if it was designed perfectly and it was misshapen from a mutation and another mutation straightened no. it out, no, it I, was... I'm baffled. It was designed right to begin with. Go ahead. So basically, prions, like Crutch uh, Jacobs, uh, basically mi mutated to, to work with humans, and, and then it spread and caused a chain of misfoldings because people were eating in, um, brains. And, and spreading it that way. And then it was infecting their own brains. So it was basically a chain of prions and infecting other people's holes, prions, and then they were infecting other people's prions, but, and causing it to misfold. Old. The, pro, the proteins themselves misfolded as a result of coming into contact with other misfolded proteins. And that led to the neurodegenerative disease. And it's a specific type, and it's actually a specific type of category of neuro di of disease that we now know exists as a result of this, where misfolded proteins are the cause rather than a virus yes, or something else. 
Well, I'm, I'm guess I'm still failing to understand how that adds information that would change it to anything the, else. Are, the are they still apes? Are they still humans? The mutation, the mutation itself was highly localized and actually repairing thing, 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 it. It didn't change them into a specific species, but it definitely it suggests highly localized as adaption can happen and is still occurring in the modern day. It didn't stop. It also suggests that we don't have like a backlog of genetic things that has suddenly stopped and that all DNA isn't just negative. And do you think that example you gave is enough of uh, enough to make people believe that a, a protozoa can turn to a human over billions of years? Uh, a mutation that straightens out or corrects a previous mistake, you're thinking that's adding information. You realize how many how much information has to be added to change from a protozoa to a biology teacher? These trees of life are taught in the schools. I'm sure it's in your textbooks. I, I, the purpose of this whole series of debates is where's the evidence? Why should somebody believe this? And if your best evidence is the prions, I'll do more research on that and be ready next time. But uh, I, I don't see how you've added any information. You straightened out something that was wrong. You didn't add anything. He's mm -hmm. muted. You're good now, Runa. Okay. No, that is fair. This is definitely only one step in, in a process. But it definitely shows how it is not just a process that exists in the past that is historical, but it is something that is ongoing. Though we only, though just like life is an ongoing process and often we forget about it, it is something that is still shifting us over time and changing and diversifying as well. There are other things that I could get into that I see some of the great questions that I'd like to talk about uh, later. Yeah. I'm not seeing any of the questions, but so far, if I understand this, uh, all you've offered as evidence for evolution is uh, a mutation that corrected a previous bad mutation and straightened out a protein because people were eating brains. Uh, dumb idea to begin with. but. Uh, and so it, it happened to go from species to species that look similar, like uh, your apes or orangutans, I forget which one you said. I, I don't see how that's gonna change uh, an amoeba to a biology teacher, which is what my objection is. Why do they teach this stuff? This is fairy tale. This is not science, it's a fairy tale. Whole thing, whole chart. Oh, actually. And, and Runa, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. So what we can now do is shift to um, what you would believe is, is an additional line of evidence that would, I guess, corroborate, as, as you were saying, uh, this specific example. If you have a slide or uh, however you'd like to present the next argument. Well, along with different mutations, I know you guys have heard about Darwin's finches since you complained you know, about them so much. And, you know, that's fa fair. Yeah. But are you aware that, in fact, there are more Darwin's finches now than there were in Darwin's time. In fact, heck, heck, there, there have been hybridization events and since that, that period. And I actually think this brings up a question that Kent Hovind has asked himself. Of where does the line on and what does it mean to be a species or a kind? And is that uh, relevant or is that something that we create ourselves and apply? Uh, so I actually want to ask you a question. If, a, if we added enough mutations and completely changed a kind, even if it originated from the 40 different kinds, would it still be the same kind? And, and it's not about the kind. Uh, I fully agree that Kent Hovind is right. It doesn't matter what we call a kind. And I think 
some of my I suppose definitely do focus over a bit too much about that. It's much more about where does it end? If I complete, if a finch can completely change into, with so many mutations that it can, looks completely different than what we began with, is it still a finch? We could call it that, of course, of course, but does it matter to God? God, God I'd wouldn't care if it was a finch. finch. It would just be a creation in that, that lied and was diversely different. Okay, go ahead, Ken. Okay, uh, Darwin sailed around 1831 on a ship for five years. He couldn't get a regular job. His dad got him a job as the ship's captain companion because uh, he was kind of a loser type fella, I, in my humble opinion. But he stopped at these islands off the coast of South America, the Galapagos Islands, and there he noticed there were 14 varieties of finches. And uh, Runa may be correct, there may be more varieties now because we've decided to further subdivide them. The Grants went down there and spent 10 years studying the size of the beak of the finch and they found out during dry years, when there's not much rain, the beak of the finch is one-tenth of one millimeter. A tenth of a millimeter thicker. Okay? That's because during dry years, the bugs have harder shells and they're harder to crack. So the beaks of the finch either grew a little thicker, like my fingernails grow thicker when I work on things, uh, or they, 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 they died off if they didn't have a, a, a thick beak. The Grant spent 10 years down there, probably got a doctor's degree for it or something like that. So there are quite a few varieties of finches, 228 species of finches in the world. Darwin counted 14 on the Galapagos Islands. They're still a bird, 100% bird. And his book, Origin of Species, he saw the finches on the island. He said, wow, there's 14 kinds of finches. Good observation, Charlie. So he said in his book, it's a wonderful fact that all animals and all plants are related to each other. Wait, wait, wait. You see 14 kinds of finches and therefore mosquitoes are related to pine trees? That's what he said. I didn't make it up. What he observed is called microevolution variations of the finch. And maybe they've varied, varied more. They're probably making new varieties of dogs, but they're still a dog. That's not evidence for evolution. Uh, where does it end? I think, uh, Runa, we could say the animals determine where it ends. Uh, they, they simply can't reproduce anymore. They've been trying to get smaller and smaller dogs. They got them down to toy chihuahuas, completely useless, but they got toy chihuahuas. I would be willing to bet $5 there's a limit to the size of a dog. I don't think you're going to get a dog, a dog as small as a flea. But there are animals as small as a flea, called a flea. So there are, I don't think they're going to get a dog as big as a whale or an elephant. So I think we're seeing the limits already. There's limits to horse speed, racing horses. They spent billions of dollars trying to go faster and faster, and they're probably getting close to a limit. So if, if somebody breaks the record, it'll be by a few millions of a second. Okay. So I think the animals themselves are limited. The, in, in the wild, the chihuahuas wouldn't last. Wouldn't last five minutes. So I think what we're seeing is variations within the kind, which God said would happen. They bring forth after their kind. There are no examples in recorded history of any animal ever bringing forth something other than its kind. Every farmer in the world counts on crossbreeding cows and getting a cow. It happens every time. So that what Darwin observed, if somebody now has decided to further subdivide them into more varieties of finches, it's still a bird. Bird. This is not evolution. Bird. Go ahead. Kent, appreciate it. Runa, we are going to hand it uh, back to you. And, and Runa, I just want to let you know if there's any uh, time you want to share slides or anything, just let me know and I can get them up there for you. But what is a bird? Did we define it or did nature or God define what a bird is? Because as you have pointed out, what we call it shouldn't matter. Right. Yeah. So we, it should be intrinsic where that limit ends. Not, we shouldn't see, we shouldn't be unable to distinguish between where like a dinosaur and a bird is. is. We, at least if there is such cut and dry kind. In addition, 
I have to point this out in favor of chihuahuas. Chihuahuas are actually much older than other species of dogs. Contrary to what you said, though chi to toy chihuahuas are older and were originally bred for being eaten. Uh, but you do bring up an interesting question. But an, an answer is, is consider this, is I would agree there is a limit, but is that limit one that is genetic or is it one that is physical due to the laws of our nature? For example, dinosaurs were able to grow you know, to large size and fleas are able to get small, but this is due to, this appears to be due to, to from an evolutionary perspective, how their physiology has adapted to their environment. So, like dinosaurs often have lower bones. So, maybe it would much more be relevant if we wanted to create a dog in that direction to, to have to account for all, not just some, but all the physical features that would, would be going in action rather than the genetical well, features that is the blocker. Go ahead, Kat. Well, his, his question was, are the limits to the changes genetic or physical? Probably both. I think we've reached a limit with dogs. Uh, there are physical limits. Uh, you're not going to get much bigger. Their bone structure couldn't handle. I don't think the bone structure of a dog could handle the weight of an elephant, for example. Uh, and they're certainly limited by genetics. God said 20 times in the first seven chapters, 20 times, they're going to bring forth after their kind. Every farmer in the world will tell you that's all they've ever seen. You plant corn, you get corn. There are now 250 breeds of cows they've developed. Probably had a common ancestor called a cow. Um, 60 varieties of oak trees might have had a common ancestor called an oak tree. All we've ever seen are the variations are limited genetically. You can crossbreed your finches for the next thousand years. Tell you what, Runa, get your biology class where you're teaching, where you're working, to take the finch gene code and turn it into a reptile or a mosquito or a whale, anything else. I'd be willing to bet you five bucks you will always, always Get a bird when you crossbreed your finches. You may get some new variety if you work at it. You might get some that can't fly. You're never going to get anything that's got fins and scales. And yet you guys believe, the evolutionists believe at least, that reptiles, dinosaurs, turned into birds. One of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity has got to be that one. Maybe electing Obama was dumber, but uh, so, or Biden, if you uh, So I think uh, th there's a limit genetically and a limit physically. You're never going to get a bird as big as an elephant. It's not going to happen. Go ahead. Appreciate it, Kent. Runa? I'm Over guessing here. then that you are unaware that we have, in fact, actually in the fetal womb, you know, by, as crazy it is, one of the advisors for Dinosaur or Park Arc, um, actually been able to, in fetal womb, turn, turn a a bird, a chicken back into more dinosaur or like structures. And in fact, it was surprisingly easy. At the same time, um, um, something you said is not necessarily correct with the reproductive, as algae often are to some extent polyploidal or, and do actually interact outside of what is their natural oh, groupings. And then they, the weird other ones, they form almost natural ring species in a way that is distinct from how other species interact sexually. And I'm not talking about the ring species most, most use as, as evidence that form out, out as a result of the A to B to C to D to E to F to A to F patterns. I'm, I'm talking about algae's mating and patterns in that they can mate 
with with a to c to c to a a but they cannot always mate directly in the middle making this weird formation of polypoidal transfer of information directly so that was just a fun point and I wanted to go to my slide, my final slide, if I may, Donnie. Yeah, Runa, let's do this. Let's allow uh, Ken to have a quick final okay. response on that specific topic, and then we'll pull up your slides and we'll move on to the next one. So uh, my uh, final okay. slide. Okay, that's fair. Uh, just one point though. My final slide is, is just related to what Ken said earlier. So I don't okay. think it will be a problem for him. Okay, go ahead, Ken. Okay, he is correct. There is such a phenomenon as ring species. Uh, I think you'll find the Kayabab squirrels and the Abert squirrels around Grand Canyon uh, do not seem to be inter interbreeding. Whether they could or not, I don't know. But the varieties that are always developed, in that case, they're still a squirrel. All the ring species that can ever be brought up for examples are still the same kind of animal. There are 50 varieties of watermelons. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. And over nearly a thousand varieties of mangoes. And they always make mangoes. Every time, 2,500 varieties of apples just in the U.S., 7,500 worldwide, and they're still an apple without question. How many kinds of wasps? 17,000 species of wasps. Well, 3,000 varieties of tomatoes. The worldwide, there are 15,000 varieties of tomatoes. God said they'd bring forth after their kind. 1,000 types of bananas bring forth after their kind. But you guys want to put them on a chart and draw lines and say, see, Animals and fungi and plants are related. Stop. I think all the bananas might be related. I think all the apples might be related. I think all the elephants might be related, but they're not related elephants and bananas to each other. This is science up here, the four different kinds of elephants. This is religion back here. There are 1,100 1 varieties of bats. They're still bringing forth after their kind. So all, all observable science, which is science is supposed to be what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate, all of it says... Evolution doesn't happen. You might get a variety of cat, but there's still a cat. You're never going to turn a cat into something else. And to turn an ostrich into a dinosaur, I want to see that. And to turn a chicken, uh, chicken turning toward dinosaur characteristics or whatever it was you said, I'll go back and review the tape. I want to see that evidence. And if somebody can do it in the laboratory, does that prove it happened in nature? Does that prove it happened in history? No. Nobody has ever observed any animal produce a different kind of offspring. Oak trees make baby oak trees without exception, 60 different kinds. Okay, 195 varieties of chickens, eight kinds of bears. I accept all this. It's still the same kind. So yes, variations happen, 45 varieties of pumpkins. And probably some farmer can say, I want a pumpkin that's you know pink and he could work with the gene code and mess it up and make a pink pumpkin, I don't know. But it's still a pumpkin, 1,100 species of pine trees. 12,000 species of grass, 150 species of uh, roses, hybrids, 60 species of rats. So I think all of observable science deals with the fact that animals bring forth after their kind, which is what God said would happen. So if somebody's messing with it in the laboratory, trying to turn an ostrich in, or a, a, would you say a, a bird and a chicken into a dinosaur or give it reptile characteristics, hey, I'd like to see the evidence. I'd like to see how they did that. And is this proof it happened in nature? Is it therefore something we should teach to all the students as fact? No, it's nothing more than hypothesis at this point until it's a proven fact. Science deals with what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate, look it up. We don't observe any animal make any other kind of babies than the same kind. 60 species of eagles, might've had a common ancestor called an eagle. So I do wanna see his last slide and see what he's got to say. And about the ring species, it's still the same kind. Anybody would recognize the Kayabab squirrel and the uh, Abert squirrel, the ring species around Grand Canyon, as a squirrel. Anybody, a four-year-old would do that. Go ahead. Appreciate it, uh, Kent. Runa, let's let's move on to your uh, next slide. I appreciate the visuals from the both of you. And uh, as we wind down here, oh. I think on, on probably our final topic to the audience, we've got a ton of great questions flying in. So any last minute questions, now is the chance. Make sure you're tagging me. So here we go. Runa, the slide yeah. is up for you. Although I, I will just say one thing. Apples and almonds and pears 
can be bred together, just as they are, in fact, all roses. Just, just something to consider that I think the audience should consider, but I'm not going to debate on that topic. So as you brought up, you, you brought up your often mentioned and truck metaphor. So you sometimes, com you often compare design to similar style trunks and point out that this suggests that we are clearly designed and based on the similarities we see to them and the intelligence that seems to apply. But does that, re does, is it the similarities that imply to intelligence? To some extent, yes. When we are looking at, at the, a car or a truck, it does. Us. But it's actually because the designer is designing them for their environment or for the market and what works best. But they're not traits of a specific designer. Specific designers are often instead marked by the flaws and unique traits of the designer. Even similarities are representative can be can be in fact representative of the fact that humans can only do so little. And that is what marks the individual designer because we copy and advance on other people's designs and socially evolve, evolve in that regard. And that is how design spreads and similarity spread. To this extent, based on your same analogy, we would more get a, get a we would more likely expect a god that is flawed or is maliciously streaking out, or perhaps more like bubblegums, um, multi-designer god, gods who are both who have different goals in mind. For a a Abrahamic god, we should expect each design to be unique and crafted perfectly for an, its environment, with its similarities only related to its environment and not connecting over non-connected environments. Appreciate it, Roon. Um, Kat, over to you. Well, I think what we're seeing today, you are a copy of the gene code of your parents and they are a copy of their parents and their friend Preet goes back so you are a copy off of a copy off of a copy off of a copy off of a copy, probably 250 generations back to Adam. In the evolutionist mindset, you would go back millions of generations. Every time you have a copying process, you introduce the possibility of mistakes and errors. The fact that we can still breathe and talk at all is amazing, being a copy off a copy off a copy off a copy off a copy. So uh, the... Um, Evidence, can you put his slide back up? There was something I wanted to say about that one. Can that, can that possible, Donnie? There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He sometimes, uh, first paragraph, he sometimes compares design to similar style trucks and points out that the design, okay, I would say all of the vehicles designed by one particular engineer might have a lot of similarities. Doesn't the Tesla, how many different types of Tesla cars are there, Damien? At least six. At least six. I bet they have some similarities. Same guys designing them, okay? That, that, yay. So I think that there are some similarities between all the different animals today, like many mammals have two arms and two, two feet, two legs, four. Or, so I, that's, that's, that's a good design, it works great. Um, and if there weren't some similarities in the, in the proteins, we could only eat each other. I think God designed it so there'd be a web of life where they're all working together, where the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and I eat it and get the blonde hair, okay? That's design. So I think there is overwhelming evidence for a designer behind all of this. If each animal was individually crafted to be completely separate, there would not be the web of life that nature. The nuts and bolts are designed to fit each other, even though in a nut and a bolt are opposites. So, but they're designed to fit together. So I think we're designed to be able to interact with the animals and to eat some of them, and they're designed to interact with each other there is a, a whole network of biology that works great because everything was designed for its environment just the way it is. So I don't think uh, the fact that you said we should see similarities between them, yeah, I think that does prove intelligent design. Uh, let's see, your fourth paragraph. Design itself is instead often marked by the flaws and unique traits of the designer. Well, in the case of you know, vehicles and machines, it might be. 
but I don't think there were any flaws or uh, design flaws in the original creation. But when you consider we're seeing a copy off a copy off a copy off a copy, yeah, there may be something has crept in, but they've all been negative. Where's the, where's the advancing information? Take a piece of paper and run it through the copy machine. There you go. Run this through a copy machine and the copy will come out. Then take that copy and run it through the copy machine. Then take the copy of the copy of the copy and run it through the copy machine. After about 15 generations, I did this in one of my slides, you can hardly read it. So the fact that your gene code has been copied over and over and over from great, 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 great grandpa is amazing that it works at all. So I, the, there's, there's no flaws and unique traits of the designer. The, the designer that designed me is a stunningly amazing. And everything, one single cell in your body, Runa, one cell in your body is more complex than the space shuttle. If you wish to believe that happened by chance, that's your choice. And you may have to claim you believe that to pass the test in biology class, I understand. But it's not science. It's a religious belief. There's overwhelming design that this lid right here, evidence, I think this lid was designed to fit this bottle. Ah, is there a flaw in the design? I don't know, I don't care, it works great, I'm gonna use it. So, I think your analogy is, is really stretching, looking for evidence. And tonight, the purpose of the debate was for you to give evidence for evolution. That wouldn't be evidence if there was a poor design. If something was designed poorly, that's not evidence nobody designed it. If a car has a poor design, it doesn't mean nobody designed it. It's an example of some idiot got involved and didn't do it right, okay? That, that's not proof nobody designed it. Okay, let's see, last paragraph. Based on the analogy given, we would expect to find a flawed God or multiple different gods. No. You're looking at it wrong. This is 6,000 years after the original creation, and man has messed it up. Plus, people themselves have done some pretty dumb things. If a guy's driving a car, and he's drinking alcohol, and he runs into a tree and crashes the car, do you look at the crashed car and blame it on Ford or General Motors? No. It's the idiot drinking that stuff that crashed the car. So if we have problems today in our health or something like that, it might be because we've been doing something wrong that the designer didn't want us to do. Maybe that's the reason. Anyway, go ahead. Kind of exactly, kind of exactly why we had class action lawsuits. But um, <laughs> actually, my point, my point was much more about the fact that um, that we should expect the the Abrahamic God to be perfect. I actually agreed with that premise, and actually, I agree, in fact, with the fact that, that um, design is not, that, that we are not perfect because we shouldn't expect perfect design in evolution. We should expect environment affected design uh, in evolution. That changes is different and retains some traits. And this is why actually even from a, your analogy, I'm a little confused because your analogy doesn't actually seem to be sufficient within your the context of your analogy itself. Now, like I said, Ed, obviously I don't believe in a poly a god, even though my last name a means temple of Niord, Ord, Ord, but my, or a flawed god or a malicious god, god. But uh, if we think about the fact that uh, life is clearly not cut and clean, so clean as to actually indicate that the designer of it was perfect and creating a first birth, that, that at least indicates that there would be multiple old designers or, or, which would also account for viruses, by the way, okay? or some, so bubblegum, you can take that. That is a good argument. Um, or that maybe God is trying to have his own agenda, or maybe it is, you know, maybe we were much more affected by the devil than we can for. But that also brings in its own interesting discussions. 
But you know, fair enough. Like I said, you know, I don't I don't expect to win. Appreciate it, Runa. Um, Dr. Hoven, any, anything you'd like to respond there before we uh, move on? Well, I don't know if it's my old age and hearing loss or the uh, translation in verbiage, but I did not understand a thing he said in the last two sentences. Maybe you'd have to type it out where I can read it. Uh, it no, there's only one God. Just by definition, there can't be more than one God. Uh, it can't be more than, you know, uh, one top dog, okay? So um, I think there's only one God. I think he not only designed the world, he wrote a book and told us how he did it. I think he preserved that book all through history. I have a copy of it right here. I'll send you one if you like. Uh, but I think, I, I believe the Bible is God's preserved word down through history. And he said he did it all in six days. I believe that. I think the scientific evidence points clearly to that. But tonight, you were supposed to give evidence for evolution. Is what you gave tonight sufficient to make you believe that a dog and an amoeba have a common ancestor? Go ahead. Runa, you, you can answer that. I just wanted to be able to talk with Kent Helvin, if I'm honest. Hey, talk anytime. 855-BIG-DINO is mission three. <laughs> I take calls all day long and half the night. So go ahead. Okay. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the respectful uh, back and forth discussion, Kent and Runa. I mean, uh, time has flown by. We can go a into a whole phylum discussion, you know, if you ever want to do it again. Yeah. We'd and more animal based to, uh, discussion. Yeah. We'd be hey, happy. Come take, a, uh, come take a tour. Come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. Take a tour. We'll have you live on our stage right here. Have another discussion. So I do have a legitimate question. Do I have to go to Pensacola to get to 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 your park because I'm little because it seems like that on Florida. I mean on on Google Maps. Yeah, we're straight north of Pensacola, seventy miles. Lenox. That's what I thought. Down about that big. Well, gentlemen, I got to say that was a great discussion. Some uh, very interesting uh, questions that resulted in, in some good back and forth. So as we always do, though, let's kind of let, let's take a few minutes before we get into some of these audience questions to uh, kind of wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points. Uh, we can consider it a concluding statement. So, Runa, since, uh, you know, evolution was on trial, why don't we let you uh, start a, a few minutes just to kind of wrap everything up? Okay. When it comes to evolution, I actually think that in the long run, um, we should actually think more about the fact uh, and discuss the fact that evolution doesn't just relate to the biological processes. It actually also relates to how physical processes manifest in biological processes. I didn't get to discuss on it as much as I should have would decide. So I briefly brought it up because I'm not very a good, good slide maker or right? because it was a long semester. But it is amazing how much physical processes do affect uh, our biological processes. And beyond that, it's amazing what some, how, the fact that something like kale is related to broccoli and that is a kind, yet is an, why is an apple not the same kind as an almond? And when we can both, in just like with kales, we know oh, that they can interbreed. In fact, protus yes, can't interbreed, but just, just like can't, both scientists and creationists often discuss them being similar. These are all questions that not just scientists, but creationists should be asking themselves, how are we viewing these things? And why are we viewing them as interconnected? And I don't think that's just beneficiary for an evolutionary perspective. I think even creationists, yes, can benefit and science when they pursue it. Even if they pursue it from a creationist perspective, if they're doing it with, from the scientific perspective. 
Runa, I appreciate your concluding thoughts and your concluding statement. Uh, Kent, let's hand it over to you. Let's say up to five minutes. And whenever you're ready, go ahead. Well, I've used this illustration many times. I think intelligent people can locate clay in the earth. We have tons of it here at Dinosaur Adventureland. It's an old gravel pit. They can mine it and shape it into millions of things like pottery. I believe man has proven over the centuries he's able to take clay and make things out of it. Bricks, ceramic tile, pottery. The coffee cup made of clay taken from the ground, shaped by an intelligent mind. That does not mean the coffee cup can make itself. People can take the clay and make the coffee cup. Intelligent people can locate iron ore in the earth. We have tons of it here. They can smelt it down. We have iron ore on our property. Come on down, get some if you'd like. And they can make it into steel. I agree. They can then roll the steel or shape it or beat it or pound it or drill it or something or stamp it and make all kinds of parts out of it. I think intelligent people can make the steel and make a car. I agree. That does not prove the car can make itself from the iron. The iron ore can make itself into a car. God can take the dust of the ground, make it into a man. I believe that. That does not mean what Runa believed, that the dust of the ground made the man by itself. That is what you believe. Dust came to life somehow, somewhere, prebiotic soup or something, but the material turned into man by itself. If you're taking biology, Runa, the human body is mind-boggling in its complexity. The vascular system, skeletal system, digestive system, muscular system, reproductive system, integumentary system, the balance system. It's stunning in its complexity. One single cell of your body is more complex than the space shuttle. One cell, and you've got 100 trillion cells. Each cell has probably 100 trillion atoms. I don't understand how anybody with a college or with a kindergarten graduation certificate can believe it happened by chance. Every single system of the body is so complex, mind boggling, and they work together. It's just stunning to me that a person of normal intelligence can somehow talk themselves into believing nobody made it. I don't understand. You'd have to go to college for years to be that brainwashed, I think. So anyway. Thank you for the debate. Let's see why you asked, uh, why do we view them as interconnected? Well, I think the, pe the reason people view evolution as an answer to these questions is because they don't want God telling them what to do. They don't want God in their life. So they're looking for any way to explain life without God. That's the real reason. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dino, for that concluding statement. Uh, great debate, gentlemen, Runa and Kent. OK, well, we've got, as usual, a ton of questions here. So we will get through as many as we can before we hit the 90 minute mark. So, Runa, uh, this is your first time here on, on the channel, uh, although I'm sure you're familiar with the rules watching so many debates. Whoever, uh, whoever the question is for will make sure uh, gets the last word. So here we go. First question that comes in. And uh, what I'll do is put it up on screen. Uh, this one came in all the way at the beginning from Dustin Buck. Dustin, appreciate the question. So he says, question for Runa. Why don't we see evolution in the insects? The ones we find in amber are identical, save for the size. So if evolution is true, why don't we see the missing link there? So, oh, am I allowed to begin? So, insects is a very loosely defined um, category, and I think it often gets misdefined on what it is. And, um, we do actually see heavy variation in anthropodia, uh, uh, in, and not just in size, but actually even in how different glands are actually formed and like the presence of Malfigian tubules at different present ends. But as well, actually considering this isn't really a problem for evolution if if it is a such a established niche that they have gotten themselves into who who because as that, that would suggest that something about the way their physiology works is beneficial enough to to have minimal adapt have less less minimal adaption. 
Okay, Runa, I appreciate the answer to that question. Uh, Kent, over to you for your response. Uh, we have here in our museum at Dinosaur Adventureland some fossil insects in amber, which is probably the best way to preserve them. It's tree sap. I believe during the flood of Noah, the water rushing back and forth and up and down and the earth being destroyed by a flood, the trees would snap, billions of them, and sap oozes out for X amount of days or weeks or months. Insects get trapped in that sap and they're preserved. Insects found in amber are plentiful. You can buy them probably by the thousands at some rock shows and stuff like that. And they are indeed identical to today, except sometimes they're bigger. Uh, I think that was indication the world was different before the flood came and everything probably got bigger and lived longer. So I think the question is good. We don't see any change. There's still mosquitoes in amber are still mosquitoes. Look at the movie Jurassic Park where they took the mosquito blood out. Uh, <clears throat> supposedly, suppo it's, it's the same. Um, the insects preserved are classic example or evidence, I think, for rapid burial and a flood. Go ahead. I'd also point out they have an exoskeleton, which does benefit both light, uh, light, which is another interesting niche to have when you're, no matter the size you have, especially in relation to how it affects bone density, since it's an exoskeleton. Okay, to be fair, uh, Runa, that was your question. So we, we'll give you the last word there and we'll move on to the next one. So this comes in from Redefine Living. Thank you for the question, Redefine. Uh, question, I believe, is for you, Runa. So he says, because mutations are the driving force of evolution and it is mutations that caused these diseases, how do you reconcile this contradiction? Well because we're not the only people on earth. We're not the only entity on earth. Earth, earth. Viruses are also another entity. He, mutations themselves, it was a mutation and that was benefiting and how, how prions spread and, and changing how prions spread but it was also a mutation that was fixing it for and benefiting us. Like mu mutations have are, are completely ambiguous in if they're gonna help or harm, or if they're just a factor, just like everything in life is a factor. And like what, what benefits Donnie here may not benefit me. Thank you, Runa, and uh, over to you, Kent. <clears throat> As I've said, mut all mutations observed have been harmful, fatal, or neutral. The one that he mentioned about the, uh, I'll do some more research on that, the prions, but it corrected a previous mistake of a mutation. It didn't create any new information. It's not gonna turn a mosquito or an, a, a, a bacteria into a whale. And they would need quadrillions of mutations that did that, and they struggle to find one they can stretch to fit their religion. They struggled hard to find one single mutation that they say, well, there's evidence. Well, come on, guys, it would take trillions, and it's not observed. Until you can prove it with a lot more than that, it should not be taught in schools. Evolution should be taught as a religion in private schools for those who wish to pay and come learn it. It's got nothing to do with education, it's got nothing to do with biology. There's no such thing as a fossil record. There's no such thing as a geologic column. The whole thing is baloney. Runa, you got brainwashed. I'm sorry, I'm here to help. Snap out of it. God made the world. Everything brings forth after its kind. No, ex no exceptions to that. Go ahead. Donnie, your hair is red, right? Part is that it. natural? Uh, I, no, think it, I think it's just the lighting, Runa. <laughs> I, I just wondered that because yeah. what would happen if we turned off the mutation that your hair was red? I'm sure you get a lot of ladies as a result of, of if you had red hair. That would make it beneficial to you. And if it spreads throughout the population, like it does in Ireland, it becomes beneficial in that regard. Uh, but different circumstances cause coal for different mutations. And yeah. I would say it is still hair. You're still attracting ladies, not mosquitoes or cows. 
and you're still <laughs> making baby humans. So it's not, it's not, that's not going to help evolution. Also, I have an inverse hair. 13th chromosome. Okay. And epilepsy. <laughs> you guys are keeping this fun and intellectual at the same time. So appreciate it. Okay, this one comes in from That's Strange. And this one is for you, Kent Hoven. So he's asking, if all animals were herbivores, I guess at the time of creation, how do you explain some animals? And I assume he's referring to uh, carnivores. Well, uh, during World War II, they could not get meat for the zoos in London. And so the lions had to eat vegetation. They didn't like it at first, but they got used to it and they lived on it. I think the Bible clearly teaches certainly that all animals were vegetarian before the flood. After the flood, God said, Noah, now you can eat meat. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. And I think going from a plant-eating lion to a meat-eating lion is a pretty minor change comparing to go, compared to going from a rock to a lion or a bacteria to a lion. So the variations that change from herbivore to uh, carnivore are so minor compared to what the evolutionists believe that they changed from a rock to a lion. I, th I find that stunning in stupidity that someone could believe such a thing. If, so, if I may. I, go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no. I, I wanted you to finish up first. Well, and the burden of proof is not on me. The burden of proof is on them. Where's the evidence for evolution? Uh, this is a diversion from the, from the topic. So if, if I was demanding that everybody teach the Bible in the public schools at everybody's expense, well, then, yeah, I think I'd have to prove that scientifically. I think it's been demonstrated that nearly all meat-eating animals can live on vegetation if they'd like. I've got video footage of dogs here eating cabbage and eating broccoli. Uh, and, uh, yes, yeah, they can. Uh, there are some people who will say they're, they're, one lady had a, a kennel of all dogs. All they ate was plants, all vegetarian dogs. I need to get that lady on our program here. But uh, that's not, it's not my burden of proof. God said everything was made to eat plants after the flood, maybe because of atmospheric differences or whatever the changes happen, uh, loss of a canopy. Now, meat is necessary for some, but they can make it on plants. Don't like it, but they can't. Go ahead. If I would actually throw something in Kent's favor, it is actually possible that a carnivorous animal can eventually become herbivorous over large periods of adaptation. But the thing we notice, especially in species like pandas, for example, is that this massively actually changes how they are able to behave because the fa because cellulose digestion is heavily varied compared to carn like meat eating. Because this is because cellulose takes much longer to digest than energy. I mean, the meat it does, does. And thus, in a carnivorous animal, this, this means that they have to slow their movement down um, and change a large amount of behaviors to adapt to that. So it, that means that we should expect a lot of the uh, pre-flood world to be, I mean, I mean pre-garden world, to be much more slow moving do at least for the carnivores and actually all cellulose creatures to some extent compared to how they were afterwards but it's not impossible and uh i appreciate that runa kent question was originally for you so we can give you the the final response if there's anything you'd like to add oh uh, no that's fine go ahead Okay, let's see all these questions we have. Let me, uh, I guess, pick one at random here. Here's another one for uh, for Kent. So we got a nice, uh, healthy balance here of, of questions for Runa and Dr. Dino. So here we go. Question from Timothy. Timothy, question for Kent. If humans aren't apes, what is the difference or what are uh, some of the differences between an ape and a human? If you'd like to marry an ape, go ahead. <laughs> do you see anybody doing that? Hopefully not. No, no telling these days what people do. But uh, I think if you don't know the difference between a human and an ape, you need to ask a kindergartner to show you. They'll, tell, they'll point them out to you. Uh, there are thousands of anatomical differences, certainly mental differences, at least with some humans are smarter than apes. Uh, and so I think that there's genetic differences. Apes, if I recall, have 48 chromosomes. We have 46. Uh, incapable of interbreeding. They were designed similar, 
both got two arms, two eyes, that, you know, binocular vision, all that kind of stuff. They have a lot more hair on their body. Apes are not human. Humans are humans, and apes are apes, orangutans are orangutans, monkeys are monkeys, chimpanzees are chimpanzees. They don't interbreed. They're designed to be what they are, and they bring forth after their kind every time. My brother, when I was growing up, had some uh, squirrel monkeys. They were squirrely and monkey. They weren't part squirrel, but they were crazy. And so I think uh, if humans, yes, humans are not apes. Uh, I, I speak for myself. I don't know about you, but uh, the, they, you can believe whatever you'd like. If you'd like to marry one or mate with one, go for it. <laughs> Thank you, Kent. Runa, over to you. Oh, is, is, is it for the same question? Because I can well, say something. It, it's up to you. Typically yeah. what we do here. Uh, I know. I, I know. But actually, there is something interesting with this theme. Because creationists can, though, though modern creationists don't necessarily acknowledge this connection to humans and apes, this hasn't always been true. We did see some at least pseudo-creationists, although it gets complicated between what defines a creationist versus modern creationist versus historic creationists, such as Linnaeus did actually group apes and um, humans together and then cut out other species. And Linnaeus himself actually commented this exact question yeah, yeah, that I cannot figure as much as I try, I cannot uh, tell the difference between an ape and a human. And that is an interesting poser. Of course, Linnaeus definitely had his own issues with classify how he classified humans in the first place. Yes. Uh, but it does still bring up some interesting questions. Thank you for the uh, comments there, Runa. Kent, and anything you'd like to uh, add for a final response? Well, I, I would have to see the proof of that, that he crossed an ape and a human and got a baby. You might get him to mate. You could probably mate with a pine tree if you'd like. Uh, it was not going to produce a baby. So I think I'd like to see the proof that it produced a baby. Okay. Secondly, was the baby fertile? Because if it's not fertile, well, the definition of same species is produce fertile offspring. Uh, they've been able to crossbreed wolves and dogs, coyotes and dogs, coyotes and wolves. Uh, I did a bunch of research on that today. I got all my slides if I can find them here. So, yes, I think, here we go. Coyote-dog hybrid. Let's see. Uh, this, this might answer the question. Alt-DV-6-3, right here. Uh, a koi dog, okay? Coyote-dog. Coyote, coyote Australian Shepherd mix. Ah. Wolves in the eastern U.S. can mate with coyotes, okay? Wolf and coyote. So I think the dog, the wolf, and the coyote are the same kind of animal. There's 40 different subspecies of wolf. Mm. Wolves of the world. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Dehole or whatever. I should have looked it up. A canid native to Central, South, East, and Southeast Asia. Other English names for the species are Asian wild dog, etc. And they can interbreed. Ah. So there's a, a genus called Canis. And they seem to be interfertile. That may be close to the biblical kind. I don't think God cares what we call the animals or how we classify them. But maybe uh, the Canis family is all interfertile and can produce viable offspring. Coyote and gray wolf. 19 different species of coyotes. Um, whether the fox is in there or not, maybe not. Maybe that's a different, uh, let's see, a different uh, order. So maybe I don't think God cares what our classification system is either. But... I'll have a bunch of research done on this about the dingo, the coyote, and the jackal. All have 78 chromosomes, 39 pairs, and they can interbreed. Mm. So means they cannot interbreed. Foxes and coyotes cannot. Must be a different kind. 34 chromosomes. Well, let's see. The red fox has the same number of chromosomes as the sunflower and the, uh, and the artichoke, therefore, and the porcupine. Therefore, they must be interbreedable. Uh, humans have 46. So does this creature here. I had to pronounce that thing. Parha, whatever it is. It's, I don't think we're able to mate with those. So I think it's pretty obvious they bring forth after their kind. They can bring forth, they can bring forth, they can bring forth, they cannot bring forth, and they cannot bring forth, and they cannot bring forth. They bring forth after their kind. That's what the Bible says. And so did this human ape 
offspring, which you claim happened, did Linnaeus, was he able to get one that was fertile? Now I'm going to give the chance of that happening as zero. Go ahead. I think, I think that would be an ethical violation, um, though there have been some who have suggested uh, testing, testing that. Um, <laughs> so, um, I don't think his job was breeding. So I'm going to say no, just out of, out of thing. Although I did notice something. You earlier said that apples, you, you seem to suggest that apples were their own kind. But as I pointed out, strawberries can breed and pears and apples and almonds can breed together. I, I, like, I don't know how kinds work with trees. I just... I, I... I guess what we Never. could do, since that was Kent's question, we can let him answer that if he'd like to, and then we'll move on to... Uh, I, I would I like to I'll see evidence that strawberries and apples can breed. I'd like to see and, that. I'm, I, and I don't, almonds. I don't that. Almonds, you said, Runa? Oh, and yeah, almonds. They're, ro and they're all, all rosier. I think strawberries may actually be slightly farther on the rosier. Yeah, I think it probably tastes good if you blended them together, but I'm, I'm going to doubt the breeding them together and producing viable offspring can the, the, can the offspring interbreed because yeah, that's the pears and almonds can okay well i'm going to move on here to the final uh two questions we'll do so here we go bubble gum gun appreciate the support and uh question is for you runa so he asks mm -hmm. and i'll just read it out here uh for fish to evolve to a bat he says needs 100 mutational change of the genome Evolution doesn't work because it would consist 100% of mutations and 100% mutations to the genome only get only gets you mega cancer is, is the last part of it. So go ahead. No. Is there anything you'd like to respond For, to? First of all, no, you wouldn't need 100% mutational whole change from fish to bat because of how many similarities there are. In, in actually fish and bat structures in the first place, as, um, in the sense that they're both tetrapods, they both have like basic uh, similar features in the sense of eyes, many parts of their their like physiology, eh? um, and basic features. You wouldn't need 100% of that. In fact, even in the most exaggerated model, you wouldn't need 100% percent of that even if i'm like assuming like just like the most like physical features we can we can see because we can even us as humans can see like general similarities is or like we won't get those weird uncanny valley effects um that i think all of us su suffer from um but actually even further beyond this is the fact that at, on your point on cancer, er, er, um, on mutations to the genomes, there is a bunch of mutations and then the and changes. And a lot of those changes are changes that only in retrospect we notice lead, lead to the modern day a, organisms. They're all distinct organs that work at that, that point, but only in the retrospect can we see how they connect because they're actually just changes to fu this function and then it changes again to this function. And, but they're still working within that system um, and that environment. And it wasn't going towards like a bat that, that, that. It was just trying to do what it can in the population to survive. Okay. Thank you, Runa. Uh, Kent, anything you'd like to add there, brother? Nobody has ever in the history of the world seen a fish produce a non-fish baby or a bat produce a non-bat baby. If someone wishes to imagine it happened long ago and far away, that's not science. That's imagination. SpongeBob style. 
All we've ever seen in the history of the world is bats produce bats and fish produce fish. And we can divide them up into categories, specific kinds of bats or fish, okay? We got them all divided up. So it's imagination. And there would be so many, and I don't know about the number, 100% is what's offending him, maybe so, but I can tell you this, in the textbooks, they do show lines on paper between the fish and the birds and the mammals and the humans. They drew lines on paper connecting them, and the kid has to learn this for school. Kid, do you think the humans are related to a bat? That they're Sure, there's a line on paper right there. Here they've got the shark related to the jellyfish and the octopus and the spinach. Okay, here they've got all the animals are related to all the plants. Now, if somebody wishes to believe this stupidity, they're welcome to believe whatever they want. This is America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave. But that's not science. It's a religion to believe that. It's not science. All science says bats produce bats without exception. We've now divided them into 1,100 species of bats. I don't think the bat cares. They probably look for something similar to their own kind. Uh, I think the fish probably look for another fish to mate with, not a bat. So I think evolution has got to be the dumbest religion in the world. There's been no evidence presented tonight to make anybody believe these trees of life. Why would I believe that a protozoa turned to a biology teacher? Because of a mutation in a folded protein? Is that make me supposed to believe this chart? I, I resent them teaching that in schools. I think we should, we should get it out, okay? Go Thank ahead. you. Uh Thanks, Kent. And, and Runa, real quick, final word. We got one last question. We're going to wrap is, up. So. So, sorry, I keep interrupting. It's That's hard okay. to tell That's timing okay. sometimes. But what is a bat? At just like with kinds. And, you know, what, where does as what it is end? And, and did we name those things that? I guess biblically we are supposed to. But would Adam have actually he said, would Adam still say that this was was this if it kept going like this? Or would did he have some knowledge that was specific? And if it becomes distinct enough, does it stop being that? If it mutates enough. And even if you don't believe that it is like that. If mutations can exist and hybridization events are still going, and we assume your kind model is a real thing, can evolution occur now? And is, will it eventually occur that kinds will be distinct enough to actually be evolved from where they are? Runa, thanks for the last word. And here we go. Final question. As always, we got a hundred questions that come in. So I do want to thank the audience for being so engaged in this 2022 evolution debate challenge series. I think we are close now to 30 of them. I've got most of them up on the website, sandfortruthministries.com. So if you're a new subscriber, but you love these debates, make sure to check out that section on the website. Okay. Final question comes in. Uh, final question we're going to get to that is comes in from Vans at 182 workshop. Uh, question for Runa. Can you explain the petrified trees oh, and fossilized animals going through the layers of the geologic column? Sounds like one of your favorite topics already, Runa. So go ahead. Well, first of all, I'm not a geologist, but um, like <laughs> I've even seen creation. It's not like this topic. Like, um, <laughs> Because it actually, depending on your views on creationism, causes different problems. But to talk about it, um, basically, the reality is, as I kind of alluded to, different places on the Earth do, in fact, have have different like ways that they ended up forming due to the mechanisms of of the geological nature of planetary for, formation and as well the ongoing mechanisms that we see going on through the planet and then that constantly he causes is things from happening um, when it comes to petrified trees is it depends on if they were actually petrified and actually truly fossilized 
or if they were basically in a petrified state that looks petrified uh, to us, but is really more of a basically the equivalent of mud put on it and then like kind of wrapped around it and then briefly pressured heard over time, over a much shorter time, but not actually ever occurring a true fossilization. Um, as well, with fossilized animals going through it, that's much more about the mechanics of, of like different areas and the fact that it can sometimes lead to like the pushing up of like different different fossils or depending on how the sediments are like different like mechanisms but we also notice and this is why we actually look at where where actually is this located and, and the type of disruption that is evident actually around the fossilized animals. Not just the layering, but like the disruption around it. That's a bad explanation, but still. Okay, Runa, thank you for answering that question. Uh, we'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Dino for his response. Um, hundreds, maybe even thousands, but certainly hundreds of petrified trees have been found standing up and they're not coated with rock. They are petrified, they're solid rock to the middle. This one at the Kettle Mine up in Cookville, Tennessee, you can go see it for yourself, runs through two different coal seams. Um, they're layers of solid rock, they are petrified. Joggins, Nova Scotia is famous for its hundreds and hundreds of petrified trees running through different layers. They are turned to stone like any other petrification process. We've got this one here in our museum running through 12 layers of slate. Okay, This one, petrified, standing up. Here's the one with a fish. The nose is in a layer of rock, supposedly million year, millions of years older than the rest of the body. So it had to balance on its nose for millions of years. Polystrata fossils are found all over the world. Here's a bunch of them in France. Textbook of geology, Charles Schubert, uh, shows the petrified tree, a drawing. Sometimes the trees are upside down, petrified, running through these layers. I don't think the evolutionist answer is common sense at all. It's much more simple to say, guys, the layers can form quickly. The flood of Noah probably made all the layers in one year, burying bazillions of trees. Mount St. Helens blew up 1980. It blew thousands of trees, estimates are 20,000 trees, into Spirit Lake. Many are still floating there today, 40 years later. But hundreds of them, maybe thousands, have sunk to the bottom, and some are standing up in the bottom as if they grew there, but none of them grew there. They got ripped out, blown in by the volcano, floated, got waterlogged, sank to the bottom. They're going to stand there, and as the sediments form around them, they could petrify in the standing position, running through all the layers. So I think it's just simply not common sense to say the layers are different ages when you have one tree connecting all of them. And, and the petrification, we know petrification can take place in, in, in weeks in a laboratory under heat and pressure. You can completely petrify a fossil, turn something into a fossil. They can make coal in 20 minutes in the laboratory. So I think, uh, I think Runa is desperate, like the Bible says in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, they do not want to believe in the creation or the flood. They're willingly ignorant. The flood is the only logical explanation for the polystrate of fossils. Thank you for the question. I believe, especially upside down trees, uh, it, the layers formed in one year. Go ahead. Matt, thank you for the response. Uh, Runa, quick final word, and then we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, just then you get the distribution the problem of distribution of those sediments in the in the first place, which is what actually why I talked about the first thing. Um, but no, I don't deserve a final comment other than that it's just been a great, great time and to just have some fun. You know, but but I see your comment and you know Honestly, you know, even with all, all the insulting, you know, I feel like I got less insults than some other people 
Oh, gosh, so that's a good day. <laughs> that's good, and, and I always encourage the chat. Please uh, do not attack the debaters, the live chat, that is. We always get a ton of people in here. Keep it respectful and attack, attack arguments, not people. So, Rune, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, it, was, it was a very uh, easy debate to moderate, so I appreciate you both giving me an easy job tonight. I appreciate those final words, Rune. I, I also thank you for doing this. It's an, an important topic, and we got a challenge here. So any other evolutionist that wants to take the challenge, let me know. Uh, Dr. Hoven, we'll hand it over to you, brother, for your final words. No, I believe the Bible is true. God made everything in six days. There was a flood that destroyed everything. He's going to come destroy it again. And you better get ready. This is his world. He can wreck it if he wants. The Bible teaches all kinds of things about the end times. I wrote a book on that subject of what does the Bible teach of what on earth is about to happen. Runa, you're going to die one day. I hope it's a long time from now, but it's going to happen. Could happen tomorrow. Have you seen the way they drive in this country? Where are you going? What happens when you... Are you sure... Nothing happens. You just rot in the grave. Are you sure? Stop and think about that. Call me, 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. Be glad to talk to you about it. Okay? That's I it. literally Ed? die every day. I literally have a high chance of dying every day from epilepsy. You know, present better evidence for, for the flood. And, you know, you might have a chance to save me. You know, Whoa. before I die and have a suit up. One eight five five big dino. I'm sure uh, Dr. Oven will love to leave you, lead you to the Lord, Runa. So, mm -hmm. uh, Kent, Runa, appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna let you guys get out of here. I appreciate your time uh, that you've given to us for these debates. So, Kent, Runa, I'm gonna let you both out of here. I'm gonna stick around for a little bit just to go over some reminders for the audience in terms of the uh, upcoming debates we have in this evolution debate challenge series. So to the audience, we'll see you in about 10 seconds. And Kent and Runa, you both have a fantastic night. Thank God you, brother. Bye.